Good morning, Council. Please come back to order. We will continue with public comment on agenda item D1. First up this morning is Patty O'Donnell. Yeah, good morning. Uh, Chairman, members of the council, for the record, my name is Paddy O'Donnell. I own the Caraval 85 foot trawler that fishes out of Kodiak. As a fisherman, I believe we have to do what is best for all fisheries and all stocks uh, in the Central Gulf and the Bering Sea. So in the Central Gulf, we haven't had a directed trawl fishery for cod since 2017, uh, based on the survey from 2017. So I'm aware of the impacts to uh, the crab fishermen, uh, to businesses and to, to all communities that are suffering as a, as a result of this. I think the council needs to take a cautious and science-based approach while considering down, uh, closing down the crab savings area to trawl fishing. We have heard uh, in testimony that this is an area that is a high, high CPU pollock, which means less PSC of other species. Closing areas may not bring back crab. For example, in the Kodiak area, we have two legacy closure areas that are a type one, which are closed all year round for king crab. And in the 30 plus years that I have fished in Kodiak, we have not seen a comeback of king crab in either one of these areas, and they remain closed today to trawling. The other concern I have is closing areas to trawl. This uh, increased predation on crab stops, stocks. For example, the arrow tooth fishery that takes place in Kodiak is in an area that produces the most abundant pan or crab stocks. The highest quota for the 2022 season was in that uh, area, which is the east side district of the Kodiak, which I believe is the direct result of removing cod pollock and arrow tooth out of those areas. In contrast, uh, the council took action about 10 years ago, approximately uh, to close down Marmot Bay, which is the northeast district to uh, close down Marmot Bay to trawling. And, uh, there was no crab fishery in, in, in that area for the 2022 tanner crab season. So uh, I think a major factor is the trawlers in the past removed the predators out of the area. And that's not possible anymore because the bay is close to bottom trawling. I think there's a higher presence of more predators for the tanner crab there. 20 to 25 years ago, the captain of the, the FNG survey vessel in Kodiak uh, wanted to open up the bays in Kodiak to trawling stating that if we ever wanted to have a tanner crab fishery that in the base, then you need to let the trawlers in there and get the, the predators out of there, and especially cod, which they were sampling and finding belly, bellies full of uh, uh, crab. So we need to take a look at the biomass of sable fish in the Bering Sea in the last few years and what impact that had uh, on the crab stocks there. Uh, take belly samples for stomach samples, contents, for example, we need to do that with cod and, and, and all species to get a grasp on. Uh, Mr. O'Donnell, your, your time is up. Can you provide a concluding comment and then we'll see if there's questions. Yes, thank you. So again, keep in mind that predation made it with the benefits of restricting fisheries and areas like the uh, bearing king crab savings area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Donnell. Any questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up is Oystein Loan. Scheduled to testify remotely. Yeah, do you hear me on here? Yes, we can. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Chairman and Council members. My name is Oyston Lone, a longtime crab fisherman. I have participated in most fixed gear fisheries all over Alaska, and I'm still an active participant. I have ownership in two vessels, fishing crab and cod in the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands. We also tender both vessels for salmon, for cod, and participate in sable fish hook and line fishing. I've invested heavily in Alaska crab fisheries, pod cod, and sable fish in the last 12 years. As a fisherman, I'm appalled at what is going on on our grounds right now. With the dire state of crab fisheries, we need to find ways to protect our crab. 
With the increase in trawl activity in the last few years, I'm convinced it's having a huge impact on crab decline. We as fixed gear operators are doing as much as possible to avoid bycatch on our grounds, and we need to do the same with the trawlers. On our crab pots, we're putting bigger and bigger mesh in, in gear to make sure small crab get out, using longer soak to get the small crab out. Our overboard chutes, um, we've made those bigger. We've added more water to get the crab off the vessel when we're sorting. Um, also pot hauls with, with hauling gear from other boats that are done fishing and emptying their gear instead of rail dumping. These are, have, have been a big help, especially in king crab and bear eye and snow crab to lessen pot hauling. In our pot cod sector, we have, we have been doing gear studies on different gear and tunnel openings to see what works best. We have voluntarily stood out of the king crab box. This has helped. We have also invested in all sock tunnel gear, which is uh, proving to uh, hold a lot of bycatch out of the gear. And uh, we are currently at this time looking at increasing our box to go further east and north. And see the attached letter I put in there on that. Hopefully we can get Podcod fleet to agree with this measure. Also our bycatch numbers on crab are wrongly portrayed. There's absolutely no way that the crab we discard has this high of a mortality rate. If we did, we would be bringing loads of crab that have 50% dead loss. When the boat fishes 20 to 25 days, cold stormy weather, and has a percent to a percent and a half of dead loss, that proves that this math is wrong. My personal recommendations is that all bottom contact with trawls be banned until further studies can be done and figure out exactly what impacts trawl has on the bottom infrastructure and sea life. I also support Alaska Bering Sea Crabbers recommendations at, at a minimum, but if we are to save our fisheries, we need to do more. If we don't do something to save our crab fisheries now, we won't have any crab fishery to worry about. All we'll have is a trawl fishery in the Bering Sea. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Long. Any questions? I, I don't see any. Thanks again. Next up is Nikolai Sievert Stoll. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman, members of the board, members of the council. My name is Nikolai Sieverstall. I represent uh, Crabby Venture LLC. The Norbo Larsen family has been active participants in the crab fishery since the 1960s. My group is also involved as partners of the Fishing Vessel Pacific Sounder, uh, together with Einstein Loan. I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Good science is enormously important for our resource. Poor science can sadly be used as tools to unduly bury the facts and delay needed actions. The Bristol Bay Red King Crab discussion paper contains lots of good science. For example, the pelagic time, the, the time pelagic trawl stays at the bottom is much higher than what has been assumed by science and regulators before. However, Fishermen have pointed out this fact for decades. How come the scientists and the regulators appear to be the only ones that did not know? How could you not have dug into this with great persistence and interest years ago? You must have heard the cries from the fleet. Why weren't you even a bit interested? The efforts of the pelagic trawl sector inside the king crab box have increased substantially over the last several years during the winter months. This is exactly the time when mating and molting for king crab is at its highest levels. The extent of time pelagic trawl stays on the bottom combined with its increased efforts inside the king crab box during mating and molting happens during a time when the environment might be under stress from climatic changes. These facts should give you cause for concern. However, delaying decisive action now with prescribing the research you should have ordered years ago is not enough. We expect you to be able to walk straight and chew gum at the same time. Take action now. Limit trawl activity inside critical areas for king crab. Take action now for research on gear modifications and impact for trawl and unobserved mortality. When I listen to the deliberations of the council, I am a bit saddened. 
It sounds like an echo chamber to me. The walls are very strong. I wonder what is fortifying those walls so much. When we bring our plight to the public, I can assure you that they will have no problems understanding that dragging large invasive troll nets along the bottom cannot be a good thing. They will be appalled when they hear that in the face of King Crab's demise and during general habitat frailty, you felt that you could not take action. Instead, you asked for further research. You kicked the can down the road. Well, you still can do the right thing. You can still righten this ship up. You can, we ask you that you implement actions in accordance with ABSC's recommendations. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions? I don't see any. Thanks again. Next up is Mateo Pasadon. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the council. <clears throat> My name is Mateo Pasadon. Uh, for the record, I'm testifying on behalf of the city of St. Paul. Uh, St. Paul is a historic, mostly Unangan Aleut community of about 400 residents located in the central Bering Sea, where so many of the fisheries that this body manages are pursued. Uh, the question before you is whether to initiate action or not, understanding that there is great uncertainty as to whether any action taken will help restore this, this fishery, this, this red king crab fishery, and recognizing that sacrifices will need to be made by other sectors to get there. So I thought about the council's responsibilities to do what it can to manage the fishery resources under its pur purview and the guidance that, was that is provided under the national standards. And so last night I went through the national standards and asked myself, one, is there a conservation issue? And after consideration, I answered yes, especially if the, arc the red king crab stocks declined further and the potential arises for something even more draconian, potentially outside this council's purview. And then I looked at national standard two and asked not only whether we already have good science, but also whether better science data facts could be obtained through this council process. And it seemed to me that the answer to both of these was also yes. Then I went to national standard four and asked whether there's an equity and allocations issue. And it seemed that yes, there was an allocative component or potential to this action especially in instances where the directed fishery uh, is or may be closed. Clearly, the burdens of conservation should be shared by all users of the, of the red king crab resource, directed or otherwise. I then went to National Standard 8 and thought of communities such as St. Paul, which are almost 100%, 90% dependent on the crab resources. And I thought about their continued and sustained participation in this and other fisheries. And I concluded that there was a legitimate question about the sustainability of this resource and the communities that depend on it. And finally, I looked at National Standard 9, reduction of bycatch to the extent practical, and asked whether there is, was nothing else that, th that could be done by this council to reduce bycatch. And again, it seemed like the answer was yes. Even if the returns on the effort may not be great, more could potentially be done, especially with better science to reduce bycatch, even if minimally. And this bycatch analysis and the broader review of how to restore this fishery needs to be comprehensive and look at all sources of mortality. So on behalf of the city of St. Paul, we request that you initiate action, a discussion paper that incorporates the recommendations of the ABSC letter, as well as the original AP motion. I would like to quibble a bit with the AP's uh, motions purpose and needs statement. Uh, and note that there is a community sustainability and dependence component to this eventual action, which is not addressed in the purpose and need statement. And should the council decide to um, uh, work with that uh, uh, motion, um, that, that should be addressed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Those are my comments. Thank you, Mr. Pasadon. Mr. Down has a question. Thank you, thank you, Chairman Kaneen. Thank you, Mrs. Mr. Possible. Uh, my, uh, my question to you is at the end of your testimony, you, you said you supported uh, uh, the, 
recommendations we'll ask Bering Sea Crabbers go forward into discussion paper. So aside from that, is there other things that should be in that in that uh, discussion paper or or uh, or uh, analysis or what what are you just referring to that letter then that's what should be in this discussion paper as you said? Uh, so the chair, I think both the letter and, and the AP motion give you a good starting point. And my assumption uh, is that if council agrees to go forward, that a lot of the other concerns that, that I've um, uh, touched on in my testimony, including the community uh, component would be, would be fleshed out. That's my assumption. So, um, uh, but at the top, I don't have anything additional to add. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any further questions? Thank you. Thanks. Next up is Paul Wilkins. Good morning, members of the council. My name is Paul Wilkins and I am the quota manager for Coastal Villages Region Fund, a CDQ group that works in the, for the 20 communities in our region. CVRF is highly diversified in its fishing operations in part to respond to unpredictabilities, and my goal today is to illustrate the balance we are facing in this issue. CVRF has invested over the years in the federal cod and pollock fisheries with significant ownership in both the shoreside and catch processor sectors. We also received CDQ in the open crab fisheries. And not long after crab rationalization began, we invested in several crabbing vessels and QS. Our vessels and crew do a great job of catching crab and we appreciate their hard work. CVRF has HR, accounting, logistics, and sales staff in Anchorage and, pardon me, Seattle and in CVRF region communities that support the work of staffing, harvesting, and prosecuting all of these fishing operations. In the last 10 years, both crab and pollock have resulted in a significant proportion of our revenue, revenue that supports our community development and nonprofit mission. In 2010, we took control of the Northern Hawk, a catcher processor in the Pollock fishery. She catches all of our AFA offshore and CDQ quotas. The Northern Hawk has over 120 employees and two observers on its vessel at all times. The vessel retains 100% of salmon from each haul per 891. Our observers take samples that amount to up to 40% of all catch, and I believe sample all crab in those samples. Our observer's data shows very little crab bycatch and I have a lot of confidence in those and other bycatch numbers. But the small number of crabs in those samples is not something that drives our fishing decisions. <clears throat> Weather, profitability for our operation and the subsequent programs delivered to our communities and bycatch of salmon and other species are greater factors. We have a hard cap on Chinook, Chinook for AFA, <clears throat> pardon me, and our CDQ fishing requires a lot of attention to halibut, cod, and other species. The discussion paper touches on these cost benefit decisions, but we deal with these things every fishing day. Unfortunately, I am not the Northern Hawk captain and cannot give you specifics on how this works in practice, but I can tell you that we are thinking about all of these items on a haul by haul basis and that fishing locations and encounters will not be exactly the same from one year to the next. Removing access to grounds that have been productive productive in the past will prevent the flexibility we need to balance the various bycatch species we are limited to. Rotating closures sensitive to bycatch concerns make sense generally, but need to be established based on current data from the grounds. There's a lot of uncertainty about the regarding the decline of Bristol Bay king crab. There are the impacts of ocean and environmental changes as well as observed and unobserved mortality on crab from all fisheries. Investigating the multiple sources of decline um, in Bristol Bay Ray King crab should include experimental research into the impacts of regulatory pelagic gear. However, a blunt tool such as a regulatory, regulator, pardon me, regulatorily permanent pro prohibition of pelagic gear from the Red King crab savings area without such information will lead to additional fishing complications in the fleet and likely reduced ability for us to support our communities. How best to respond to the decline is a significant task, but must balance the available science with the practical concerns that affect all fisheries. Thank you for your attention to this issue. 
Thank you, Mr. Wilkins. Are there any questions? Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins for your testimony. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on the AP motion and whether uh, you felt like that was an appropriate balance of some of the considerations that you brought up. Through the chair, Ms. Baker, the AP motion had a lot of a lot of really good points in it. There was um, a lot of consensus, I think, across the board for for the longer term ideas of of, of exploring a workshop um, to have all the industry partners together to try and figure out maybe some voluntary solutions, that kind of thing. Um, I had um, some issues with the way the shorter term parts of the initial motion were crafted. Um, there are there was not a full um, analysis of all the, the, the various gear types um, in order to, uh, um, there was not, a, a, not all gear types were included in the, the initial first three alternatives. Um, I had some, some concerns about that. There's, there's clearly some interaction between long liners as well as uh, uh, pot vessels. Um, in that um, in that area with crab, and uh, and I think that should be included for analysis to potentially um, limit access to some of those grounds as well for other fleets. Um, however, I'm still concerned about the fact that there the 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 main motion sort of took the presumption that the Red King crab savings area is a static box that as um, is granted the the sort of encompasses a lot of the knowledge and we understanding that we have about, about molting and mating and, um, and uh, abundance of red king crab, but it's, it's a still a static box that does not allow for any, um, any um, um, movement or um, in-season alteration based on, on daily abundance. The box was, was designed over 25 years ago. And I think that it's, Possibly, possibly need the the areas around it and the the sort of the the the, the limitations therein are 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 um, need to be looked at, um, especially on a sort of seasonal basis, if possible, um, um, through um, uh, certain things like um, um, time and area, um, bycatch closures, abundance based um, rotating hotspots type of thing. Um, the, uh, the 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 third part of the the motion, which was primarily the 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 sort of the pot cot addendum, I thought was um, a, a good step in the in the direction to try and sort of understand um, some of the data coming out from that fleet um, a little bit better to try and focus um, perhaps some some uh, increased um, scientific data coming in from bycatch um, in the in the in fleet, and so I think that. The, the observer portion of the pot cod um, uh, addendum, or I guess what is it, amendment, um, I think is a, is a good one to explore. Um, the, uh, I had some concerns about the, the, the jurisdictional parts of the, um, of the amendment that um, talked about the state water crab fishery, the directed crab, I'm sorry, not state water directed crab fishery. The federal water directed crab fishery for king and tanner crabs um, is managed by the state of Alaska. And so I think that there's some interest there and some potential for um, analysis of data. Um, but from a practical standpoint, obviously the, the council and the state of Alaska have very different jurisdictional um, forums on, on that and would, would need to, to get together in order to increase observer coverage um, in the, the, the crab fleets um, or do some of the other things like um, maximum retention of legal size males um, in order to limit the amount of time that, that crabbing gear is on the grounds. Um, so those are my main thoughts. Overall, I thought the way the AP process goes, you sort of go through and look at the, the various parts of the motion and figure out, okay, well, what are the things that I want the council to take away from this? Um, and so um, I think a lot of the discussion was 
was was really good because it it sort of um, directed our the deliberations in that in that manner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Wilkins. That was very helpful. You're welcome. Further questions for Mr. Wilkins? Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Heather McCarty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm Heather McCarty, and I'm representing Central Bering Sea Fishermen's Association today. Um, which is the crab, I mean, <laughs> the CDQ group um, in St. Paul in the Pribilof Islands. Um, first, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and the rest of the council, as well as uh, Mr. Witherall and the whole council staff for your patience and your perseverance, your dedication during the last two years. Keeping this, this operation going it was a lot of sitting in front of a camera and it was harder for you than it was for us. So thank you very much. Um, CDQ groups, as you have heard from uh, Mr. Wilkins, have a variety of species that they depend on. Um, we, of course, at CBSFA have pollock, um, an initial uh, CDQ of pollock. We also have pot cod. We participate in trawl fisheries in the Bering Sea. And we also have a great dependence on crab. Um, snow crab is our biggest uh, dependence, but we also um, hold 12% of the Bristol Bay Red King crab processor quota in the Bering Sea. So we depend on both of those crab species, and we recognize, as, as uh, previous testifiers have said, that the city of St. Paul is almost wholly dependent on crab processing. So that's, uh, in addition to crab, we have concerns for all the fisheries that we, that we participate in. And we struggle quite often with balancing those needs. Um, but above all, um, we believe that sustainability of the resources that we all participate in kind of trumps um, ownership of quota. And so we have huge concerns about the sustainability of the Bristol Bay Red King crab um, right now. And we support the original um, AP motion, uh, the intent of the AP motion because of that. We think that action needs to be taken quickly and decisively. Um, I'm gonna speak just a little bit to the motion and then a little bit to EFH, which we heard quite a bit about in previous testimony. Um, regarding the motion, um, I would have liked to have seen an additional option which deals with um, seasonal closures, which would take a look at seasonal closures in, in the Red King Crab Savings Area rather than uh, total um, closures for various gears. Um, and, and then in the amendment, which addresses POCOD and uh, directed crab fisheries, I would say that the POCOD element of it is pretty well addressed in three in two of the three options that are in the motion, because they refer to those gear, that gear as well. So I think the pot cod element is taken care of in the motion itself. Um, and as far as the directed crab fishery goes, I think it's up to the directed crab fishery to put forward ideas. And I think that that is underway. I can say that internally, the crab industry is taking very serious notice of their own issues of crab discards. I think that whole amendment could have been summarized in, you know, one sentence, you know, let's also look at the effect of crab discards um, in the directed crab fishery and make that part of, of the analysis. In terms of the work group, I'm always asking for working groups because I actually believe that stakeholders getting together is probably a good way to solve problems and to bring ideas forward. In this case, I agree with um, what Mr. Mesereau said yesterday. I think that combining the scientists and experts with stakeholders is probably going to result in a little bit of um, dilution of the science discussion. And I would point out that you have a science group of your own already, well, several of them actually, you have the SSC and you have the CPT. 
it's unfortunate that this that the SSC couldn't look at this paper because I think what we've heard is science through the lens of economists we've heard science through the lens of stakeholders but I'd like to see what the SSC says about the science that we have and the science that we still need to do and I think the SSC is probably best qualified to do that so whatever action you take today I would suggest that you consider taking it to the SSC whether or not it's a full analysis or just an expanded discussion paper or whatever it is that you decide to do, let the SSC give you the benefit of their expertise when you next discuss this. And finally, uh, regarding EFH, um, I think there is merit in some of the suggestions that people have made about maybe this is an EFH issue. In 2012, there was a discussion paper presented to the council on Bristol Bay Red King Crab EFH, which contained a number of recommendations. And it would be good to go back to that perhaps and update it, have another discussion. Some of the suggestions were applying a seasonal closure to protect the adult female red king crab from March to May during molting and mating. We don't know how much that might have changed in terms of time and area. I would guess probably not that much. So, you know, some of these suggestions that were made to this council 10 years ago might be helpful as a starting point to discover if the EFH process has any merit being applied to the plight of the Bristol Bay Red King Crab that we're seeing right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Ms. McCarty. Are there any questions? Ms. Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Heather, I wasn't sure I was quite following along with the part of your testimony where you suggested that we don't need the piece of the AP motion that makes three pretty discreet recommendations for the pot cod fishery because they're somehow encompassed in the other motion. And can, so can you help me track how the other pieces of the motion would address area 512 and observer coverage and a PSC limit for the pot cod fishery? Um, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Campbell, they don't. They don't address, the, the current options don't address those specifics um, that are in the amendment. I think that if the council wishes to address the pot cod fishery discreetly, then perhaps that's another action. And I would guess that um, if you did initiate an action on the pot cod fishery, that you would hear ideas and people from the pot cod fishery would come forward and, and, and bring those ideas to the council. I think it, those things need to come from those stakeholders. I'm seeing you're not, I'm seeing I haven't answered your question. Well, I, I just, I guess I'm, I'm struggling to see how, how you, I mean, I've heard a lot of testimony yesterday and today from people who are stakeholders in the pot cod fishery talking about uh, their fishery. So I, I, don't, I don't understand, I guess, your, your advocacy that this somehow be a separate agenda item or that we have, I, I, I mean, I, you answered my question. I, I guess I'm just not, maybe I wasn't fully convinced by your answer. That, that might've been what you were picking up in my facial expression. <laughs> that may have been right. Maybe we should all put masks on again. <laughs> and that's, that's completely fine. I, may I, Mr. Chair? Ms. McCarty, sure. I, I'll, I'll try to say, perhaps be more clear about this. Um, what a number of folks have said from various sectors is that the pot, gear question has been left out, was left out of the original options under alternative two in the AP motion. And I didn't see that because I saw that pot cod was considered as potentially being regulated um, further through these two of the three options. And, and that was my point. So, and I, I guess I kind of objected to the introduction of sort of major pieces of regulation for that fishery uh, as part of this action. Okay. Any further questions for Ms. McCarty? Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up testifying remotely is Hannah Heimbuck.
Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Great. Hi there, Hannah Heimbach testifying for the under 60 cod harvesters. Our member vessels harvest Pacific cod with pot gear, but also fish for sablefish, halibut, salmon, and crab. And I'm here to express support for the request made by the crab fleet to conserve red king crab. The serious stock decline, its impact on fishermen and communities, and the ecosystem stress it signals warrants timely action. Like other pot fishermen and representatives you've heard from yesterday and today, we, we do support a timely restriction on both pot and trawl fishing in the Red King Crab Savings Area and subsection at times like this when the directed fishery is closed due to low abundance. And we, you know, we also support further analysis of the impact of pelagic trawling on bottom habitat considering the increased awareness of time pelagic gear spins on bottom, which, which really is new information um, to a lot of the public. Um, one commenter suggested yesterday that the pot sector is, is opposed to mitigation measures for pots, and I, I just don't think that's true. I think we've heard a lot of support from pot fishermen under 60, over 60 NCPs um, that believe these impacts are all important, and that you don't have to pick between pot and trawl when you're looking at either precautionary measures or more information gathering. You know, both matter. I think that we'll continue to figure out, you know, what those specific uh, directions need to be. And, you know, there is uncertainty around this discussion. Uncertainty for, for pot gear to us is around extrapolation of partial observer coverage data. Uh, as you've heard many times, pot res representatives believe estimated crab mortality in pot cut sectors is inaccurate due in part to a, a high degree of extrapolation and the fact that, that crab intercept tends to occur in lightning strikes and even further increases that inaccuracy. There's also quite a bit of uncertainty about the, the discard mortality estimates. A, a pot vessel harvesting crab has a DMR of 20%, while that same pot vessel harvesting cod has a crab DMR of 50%. We do need to update those DMRs, uh, request more granular spatial data of crab intercepts so we can address it directly and continue to work to improve the partial coverage observer program and electronic monitoring. On the other hand, uncertainty for trawl gear seems to be around how much time pelagic trawl gear is spending on the bottom, uh, the habitat implications of that, and then the, the unquantified observed, unobserved crab mortality by contact with trawl gear. I think to many members of the public listening, it's, it's really hard to believe that that contact mortality is, is negligible or that we would delay action until we can assess it uh, rather than the other way around. So, so we need to address these uncertainties in all of these fleets. And, and I think uncertain and non-existent data is actually a reason for caution. And I think a reasonable caution right now would be restricting fishing by pots and trawl in the savings area at times of low abundance, which is the area that the best available science says is critical. And I know there's, there's some concern that this area may need to be updated or become dynamic. I don't disagree. I think it's okay to recognize that we need new information, but should be precautionary first using what we do know. Um, Regarding the other actions we support, under 60 cod harvesters has pending grant applications that propose to pilot low cost hotspot reporting software. We're exploring how known hotspot strategies can be implemented using really basic mapping software. And our intent is to create a tool and approach that would be useful for any fleet, um, particularly smaller boat fleets that may not have access to other programs that are either expensive or, or dependent upon a cooperative. And that's kind of the long-term work for avoidance. We really believe that these kinds of dynamic avoidance techniques where they can be employed when and where necessary are the best possible way to actually keep crab in the water, especially in a, a changing climate. And that thought is considering that the crab do not always enter baited pots. Um, you know, they have vulnerable mating and molting times that overlap with a significant portion of pot cut fishing that they aren't entering pots. Um, and considering that when pot cod fisheries do encounter crab, it tends to be you know, characterized by those lightning strikes and not steady accrual across the fishery. And then considering the potential, potential for shifts uh, due to climate uncertainty, I, I think the prioritization of dynamic tools, whether they're voluntary or regulatory, um, will, will help us to be most responsive. And then we also support implementing uh, recent gear improvements. We support analysis that looks at how critical habitat and stock aggregations may have changed or may be changing and could then inform you know, the more responsive adaptive approaches for conservation measures for pot fishermen. But I think none of this important developing work should stop us from taking additional precautions in the savings area now that by our, our best available knowledge is a critical place for crab recruitment. Um, so yeah, we support the AP's main motion, which includes regulatory and research measures for, for both pot and trawl sectors. And as the council continues this work, you know, we're happy to, to collaborate on progressive measures to conserve crab. I, I strongly support an action today that, that takes up some of those short and long-term approaches. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ms. Heimbuck.
Are there any questions? Thank you for your testimony. Next up is Edward Polson. Mr. Chairman, members of the council, I'm a third generation crabber and I appreciate the council's leadership in requesting a discussion paper to better understand the ongoing stock decline for red king crab. I urge the council to quickly develop elements and options and take action. The most urgent action that could be taken to reduce potential harm to red crab is to close the red king crab savings area to all gear types other than directed crab fishery. This is an important area for red king crab and the winter A season fishery begins January 20th, at which time mature male and female red crab begin molting. Significant effort from the public fishery within the savings area is apparent, particularly since 2014 from the discussion paper. The discussion paper also highlights just how much the public fishery is on the bottom, which is considerably more than I anticipated. Unfortunately, we don't have a good grasp as to what impact, if any, midwater gear collapsed on the bottom could be having on red crab, um, other than a study from Dr. Rose with Amendment 80 gear that's not directly applicable to pollock gear, but it shows up to 30% unobserved mortality from the foot rope and very high mortality of soft shell crab, albeit with a very small sample size. Clearly, the pollock fishery is not having an impact when reviewing only by catch data. However, the odds of a crab making it to the cod end are very small as a car could fit through the forward mesh of a pollock net, let alone a crab. For this reason, I caution the council from simply focusing on refining PSC limits. This is the easiest approach, but it also does little if a much bigger impact is from unobserved mortality. In addition, ratcheting down PSC levels simply creates an incentive for trawlers to modify gear so that crab don't make it into the cod end and are therefore not observed. The Pollock fleet appears to be an example of this, but I suspect it wouldn't be that difficult for other fleets to incorporate excluders and mesh so that crab fall out on the way to the cod end. To be clear, I understand the Pollock fishery is under considerable pressure because of past regulatory action. They have complicated area closures and hotspot protocols to protect stellar sea lions while avoiding salmon, herring, and black cod. I ask the council to balance all these important species in a reasonable manner while also allowing for a healthy Pollock fishery and protecting red crab. I'd also like to see area closures enacted for the pot cod fleet. Unfortunately, this fleet has had a history of unacceptable high red king crab bite catch. I'd urge the council to exclude this fleet from the savings area at a minimum and consider closing grounds east of AMAC. Further, it's time for the council to consider giving the pot sector, pot cod sector rationalization program. This fleet is racing for history and red, red crab are on the losing end of that. Regarding the directed red crab fishery, I'm concerned that the discussion paper shows a consistent history of discarding more crab than are retained. Although applying the discard mortality rate of 20% against these discards dramatically reduces the impact this has on the resource, it is still an unacceptable level of the discards. The directed red crab fishery can and should do more to reduce our levels of bycatch. I'd urge participants in the fishery to work together to find solutions that can be quickly implemented. This will take coordination between Vessel owners, cooperatives, processors, and ADF&G, but it should be a high priority. Mr. Polson, could you please provide a concluding comment? Yeah. Uh, of course, with the closure, our discards are zero and crabbers are feeling the brunt of the pain, but this should be a high priority. Thank you, Mr. Polson, for your testimony. Ms. Campbell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Edward, I was wondering if you could... Uh, provide a little bit more information on what you think the directed crab fishery can do to reduce their own impacts on this stock. And I, I'm particularly um, aware right now of the high level of sorting that's going on with the undersize uh, and female crab. And so I just wonder if you could speak to that. It's outside the council's direct authority, but clearly an important part of what needs to happen for red king crab. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ms. Campbell, um, yeah, I, in terms of what could actually be done, crab pots are, are designed to allow for sorting. Um, I think first off, we should focus on making sure those pots are, you know, that we have appropriate mesh. I mean, I think actually right now the, the requirements allow for rings or a third of the panel uh, to be escape mesh. I think a, a, shouldn't even have rings, it should have a full panel that should be escape mesh. On. Um, on either the bridal side or the door. 
Um, but further, you need to, I think the fleet needs to get serious about making sure we give these pots enough soak so that the bait is dissipated and the crab can crawl out. Because if you do give these pots enough time to soak on the bottom, they'll do their job and the smaller crab will sort out, um, reducing our bycatch dramatically. Yeah. For example, if you had a, a if, if the fleet could voluntarily do a five day bait up where you bait the pots, let them soak for five days, our bycatch would be considerably better. So there are options the, the industry is trying to figure, I, I know there's a lot of discussions. This is just my own personal opinion as to what could happen. Um, but it's something we have to grasp, grapple with. And uh, I, I know there's already these conversations happening and, and there are potential solutions. They're just gonna take a little bit of time and we need to get a grasp on it before the potentially next fishery happens. Uh, thank you. And then I heard you reference um, in your testimony, you don't think that the pot cod fishery should occur east of AMAC. And we have a, a recommendation from the AP that we close area 512. And part of what I'm struggling with is that we don't have any information in front of us in this discussion paper that would tell us uh, what areas we, we might want to target if we were interested in addressing a red king crab bycatch in the pot cod fishery. Can you help me figure out where I should be looking for that? I've been really digging around since the AP motion came out and I'm just not, I'm not finding the information that we would need to support um, launching those specifics right in front of me today. I, I, yeah, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Campbell, if you, if you wanna look at what the historic closure areas were way back when in terms of red crab, the grounds where red crab are, it's the old pot sanctuary. <laughs> that's a lot of line, a lot of room, right? But it's, it's, that's one thing you could look at. I would say in reality, this is a complicated one. I mean, I'm, I'm saying east of AMAC and the pot and the, the red king crab savings area, because I think they could still prosecute a fishery, but I also know that there's a lot of red crab east of AMAC and in the right king crab savings area. So that's why I'm saying those two. But in reality, I don't have a dog in this fight, but that fleet needs to be rationalized. They need a control date and they need to be given the tools. They need a PSC limit as well. And they need to be given the tools to be able to manage their fishery. Mr. Dell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Edward. Um, I appreciate your your, uh, your comments uh, that you're a third generation fisherman. I, I've been lucky enough to work with you, and I was real fortunate to have got to work with your dad a little bit on 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 the pot cod operations that, that your family had at one time. And um, my my question to you is 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 one I, I just appreciate the the fair and balanced approach that you you always take, Edward. That's why I'm asking you a question. Um, you you, you gave a pretty fair and balanced. I, I read your letter and your your comments tracked here pretty carefully that, that there's a balance to all these important species. And yeah, I said in a, that, that we want to do that in a reasonable manner while allowing for a healthy pollock fishery. And I appreciate you including that in your letter and your comments. But my, my question is, you started out asking for uh, a discussion paper, I think. Do you think that, that that's the, the next correct step for the council to take is to do being that we're, we've just seen a discussion to look at a, another discussion paper um, expanded, including a lot of these ideas and concepts that we've come out with. So we have more information in front of us. Is that is that uh, one way to get to this fair and balanced approach you mentioned? We need your mic. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Down, I um, would urge a, an analysis to be moved forward. I think that, um, you know, that, See, so, some of these issues are complicated, but I would like to see an analysis. I'd like to see this go to the SSC. I'd like the crab plan team to struggle with it, and you don't get that with the discussion paper. It's my concern. So I'd like to see an analysis that can weigh out exactly what we're looking at, so we can have we can really start digging into these issues. And uh, um, you know, just a discussion paper is just kicking it down the road, and and uh, in the meantime, our our stock is suffering. Further question, Mr. Dow? Second question, okay. please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, so if we had a, a an expanded discussion paper that did go to the, the SSC and was brought to the attention of the plan team for their input, would that would that satisfy the the 
would that be a, a maybe a fair balance um, as long as we get the SSC? Is, is your concern the SSC input and the and the the CPT's input as long as is, is or is or is there something more than than that? Is there something more nuanced than that? I, I think it's it's both it's both that and just urgency, you know, in terms of trying to protect the resource, you know, in um, you know, we, we don't, we don't know what's going to, what the survey is going to look like, you know, if it continues declining, you know, time really does matter to try to protect this resource. Um, so it's, it's both urgency and, um, and scrutiny from the scientific community. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Paulson, for your testimony. I want to would like to follow up on Ms. Campbell's first question, and I thank you for including uh, potential measures the directed crab fisheries uh, could take to reduce discards. And so I wanted to ask you if there's Ms. Campbell mentioned that all that is, although that is not within the direct authority of this council, uh, I wanted to ask if there are things the council could do to encourage or facilitate the, the fleet taking, you know, taking a look at those measures. And that's just sort of an open question. Maybe you don't have an answer right now, but. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Baker, I think, yeah, it's, that's a tricky one. I mean, one thing that we have a cooperative structure with CRAB. We already have cooperative reports that we provide to the council. That's something that could be, uh, I'd be in, I'd be fine with, is providing a report to the council in terms of voluntary measures that cooperatives are doing in terms of trying to reduce our red crab bycatch. That's something. I, I'm not really sure other than that, though. I think there are things ADF and G could do uh, easier probably than the council. But, um, you know, I, I would try to, put pressure on the industry to do the right thing voluntarily to help protect the resource. Thank you for that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Any further questions for Mr. Paulson? Thanks. Next up is Lance Farr. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and Council Members. Um, my name is Lance Farr. I'm up here uh, for Fishing Associates this morning at the co-op that uh, I'm in for our uh, crab program. Um, <clears throat> I've been fishing crab in the Bering Sea since 1976 and I've seen the up and downs of the crab industry, but this one could be the worst down I've ever seen. One of the obvious actions would be to protect crab while they are in a vulnerable life stage when they are molting and mating. All sectors that have impact on the Bering sea crab should be operating in ways that lighten their impact on the uh, red crab in the Bering Sea. When crab are mating and molting, they need to be protected. The red crab king crab savings area was established to protect red crab. The recent tagging study suggests that the savings area is in the right place. I believe with the new information from the council paper that Pelagic trawls are on the bottom a majority of the time. The council is establishing the Red King Crab Savings Area today. Pelagic trawls would not be allowed in the savings area because they are on the bottom a majority of the time they are fishing. King crab are mating and molting when the pelagic trawls are in the Red King Crab Savings Area. In the council discussion paper on page 25, it shows a big increase in the area swept since 19 or 2014 in the savings area. It doesn't take much of an imagination that with the increased area swept that there are surely more unobserved mortality. When king crab are molting, they show up in trawl nets. They, they, they wouldn't show up in crawl, trawl nets as bycats because they are destroyed in small pieces. A trawler potentially could not know they were on fishing on king crab because there's nothing in the net to let them know. If crab don't show up in the nets, then the PSC limits are useless as a tool to protect crab. I mean, I just got to say that again. If crab don't show up in the nets, then the PSC limits are useless as a tool to protect crab. If parts of the crab show up in the nets, they are not counted toward PSC limits, is my understanding. Um, <clears throat> unobserved mortality is not accounted for in the stock assessment. 
is not counted towards PSC limits. If the crab model accounts for unobserved mortality as a natural mortality, then by putting the un unobserved mortality as natural mortality in the model, it avoids the National Standards 9. It is not right that the council is putting an unobserved bycatch in the mortality as natural mortality in the model where the man managers are not able to address it. Another issue that needs to be looked at is the expansion of the PSC zone one limit boundary to include the ADF and G area T. This would be managing the Bristol Bay red king crab stock with PSC limits throughout the graph geographical range of the stock. When the PSC limit is reached in area T, then zone one would close to all trawl, trawling, trawl fishing, and there would be, still be an area to fish outside zone one. But the closure of zone one will protect the broad, broad stock of the Bristol Bay red king crab. The council should follow, follow the AP motion and turn this into an analysis. This needs to be an, analyzed so that the SSC can review it. The council prides itself on making scientific based decisions and the SSC need to be, needs to be involved. I looked at the handout provided by Stephanie Matson for the crab bycatch across the sector and area and it is apparent that there are two years that skew the data if you are using the average bycatch of those years, it changes the picture of performance. This is for the pot cod fishery. There are simple explanations for those two outlying years. 2018 was due to the fleet for moving farther north than they had in the previous years with the implementation of attendant deliveries. Unfortunately, at this time, not everybody was using sock tunnels and we learned a hard lesson, which led us to the gear research to reduce bycatch. In 2021, bycatch is the result of the testing the gear to reduce bycatch. So basically we were using, um, testing the Neptune triggers that they use in brown crab pots to keep the crab in. So they, they weren't really keeping the crab out. Those Neptune triggers are used to keep crab in once they get in the pot. So in conclusion, I think the council needs to have the Red King Crab Savings Area close to all trawling to protect Bristol Bay Rig Crab until we get more science to, to protect the crab for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Farr. Are there any questions? Ms. Campbell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Farr. So I'm looking at your attachment and uh, you know, it's pretty clear, I guess, from this that um, Area 512, more than any other stat area, is where red king crab are be ta being taken as, taken as bycatch and groundfish fisheries. And just wondering if you could comment specifically on the piece of the AP motion that attempts to address that, since it's it's pretty clearly illustrated in your attachment. I I'm. Is that part of, of what AP motion said to close that area to, to fishing? Is that what it said? Um, I believe that the uh, pot cod fishery, uh, we can do tremendously better if we're rationalized. I mean, that, that's one of the things that, that, the, that we've come to the council, you know, for years now and said, hey, let us, give us the tools so that we can rationalize this fishery and reduce our bycatch and, and safety. Um, those are the two main things. Um, the sock tunnels, we've, we've done that experiment and they work. So, and then when you, when you stop the race for fish, people are able to move away from crab if they get crab in the pot. Crab move around, you know, sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. So people are able to stop, move under a rationalization system and, and now we can't. They just, people are just keep it hauling, hauling the gear, going for history. So um, I think that's a solution. Thank you for that, Lance. And just to follow up, so obviously if the, and if the council were to start that, it would be a multi-year process and kind of what we might call a long-term uh, way to address this. And some of the testimony that we've heard is that this is an extremely urgent issue. So I guess, can you just comment on how that applies to the pot cod fishery? 
Well, I think if you made a control date, the race for fish would stop right there and people would be able to move. I mean, we fished this year up in 512 in the bee season. We were probably farther northeast than anybody had ever fished before. We had zero bycatch of crab. We had a lot of yellowfin sole, but zero bycatch of crab. Um, so I think we can fish in 512 clean. You just gotta give us the tools. Further questions, Mr. Down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Farr. Um, I'm going to go back to your, your part of your testimony where you talked about these these outlying years, 2028, 2018, and 2021. And I I also looked at at the handout that Ms. Madsen provided in in her public testimony and and uh, noticed the same thing with those years. I'm mostly interested in 2021 because um, so I I, I the um, your testimony was that in 2021, you were doing this NPRB study and that, uh, and I think we've heard that testimony here at the council before, so I won't, uh, belabor that much, but, um, some of the gear was designed actually to catch crab. So you had something to compare that to, and you were fishing in areas where you knew there was crab because you needed to, to compare th th those things. But my question is, have you brought this to the attention of the National Marine Fisheries Services? Um, and I'm asking you this in part because it's public record here on the council and we've got the representative from uh, Alaska region director sitting here, but have you brought this to the attention? I mean, what, 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 what's it gonna take to get this corrected or have they just given you a firm no on correcting that, that deal because it was, it was done during a scientific study. It doesn't seem to me to be a good reflection of what actually took place, place on the grounds. You had an observer on a boat. And so I'm just asking, what, what, what is your co-op, you're testifying for the co-op and your co-op members done to try to convince National Marine Fishery Service or to show the, the information that maybe this data should be looked at a little more carefully? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I, uh, I haven't personally brought it to National Marine Fishery Service, but I, I saw the spreadsheet, the Excel spreadsheet, and there was one boat that had all the, the bycatch and the rest, the rest of them didn't have any or, or negligible. Um, I was my understanding that we now years ago we had a CP in the pot fishery that had a big bycatch and they extrapolated out through the gear. We had a big um, crab bycatch number and they redid it. And they took, they, I'm not sure what they did, if they just uh, took that out or, or not, uh, and then um, averaged the rest of the fleet. But um, I personally haven't talked to National Marine Fisheries the Service about, I've seen the spreadsheet and it's one boat. And I I know, well, Craig could probably answer it more. Um, he's our um, executive director of the Podcod. Uh, I think he's talked talk to them, but I, I don't want to put any words in his mouth, but I think it's it should be redone. Thank you. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Farr. I, in follow up to those questions now, there seems to be attention paid to the idea that we extrapolate data from observed boats to unobserved vessels. If that is typically how we do, or how the agency uses the observer data for all fleets at all times in a partially covered fleet, is there this kind of consternation about that process, is there a, a willingness for the pot fleet to then move to 100% coverage in order to avoid that scenario? I, I've not heard that, that desire, but at the same time, this line of questioning makes me very uncomfortable about whether we might ask the agency to change some data. I think a caveat around that data might be appropriate, but let's be very careful about what we're putting on the record. My question is, is there a willingness to move to 100% coverage or are we still comfortable in the partial coverage fleet for your non-rationalized sector? Well, yeah, two parts. The first, the first part about using uh, uh, experimental uh, fishing um, gear to extrapolate to the rest of the fleet when the rest of the fleet isn't using it, that, that's, that's just wrong. You know, that's just wrong data. 
as far as as getting more river coverage and i you know i i don't i'm not sure what we pay now is that one or two percent of our gross for uh pay for observers and i think i am just speaking for myself i can't speak for the rest of the fleet because I'm, I'm not a, representing the fleet up here but i think uh if we went to a, um electronic monitoring that we might be able to uh get more coverage for the same amount of money and that's where I think we should be going personally, but I, I don't want to talk for the fleet. Thank you very much. Any further questions for Mr. Farr? Thank you. Thank you. Teresa Peterson. Um. Good morning, Chairman Kinneen, members of the council. It's, it's nice to see everybody back in the ballroom again. And I um, wanted to say congratulations to Mr. Curlin on your new position, and we look forward to working with you. Um, for the record, my name is Teresa Peterson um, with the Alaska Marine Conservation Council, and, and thanks for the opportunity to comment today. I don't know that I have anything new to add. You've had a, a lot of information brought forward um, in front of you these last couple of days, and I, th I think um, you have, have a lot to work with. As the council is well, well aware, the red king crab stocks are at a level of serious conservation concern and need immediate management attention and subsequent action to re support recovery. AMCC encourages the council to move this discussion forward with an analysis and dedicate the time and resources needed to get, back, get information back before the council in October if at all possible. In the meantime, ideally all user groups can come together and use the collective experience of the fishermen in the Bering Sea to identify both short and long-term mitigation measures. We support the formation of a work group with the stakeholders we see value in the groups coming together as all sectors have fishing impacts on the red king crab and a role in their recovery. It would probably make sense for scientists and the SSC to meet in a separate venue and contribute to the discussion from a scientific perspective. The prioritized list provided in public comment from the Alaska Bering Sea Crabbers outlines a comprehensive approach and offers a variety of actions to consider. We are at a at a critical crossroads and, and to explore, is this a need to explore more adaptive management and management strategies, reduce bycatch and fishing impacts, provide habitat and life stage protection measures and address unaccounted for fishing impacts. While we recognize that the Bering Sea is experiencing a climate change, which in turn changes overall fishing dynamics, as we grasp with adaptive management measures in the face of climate change, the, the council can focus attention on what can be controlled in the current process, namely fishing pressure, bycatch, and habitat protections. I believe one of the most concerning issues that was highlighted in the discussion paper is the amount of time pelagic gear spends on the bottom. This understanding supports further exploration of impacts to the vulnerable crab during molting and mating season when they encounter mobile gear. The visual of effort by the Pollock fleet in the A season in the Red King Crab savings areas during molting and mating periods highlights the need for increased understanding of where the crab are in the winter months and shell condition to understand impacts. The impacts to the crab will be influenced by shell condition during during periods of the highest vulnerability in the winter months and additional protections should be considered. We recognize that the definition of pelagic trawling in the paper is defined by specifications in the trawl nets. However, as the discussion moves forward, it'd be helpful to review past decisions which sought to limit bottom contact, protect crab by closing areas to bottom trawl gear based on what we know now in terms of time on the bottom in, of pelagic gear. In other words, if decision makers had an understanding that legally specified pelagic gear in the Bering Sea was making contact with the bottom a significant amount of time deployed, would the same decision to allow pelagic trawling in the red king crab saving areas during mating and molding season been reached? AMCC believes it is critical to get a comprehensive understanding of the amount of time pelagic gear spends on the bottom. And in the context of act, this action, we support further analytical review, which considers limits to the amount of time 
pel pelagic trawls make contact with the bottom, particularly, particularly in the red king crab swimming area. The limit would need to be paired with a monitoring technique such as, as bottom trawl centers, uh, sensors. AMCC encourages the council to move forward with an analysis to explore the measures to protect the declining red king crab stocks and look at all sources of mortality, including unobserved mortality and discards in all fisheries. Meaningful actions to reduce fishing impacts should be taken by all sectors with a focus on protecting the vulnerable life stages of molting and mating crab. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Are there any questions? Don't see any. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, circling back to the uh, to those that we missed, uh, Brandon Arndt. Or I will give opportunity for a final word for Doug. Well, with that, that concludes public comment. Thank you, everybody. Let's go ahead and take a, a 15 minute break. We'll come back and see what action the council would like to take. Council, please come back to order. All right, are we ready for action? Sorry, Mr. Chair, I don't know what that is. It's this. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I do have a motion. And I'm gonna have to read it off of the displayed screen, having a little technical difficulty here. The council requests that each Bering Sea sector with crab mortality, directed crab fishery, Pacific cod sectors, AFA Pollock, and Amendment 80, present the following to the council in October 2022 as applicable. Voluntary measures for implementation in 2023 and beyond to avoid Bristol Bay Red King crab and reduce crab mortality in the non-directed fisheries. Measures in the directed crab fishery to reduce discard mortality of Bristol Bay Red King crab and description of research that would inform development of more flexible and effective spatial management measures. Gear modifications to reduce impacts on the Bristol Bay Red King crab stock or to evaluate unobserved mortality in the trawl sector. The council requests an expanded discussion paper that includes one, analysis of the impacts of annual or seasonal closures to pelagic trawl, ground fish pot and longline gear in the Red King crab savings area including impacts on target catch, fishery timing relative to crab mating and molting, crab avoidance, and other PSC and non-target species. Number two, tables for all sources of Bristol Bay Red King crab mortality across federal fisheries. For the pot, longline, and trawl ground fish fisheries, total estimated PSC and registration area T in numbers, proportion of total PSC in zone one, portion of total PSC in Red King Crab Savings Area, estimated PSC mortality, and estimated proportion of PSC that are female. Information should also be provided on fishery timing in relation to Bristol Bay Red King Crab molting and mating, estimated bottom contact of the gear, observer coverage rates, and assumed discard mortality rates. For the directed Bristol Bay Red King Crab Fishery and the Tanner Fishery in the Eastern Subdistrict, 
estimated mortality presented in a revised version of table 3-3 from the April 2022 discussion paper. It contains total retained catch, total discards, discard mortality, proportion of discards that are female, observer coverage rate, and assumed discard mortality rate. Number three, a discussion of scientific information needed to create dynamic closed areas, such as seasonal or annual shifting closed areas to protect mature female Bristol Bay red king crab. Number four, information needed to allow the Amendment 80 sector to create rolling hotspot closure systems to avoid and reduce Bristol Bay red king crab PSC, as well as the potential trade-offs of doing so on encounter rates of halibut. Number five, provide information on the impact of brown fish predation on Bristol Bay red king crab. Number six, analysis of the impacts of prohibiting fishing for Pacific cod with pot gear in area 512 and establishing a hard cap for the under 60 fixed gear sector and over 60 pot sector. The council requests the expanded discussion paper. Go to the SSC for review and comment if that can be accomplished without delaying council review and action. With a second, I'll speak to the motion, Mr. Chair. Second. Second. Seconded by Mr. Mesereau. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I'd just like to start out by uh, thanking uh, the staff and all of the stakeholders who participated uh, in this action at this meeting. We've heard a lot of information, we've heard a lot of ideas. And uh, really uh, my overall goal with, goal with this motion is to try and synthesize all of the issues that we've heard about and, and really uh, highlight and move forward with the ones that show the most promise to address uh, the, the very concerning status of the Bristol Bay Red King crab stock. And I'll start out uh, by putting this motion in context by reminding uh, the council and the public that uh, given the news uh, that the Bristol Bay Red King Crab Fishery directed fishery will be, would be closed this year, uh, the council does have, and the state of Alaska and the council do have uh, built-in management measures uh, that are intended to protect uh, the, the, the stock, including the regulatory threshold to close the directed fishery when mature female abundance uh, is low, meant to promote rebuilding and protect against recruitment over fishing. And in addition to the directed fishery closure, recall that the council uh, established crab PSC limits for the trawl ground fish fisheries. Uh, and when the uh, Bristol Bay Red King crab mature female threshold is below a certain level, uh, the PSC limits, the crab PSC limits are reduced pretty significantly and the Red King crab savings sub area is closed as well. And although the council has received public comment uh, that these measures may not be enough to help improve the status of the Bristol Bay Ray King crab stock. I think it's important uh, to set this motion in context uh, that the public that the council has developed PSC management measures in response to declining Bristol Bay Ray King crab biomass. So based on the AP's recommendation for this agenda item and public comment, uh, my motion requests additional information that may be helpful in determining whether additional management measures are appropriate to minimize bycatch and bycatch mortality of Bristol Bay red king crab in council managed fisheries to the extent practicable, consistent with national standard nine. I'd like to point out, we recognize, I think that there are many environmental impacts associated with declines in Bristol Bay red king crab, but council management authority is limited to ground fish fisheries in the Bering Sea. And this motion is focused on what we can control with respect to those fisheries. The first component of the motion uh, includes a request for all fishery sectors with crab mortality, and that includes the directed crab fishery, Pacific cod sectors, uh, AFA pollock fishery, and Amendment 80 to present uh, a few things uh, to the council and to the council in October 2022. First, uh, voluntary measures for implementation in 2023 and beyond for non, or excuse me, uh, to avoid Bristol Bay Red King crab and reduce crab mortality in the non-directed fisheries. Uh, we're also, this motion would also request 
the directed crab fishery uh, to report to the council on measures that could be taken to reduce discard mortality of Bristol Bay Red King crab and that fishery. And finally, uh, this motion would request a description of research that would inform development of more flexible and effective spatial management measures, gear modifications to reduce impacts on the Bristol Bay Red King crab stock, or to evaluate unobserved mortality in the trawl sector. All issues that we've heard about in public testimony and in public comment uh, that we think may have longer term uh, pop promise to impact or reduce impacts on the Bristol Bay Ray King crab stock from our fisheries. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh, the intent of this request is to recognize that any regulatory measures that this council considers must go through an analytical and regulatory process, and that there may be voluntary measures that the industry can take to avoid crab bycatch or reduce bycatch or discard mortality. These measures may provide more immediate benefits to the Bristol Bay Red King crab stock than a regulatory amendment action can offer. Moving on, Mr. Chair, the next part of the motion requests an expanded discussion paper to provide the council with more information on several issues that were highlighted in the AP motion and in public comment. The first request is for further, or excuse me, an analysis of impacts of annual or season closures to pelagic trawl ground fish pot and longline gear, gear in the Red King Crab Savings Area. And the, again, this was uh, modeled after the advisory panel motion in terms of the Red King Crab Savings Area restrictions that would be considered. Uh, the AP suggested that the council move forward with an analysis of that and I'm not ready uh, to move forward with an analysis at this point. I think there is some uh, information that we don't have in the current discussion paper related to, in particular, my suggestion to include uh, pot gear and longline gear in that potential closure of the Red King Crab Savings Area. I think uh, based on the premise that we've heard from many public testifiers at this meeting, uh, if the red king crab savings area is indeed uh, important to protect red king crab, particularly mature female crab, particularly when they're molting and mating, then it is important that we consider the impacts uh, of prohibiting all fishing gear in that area. And so I'm picking up on that concept uh, somewhat from the AP motion, but I think we need a little more information before we're ready to initiate an analysis on that. And so that's why I've included the request for an expanded discussion paper. The next request in the motion that's under number two, requests additional data on all sectors that contribute to Bristol Bay Red King crab mortality. I think one of the challenges that we've had, uh, again, identifying a path forward uh, with the challenge in front of us related to Bristol Bay Red King Crab bycatch and bycatch mortality is that thus far we, we haven't had uh, all of the information in one place in a format that's easily comparable in terms of crab mortality across all the sectors. And again, I think I said this earlier, but I'm, I think this information is very important for the council to have because fishing mortality is the one factor that we know we have control over as fishery managers. And again, given the concerns about the status of Bristol Bay Red King crab stock, I think it is critical for the council and the public to have holistic information on all sources of fishing mortality, particularly discard mortality, in order to help determine what additional management measures or voluntary measures may help for the reduced bycatch mortality and improve the status of the Bristol Bay Red King crab stock. Mr. Chair, uh, in the interest of time, I'll try to move quickly through the rest of the information, or excuse me, the requests in the motion. 
uh, numbers three, four, and five are really uh, trying to synthesize requests for information we've heard in public testimony. Uh, for example, number three, a discussion of scientific information needed to create dynamic closed areas, such as seasonal or annual shifting areas to protect mature female Bristol Bay red king crab. In our current discussion paper, the council did identify its interest in, in pursuing the idea of more flexible management measures, such as seasonal or, or annual shifting closed areas. But I think it's clear that we need to do a little more work thinking about what information would be needed to inform development of those ideas. Number four, uh, we've had a little discussion at this meeting that uh, there may be potential for the Amendment 80 sector to create rolling hotspot closures to avoid and reduce Bristol Bay Red King Crab PSC. But as we know, and as we heard about in public testimony, there will be trade-offs of, of doing so, particularly with uh, particularly related to halibut PSC, and I think it's important that we explore those as well. Number five, provide information on the impact of ground fish predation on Bristol Bay Red King Crab. Mr. Chair, this was included in the advisory panel motion, and we did hear about it in public testimony as well. And although I personally don't have a lot of knowledge about this, uh, I think it's important uh, that we consider this issue uh, in terms of its potential impact on the many factors that are affecting Bristol Bay red king crab so we can make informed decisions on federal fishery, ground fish fishery management measures that this council might want to pursue. Number six, uh, the discussion, we're requesting the discussion paper and include analysis of impacts of prohibiting fishing for Pacific cod with pot gear in area 512 and establishing a hard cap for the under 60 foot fixed gear sector and the over 60 foot pot sector. Those two items also were included in the advisory panel motion. Consistent with my earlier comments about needing to take a holistic look at potential actions this council could take uh, to reduce bycatch and bycatch mortality of Bristol Bay Red King crab in federal groundfish fisheries. I think it is important to take a look at these measures, uh, particularly because we had a little discussion earlier today in public testimony, and the council has previously received information about uh, high levels of catch, relatively high levels of catch of crab uh, in the pot cod fishery in area 512. So I think it's important to take a look at that. I did not pick up a couple of the advisory panel recommendations related to the pot cod fishery, uh, the, the recommendation recommending looking at 100% observer coverage. While I understand the sentiment of that, uh, that really given the complexities of our partial coverage observer program and issues related to catch accounting, I thought if that's really an important priority, that should probably be done in a separate action. And then the final recommendation uh, to look at measures for gear soak time and escape mechanisms. I appreciate again the sentiment of that, but that seems more that a, perhaps an industry measure uh, to pursue. This this council, uh, to my knowledge, has not developed regulations in terms of that level of detail uh, with respect to pot fisheries, and so I did not include that in the motion. The last recommendation, Mr. Chair, would be that the council requests this expanded discussion paper go to the SSC for review and comment. As long as that can be accomplished without delaying council review and action, we've, we've heard that uh, in public testimony, particularly today, uh, that that was an important factor. And I can confirm, I've talked to a couple of SSC members, and I think that an expanded discussion paper that covers these issues that I'm suggesting in my motion, I would definitely benefit from SSC review. And I have a few more comments, Mr. Chair, but that gets me through the motion. So perhaps I'll take any questions. Great. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Questions on the motion? Mr. Down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Baker, for your, your motion. Um, I think one of the things that that uh, that I've got a, a number of questions here 
Um, I appreciate the motion very much, and, and uh, uh, I won't won't. Um, I'll, I'll I'll stay at, at asking questions. So, um, in the first section of the document on the what you're asking the various gear groups to come back and um, and present to the council in October is uh, you you mentioned. Uh, evaluate unobserved mortality in the trawl sector in that section, but it's not mentioned in the section the council requests an expanded discussion paper it includes. And I'm, I, I just wanted to clarify, I'm assuming that this expanded discussion paper would also look at any new information or new studies or new best available science that might uh, be included to better inform us on that as well, rather than just asking the industry to do that because I don't I don't believe you mentioned unobserved mortality in the part that's going to be in the discussion paper but I I'm, I'm looking for clarification that that's your intention that, that that would also be looked at in the discussion paper. Thank you Mr. Chair Mr. Down for the question. Actually I, I did not intend for the discussion, the expanded discussion paper to include a specific discussion of unobserved mortality, because as I understood it, and obviously I'm not up on the latest science necessarily, we essentially have all of the information that we, everything we know about unobserved mortality and uh, related to crab in our current discussion paper. And the reason that I included this request for industry to come back later this year with research ideas to inform development that might help us evaluate unobserved mortality in the trawl sector to improve the information we currently have. Uh, I didn't see any value in asking for an expanded, for the expanded discussion paper to address unobserved mortality because I'm not aware of any more information that staff could provide. Thank, thank you. On, on that same topic, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, Ms. Baker, I, I, I suppose there wouldn't be anything that would preclude a look at, and I'm not an expert on, on what is out there that's new, but I am aware of, of some papers that weren't looked at, that are available, that, that maybe should, should be or could be looked at. That would be up to the analysts, of course, to whether those are relevant or not. But there's nothing in here that would preclude that from being in a expanded discussion paper as well, so that we'd be better informed on unobserved mortality. Is, is that right? Or, 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 I, or are you thinking that if there is that kind of thing, then, then industry would bring that forward in that section of where you've mentioned unobserved mortality? Mr. Chair, thank you for the question, Mr. Down. I think there's a lot in this motion and should it pass, I envision a pretty good size expanded discussion paper. So my initial reaction to that question is, I'm not, I wouldn't be recommending that staff include an explicit discussion of unobserved mortality in the expanded discussion paper. I think I was thinking more along the lines of the second approach you outlined, that if there is additional information on unobserved mortality that industry feels was not included in the discussion paper for this meeting, I would hope that the council would hear about that in October. And that could be folded into any subsequent documents moving forward at that time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Ms. Baker. That, that seems a very fair approach to me and I appreciate that, that clarification. Um, so on the, the SSC review to the, to, to the, your last uh, piece of your SSC review and comment, um, I'm, I did, I, that's kind of to the extent that that's practical without delaying that, the, this coming back to the council for review. Um, would that also, would it be your intention that that would also include the crab plan team meeting and, uh, yeah, or the, clamp, the CPT, excuse me, the crab plan team, um, as well as the SSC would, would see this discussion 
paper if we have time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Down. I did think about that uh, in, in drafting this motion. And I think in an ideal situation, of course, the crab plan team would review the expanded discussion paper. But based on my recent memory of the crab plan team agenda, uh, there were some very high, longstanding high priorities for the crab plan team to get through. And so I guess with that, <laughs> again, ideally the crab plan team would review it, but I don't want to disrupt the current priorities of the crab plan team. And I would rely on our staff to work with uh, the crab plan team chairs and co-chairs and plan team coordinators to determine if that's possible, depending on also the timeline of when this paper is, can likely come back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Baker. So I, I have a um, on the one one of the things we heard a lot about in, in public comment, Mr. Chairman. If I might have another question, that, that one of the things we heard a lot about in public comment is is uh, from uh, Scott Goodman's written report and 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 verbal oral testimony here was where where is you know is this crab moving is the you know, where is the center of distribution is the Bristol Bay Red King Crab Savings Area and the supplemental area, um, uh, the, the right area, or should we be looking at other areas such as we looked at in the emergency action, um, the areas to the north or so is, is that looking at that issue just I, I'm assuming that's in this, this uh, piece it's the, you know, looking at dynamic uh, um, rather than static uh closure areas and stuff that industry might bring that information forward is that is that your intention that we'd have a, a better look at that because it seems to be one of the big questions that came up in my mind here was was is this even the right area that we should be looking at or should this be a different area or an expand that that area plus some other areas or that that that's my i think you get the intention of my question thank you Mr. Chair, thank you, Mr. Don, for the question. Yes, I, th I think that's largely correct in, in terms of understanding that, I think we had some good testimony today that summarized it. it we know we lack information uh, related to distribution of red king crab. And there is ongoing work, uh, particularly the satellite tagging project that we've heard about, and the state is, is a partner in that. And I think that was the thinking in terms of number three in, in the proposed motion that we, we recognize that there is scientific information uh, that would be needed to create more dynamic management uh, as we envision. And so that those types of projects uh, are, we've been talking about them and it's quite frankly hard for me to keep track of all of them. And so I was hoping that this discussion paper would help line some of those out a little bit more so we can start thinking about what might be possible and what information would be needed to develop responsive and timely management measures for red king crab bycatch. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, is it on that point, Ms. Kimball? Okay, Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Bigger, for the motion. And on that last point, um, just to clarify intent and timing, we heard in testimony a couple folks that are working on that winter crab survey that the hope is to have that in the water for 2023, but there's not an intent that I'm reading in your motion to wait for the results of that survey prior to potentially getting an analysis back of closing the existing red king crab savings area. Did I, I wanted to make sure I, we weren't waiting for that information in order to look at this particular point and if you could clarify. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Kimball, for that question, that clarification. Yes, that is correct. This motion does not intend uh, for, for, as you just described, uh, for us to wait to get the tagging information, the winter survey information, any of, of the ongoing research in order to move forward with the analysis of closing the Red King Crab Savings Area to all fishing gear, as I've proposed in number one in this motion. Mr. Witherell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Baker. I, I, my questions are to try and clarify exactly what it is you want in this discussion paper from staff, because obviously we wanna bring you back what you're looking for. Uh, my first question is um, in number one and six of the discussion paper, you say analysis of impacts. And I want to clarify, is that analysis of impacts to the red king crab stock? Is it a full environmental assessment of the impacts? Is it, uh, does it include a economic impacts on the fleet and distributional impacts of making management actions or socioeconomic impacts to communities and crew, et cetera? I mean, what's the scope of what analysis of impacts mean? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Witherell. I anticipated that question. I, I know it's a little bit uh, challenging in the different terms that we use. My vision uh, was for a fairly, what I would call a preliminary high level analysis of the impacts of taking number one, for example, closing the Bristol Bay Red King Crab, excuse me, the Red King Crab Savings Area to all fishing gears. Yes, the, the potential impacts on Bristol Bay Red King Crab, the potential impacts on fishery timing, interactions with other non-target and PSC species. And I did not envision significant or detailed economic analysis, more high level, positive or negative, some degree of potential magnitude, if at all possible. So I did not envision an extensive quantitative analysis, more descriptive high level to give a sense of what the anticipated, maybe a better word is effects, rather than a full analysis. Does that help? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And that applies to number six as well, same idea. Okay. Yes, Mr. Weatherhouse. And second question, Mr. Chairman. On number one, the seasonal closures, are we, uh, I, I'm trying to understand what a seasonal means. Is that something related to molting and mating time period? Mr. Chair, Mr. Witherall, that is what I was thinking. Apologies for not speaking to that earlier. I think we've heard, well, in our current discussion paper, we, we do have some the best information we have on molting and mating. I have heard specifically in public testimony, perhaps seasonal closures January through March might be helpful, January through June. Those were the two that I've heard mentioned. Uh, I think something like that along with an annual would provide the council with some good information in the expanded discussion paper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Mr. Mesereau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Baker, for your motion. My question is regarding uh, number six, the analysis of the impacts um, for the Podcod fleet. And I was wondering, um, you, you say here that establishing a PSC hard cap for both uh, over and under 60 foot sectors. And I was wondering if you considered, um, you know, rate based and time and area closures, or if you think those might be something that they could work out within their own fleet under a hard cap as ways to manage that. Through the chair, thank you, Mr. Mesereau for that question. I hadn't thought about those measures specifically. Uh, thank you for raising that. I was essentially trying to pick up on the concept of the advisory panel motion and appreciating the work that was done to come up with those recommendations. 
as I mentioned earlier, one of the recommendations I did not pick up from the advisory panel was related to pot soak time and escape mechanisms, which I felt certainly were, were within uh, the bounds of industry, probably to better address than any regulatory measure. And I would agree, uh, the, the types of management measures that you just recommended uh, might be much more effective than PSC hard caps. And, and so while I didn't include it in my motion, because again, I was trying to be cognizant of the volume of information included in this request, uh, I certainly would not want to preclude ideas like that in the future, if it makes sense. Further questions on the motion? go to uh, any amendments to offer. Ms. Kimball. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I don't have an amendment at this point. I was just gonna ask another question on number three in particular, Ms. Baker on the discussion of what might be needed to move into the realm of dynamic closed areas. Is that something you envision the staff being able to provide or will that be heavily dependent on actually SSC input on that particular question. I'm wondering how you how you see that moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for the question, Ms. Kimball. I don't have a clear path for how that would best work, but the way my thought process went is in theory, the work group recommended by the advisory panel, I thought in an ideal situation, would be an excellent place for that type of information to be identified. I didn't mention it in my previous comments, but I did not pick up the work group idea that was in the advisory panel motion because I, I think it's premature at this time. I think we had testimony about that. Uh, I think this motion is requesting data in other forms that would be helpful to facilitate any potential discussion. So in terms of this motion, I did an envision staff to uh, develop the expanded discussion paper for this item to consult industry representatives uh, to see if, if they had thought about that at all, uh, appropriate researchers to put the discussion paper together. And yes, then SSC review I thought would be particularly informative for this particular request. Any further questions or amendments? Okay, go to comments on the motion. Ms. Vanderhoven. Um. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Baker, for your motion. Um, I think it's a really good motion. I think all sectors um, that have an impact will be encouraged to take a deep look at what their impact is and what they can do. Um, I agree with you that the expanded discussion paper is the right way to go at this point. Um, and the papers very that we have now is very responsive to the council's October motion. But I think through having this paper and public comment at this meeting, we recognize that there's more information we need to help us clarify a path forward. Um, and so with that, I'm, I'm gonna support your motion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vanderhoven. Mr. Marks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ms. Baker for the motion. Um, it, I appreciate your your work at uh, expanding the scope of the discussion paper, you've, you've captured the uh, good suite of elements to, to help really focus in or, or identify where the sources of mortality may lie. I think it's a good approach to, to look to individual sectors for self-reflection on, on their um, gear type and their fisheries and, and how what improvements they can make to reduce uh, mortality of, of red king crab. So I think that's good. I think it's uh, especially in light of, you know, 
folks are feeling urgency to, to tackle this problem. And I think working within their hub, they can, they can actually um, do that. To, they're in, as in all work groups, I, I, I think that's a great idea for industry, but it does take time to build trust. And I encourage everyone to, to, to work on that and, and work across lines. But I, I think this is an effective way to really jump in. And, and I think uh, a lot of times people, people are harder focused or, or evaluate themselves harder the, through the self, self evaluation. So I, I look forward to feedback from industry on, on what they're doing and what they can do to, to help mitigate, minimize the impacts to red king crab. Um, probably just the last thing I wanna to touch on and I, I appreciate what you've done. I, and I think it, but in the future, I, we need to um, con consider the uh, monitoring and evaluation piece. piece. I think that's, that's uh, appropriate later because we don't know exactly what we're doing, but we should be thinking through that or industry should be thinking through that and, and their responsibility for, again, continuing the self-evaluation to, to make sure we're having the intended effect on, on what we, we uh, implement. And, and the other piece of that is just the, the uh, survey work. I, I hope um, it's robust enough that we can detect changes uh, this year, we've had some significant changes in, in the, uh, with, with, with the closure of the fishery and, and the stand down for the, the pot gear and the reduction in, in PSC limits for the, uh, for the trawl sector. I, I hope that's detectable or, or some way we can see that uh, through the surveys and that, that's an unknown because we will be missing some information, but I just want to highlight the importance of the, the monitoring and evaluation piece. So I support the motion, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Marks. Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Baker, thank you for your usual job of, of doing a whole lot of synthesis of a whole lot of input on complex issues. Um, I too support your motion um, and uh, appreciate the long nights and, and frantic work during breaks that you put in to, to pull this together um, at the appropriate point in the process. I've been thinking a fair amount about the issue of expediency. Uh, Certainly, I understand the sense of urgency that a lot of people feel about this uh, and the interest in moving into action. Um, but as I suggested, I think in some of my questions regarding the AP report, um, if you don't have the right set of alternatives for analysis, you can get started on analysis, but you're really not gonna get anywhere. And you're gonna end up having to go back to the start Resift the information to develop the right set of alternatives, and then you can actually proceed with a meaningful analysis. And I think a majority of council members were persuaded that the alternatives that had been proposed for analysis in front of us weren't the right set yet. Uh, and I think Ms. Baker has done an excellent job of really sorting through the, the kinds of information that we're going to need. With, with an eye to availability in order to not slow this down tremendously. I think she struck the right balance between information availability and information need to allow us to craft the right set of alternatives for analysis. Again, it just doesn't do us any good to start off on an analysis with the wrong set, knowing we'll have to go back to the beginning again. It ultimately, that takes longer doing it right from the start is the best approach in terms of expediency. And I think this motion does that. And I appreciate Ms. Baker's work and the unsung efforts of the people who helped her pull it together. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Mr. Kurland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just add my kudos to Ms. Baker for this motion on this challenging issue. Uh, we all, of course, share concern about the status of the Bristol Bay Red King Crab resource. 
I think this strikes an appropriate balance to obtain additional information regarding all relevant fisheries to minimize bycatch and, and unobserved mortality. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kerland. Mr. Down. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got I've got a couple of notes highlighted here, and honestly, I don't really know what it is I'm I'm about to to say. So I'm treading on a little bit dangerous territory here, and I'll, I'll just put that out because you know I I've I've, I've been a bit uh, emotionally stirred by this issue, and um, and I. Uh, I believe that the council asked for the right things from the discussion paper that, that we just saw. And I, th I think the analysts did a good job of providing us the best information they could on particularly our items one and number three that, that we were looking at the overlap in the seizure, the seasonal overlap in the fisheries and mating and molting times. And we've got some great information on that and the and bottom contact by the Plagic gear all in, in one discussion paper. I think that that was good that there was definitely a lot of public comment on that, that um, people were not aware of this or didn't know where to find that information. So I think that the discussion paper did a really good job of flushing some of that stuff out and adding that to this important conversation that we're gonna be, be having on, uh, on the, the king crab. I, I, I remain concerned about timing and I'll be watching that as we go. When I look at what happened in 20, the 2019 survey and the difference between the 2019 survey and the 2021 survey, we didn't have a survey in 2020, we might have been able to, to have taken some action, uh, move started moving forward had we had a, a, a survey in 2020, I don't know, but when 25% of the adult females in a population that was already uh, declining for 10, 10 years or more, um, uh, drops by 25%. When I do the math on that, I, we don't we don't have a lot of time here. And so um, I, I feel that that we've, we've got that recognition where we're, we're doing the, the best we can. Ms. Baker's motion, I think, uh, um, is, is perhaps the, the natural outfall of what we've seen here and that uh, and and will um, will help us move together. I appreciate the, 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 that she's asked industry to come back in October. That's, that's, that's very, that's very quick, you know, that we would be hearing back from industry. And she, and I appreciate that she specified October and, and that, and I'm sure we'll, we'll have maybe more conversation on the staff task and see what's, what's possible in our agenda. But I, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to be supportive of that motion just in large part because of that, because we're, we're not de delaying. We're gonna hear more about this from industry and what can industry do um, and uh, to, to help with that. So when I'm, uh, we, we heard some information, you know, I, I've heard in information um, and we heard some in public testimony, but I've heard about, you know, people that are gonna be selling their homes and, and uh, losing their retirement and, uh, people have no way to replace these high earning capacity jobs and kind of the, the really tough situation that that puts people in. And I think we're all aware of how that cascades uh, down into family impacts with really people's relationship struggles that they might have and children suffering and consequences of the social degradation that's inseparable from these kind of uh, industry collapses. Um, and uh, I think maybe I'm I'm quite sensitive to this issue. Uh, um, you know, recalling when I was a, a young kid and my stepdad cut his thumb off in an industry accident and, uh, um, and we lost our home. So I'm sensitive to that issue. But what I don't want to do is go so far with that is to indicate that somehow I'm more sensitive to that than any other council member. And uh, that's, that's important for me to say that, that, that every person on this council that I've talked to is very sensitive to these issues. Everybody understands that uh, the, the hardships that are there. It's, it's, it, I, I don't, uh, um, I, I don't uh, want to lay any claim to, uh, to understanding that to, or, or being more sympathetic or than anyone else, not one iota, because this, the council is very, very uh, sympathetic to these these hardships that people are feeling uh, as as a whole, 
And I know that because I've talked to every single council member about this issue. Um, there's, uh, um, you know, there, there's a, 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 a quote here that I, I wanna mention that I'd, I'd had written down for some time. Here's one that came to me from one of my favorite authors, but it says there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe nor politic nor popular, but he must take the take it because his conscience tells him it's it's what is right. And so uh, my opinions on this that I've expressed throughout have been been my you know partly my my conscience and and uh, as as other council members have too. I think that that this motion that Miss Baker re reflects that, that that we have this inner we don't always we all have our own inner conscience that's telling us what we should do what we can do what we we can't do and we all want it I think everybody wants to do everything that they can um and uh you know I I, I think that we're gonna have to make some you know eventually this council will get to a place where we have to make the decision and it's not the 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 decisions that we make that are going to haunt us it's this indecision that's that's the the deal it's this time of indecision what can we do what can we not do and and eventually i do see that we're going to have to make some hard decisions here um concerning bristol bay red king crab and and potentially snow crab as well we'll see that in 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 june at least to identify some options and alternatives but there's uh um you know I don't see a way without making some hard decisions that we we protect salmon, which is incredibly important to, to this council, that we protect the, the herring, that we protect the optimum yield in the pollock fishery, that we do these kinds of things um, and do what, everything we can to save the king crab fishery. I don't know that we can get there without making some hard decisions and trade-offs. And I think Ms. Baker's motion will put that in front of us uh, a bit more than it is today. I appreciate that this is gonna, gonna hopefully, I, I would second, I think it's very important that this goes to the SSC and to the extent possible to the, the crab plan team because there's, we, we have, uh, um, we have experts that I think are gonna really help to us to inform what, uh, what the next step might be as far as doing what Mr. Twight outline which is that maybe we're not ready for the proper alternatives but eventually i think that we'll we'll have to get there so thank you very much for for your time i know that was a lengthy comment and and but i appreciate the council's time on there i wanted to put a few of those things on the record thank you thank you mr down further comments Ms. kimball Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wasn't going to want to follow Mr. Downs, but I appreciate his comments very much. Um, I just wanted to speak to the motion a bit. I, I do appreciate, in particular, some parts of this motion. I think it's helpful to understand that we are required by law to analyze the impacts of any proposed action that has to go through rulemaking, has review by the SSC, which means we really have no ability to implement closures of any areas today. And, and I appreciate Ms. Baker speaking very clearly to that. And that's why I think the consideration of measures that each sector could implement is so important. Um, it's the most immediate possible response. I also would like to call out the description of research or an EFP to either get gear off the bottom or to estimate unobserved mortality, particularly in the pelagic trawl sector where we're lacking information so that we're not having the same discussion that we had over the past two days in terms of either inappropriately translating bottom contact for impact on crab as our staff paper warned, or just not believing the data that we have you know, through NIMS on PSC numbers. Because of that data gap, I'm a little bit skeptical that we'll get an analysis back that doesn't just perpetuate that same discussion, which seems fairly unproductive. Um, but, but what this does do, and I, I, I noted uh, Mr. Witherell very specifically talking about what level of analysis to be had, because this doesn't look like a discussion paper of five to 10 pages. This looks like an analysis, an analysis of the one thing that most people wanted to bring forward in terms of closing the Red King Crab Savings Area. And 
I think that's a big task. I think it's will look more like an analysis that you could drop into an action in the future, even though it doesn't have a section on net benefits to the nation or all of the community impacts, it, it will be substantial. Um, so it does look at the impacts of closing that important area to all sectors. I think that's important. I, I think that's a great part of the motion and evaluate the trade-offs similar to what Mr. Down mentioned of doing that, including impacts on other PSC species that this council cares about. I think some of my comments on the record have not, have focused on moving forward from these fixed area closures. That's where I would like us to get to, but I, I did recognize that the majority of the testimony was still around this fixed area closure that has proven in the past to be an important area for crab that we're getting some recent information or more recent information on tagging that is helping us to understand the importance of that today. But I think overall, I'm just very encouraged and I, we haven't spoken to this much about the efforts being put forward for this winter survey. I think combined with those tagging studies, that's the way we get at this very critical question, which is where's the center of distribution for female crab in particular? Where are they mating and molting? in these areas at the same time that the groundfish fisheries are operating. We are not getting that through our current summer surveys. That's not possible. And this winter survey effort seems very critical. Um, I, I appreciate all the comments from council members and the work that, that Ms. Baker put into this motion and I'll be supporting it. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, again around the table to the council members for comments. I, I did want to take this opportunity. It looks like we were getting close to the end of comments in, in consistent with my interest in this underlying this whole motion to take a holistic look at crab mortal mortality and what we might do uh, as a council to affect that, but I also wanted to note, uh, again, following up as the representative of the state of Alaska, of Alaska that uh, clearly we, we continue to be very concerned about the status of the Bristol Bay Red King crab stock. And I just wanted to highlight for the council, uh, since the council does jointly manage the directed crab fisheries with the state, that our ADF&G management and research staff have identified uh, continued work uh, on recruitment limitations for Bristol Bay Red King Crab are planned. And again, the state intends to uh, potentially consider improvements to the regulatory harvest strategy and other management measures that are delegated to the state through the Crab FMP, such as the management boundaries and observer coverage rates, uh, certainly uh, through the crab plan team and our other joint management mechanisms that we have established. Uh, the state of Alaska will will keep the council process informed on uh, those considerations. And I also, along the lines of Ms. Kimball's comments, I just wanted to note that the state of Alaska is also currently engaged in the satellite tagging project that we've heard so much about this week and described in the discussion paper, along with our partners at NOAA Fisheries and the Bering Sea Fisheries Research Foundation. Uh, we've, we've heard about the objectives of that work and uh, our, our um, enthusiastic partners in that. And, and although, again, it wasn't included in the motion, uh, just to provide context in terms of all of the work and energy that is, is going into this challenging management issue, uh, the state of Alaska certainly uh, would like to reiterate support for the winter Bristol Bay Red King Crab sir, uh, distribution study. Uh, from the crab sector, Amendment 80 sector, and the Bering Sea Fisheries Research Foundation. As Ms. Kimball said, the information the study can provide is really critically important to understanding the life cycle and distribution of Bristol Bay Red King crab, and just really appreciate the collaboration uh, among the partners on that work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Any further comments? Okay, great. That was a, a Excellent discussion and deliberation. I appreciate all the, the, the comments and, and all the, the public input we, we had today and yesterday. Very good process. So with that, I think uh, we are ready to vote. Is there any opposition to the motion? 
no opposition, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Ms. Baker. Anything further? Okay. Well, again, uh, many thanks to uh, the, the council, staff, the public uh, for navigating this, this very important issue. Let's go ahead and um, stand down for five minutes and uh, come back and we'll resume with our agenda. Council, please come back to order. All right, we are ready to move into agenda item D2 and here to introduce that for us is Diana Evans. Good morning, members of the council, Diana Evans, council staff. And yes, we are moving into agenda item D2, which is for looking at a series of reports related to the Bering Sea Fishery Ecosystem Plan. And so there are four reports that we will be providing under this agenda item, reports from the Bering Sea FEP team, and then the two task forces that are working on specific action modules relating to the FEP, uh, the local knowledge, traditional knowledge and subsistence information task force and the climate change task force. Concluding our series of reports will be a report from the ecosystem committee, which also reviewed those reports and has some comments for you on those, as well as uh, we will give you the balance of the ecosystem report, which also includes uh, a couple of other agenda items that the ecosystem committee took up. So with that, I'll go straight into the Bering Sea FEP team report. And, and I'm presenting that uh, with, I am the co-chair of that team with Dr. Kiram Aiden, who is on the line. And I'll maybe just do a sound check to make sure that uh, Kiram is able to speak. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, excellent. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll just give a quick uh, overview here. The team spent the majority of their time uh, at this meeting, this is, was our annual meeting. And again, April is the time that we, we once a year, we try to come back to you with progress on, on the FEP uh, team and task force information. So we met in March. Uh, we had two main agenda items that we reviewed. One was work on the Bering Sea, uh, what in the minutes is called the Bering Sea Ecosystem Health Report. And um, we've talked to you about that before. I'm gonna skip over that because Dr. Aiden is going to walk you through a, a PowerPoint, just providing you our updates on that. But just to let you know other things that we talked about at the meeting, we did receive the reports and updates from the two action module teams um, that you'll also be getting reports on today. Um, our conclusions as a team was the, noting that we really appreciated the progress that's been made on both, by both of those task forces since the last time we heard from them a year ago um, when the, the, the uh, FEP team and the council both reviewed work plans for those task forces and they've since made uh, a lot of progress coming up with draft work products. So we're really excited to see that progress moving forward. I think uh, with that, we spent the majority of our time working on the development of this uh, strategic uh, ecosystem report that we talked to you about in outline last year, and I'm going to pass over to Dr. Aiden to walk that through. Thanks, Diana, and uh, members of the council. Um, so I, I, I'm going to provide a brief update on our progress of developing the uh, strategic of ecosystem evaluation, which was the main ongoing work of the of the Bering Sea uh, Fisheries uh, Ecosystem Plan team in terms of uh, product development. And I'll, I'll start here um, by um, saying that I've in quotes here included the term health um, for this report. Now, last year, after a significant discussion with the SSC, uh, they asked us to, um, for some quite legitimate concerns, drop the term health from this report. Um, we've included it on this presentation uh, and after uh, presenting this to the SSC this week, they reiterated that concern uh, quite clearly. Um, I, I've included it here because over the last year, as uh, this progress has been going on, 
Um, a lot of people in the council community have used the term health report where strategic ecosystem evaluation uh, isn't quite uh, clear uh, um, at the moment, uh, but this is really attempting to translate away from that uh, uh, title and concept. So this is uh, probably the last time that it will be referred to as that by us. Uh, but I just wanted to make it clear at this one presentation, uh, for those of you who have heard of this as the health report last year, uh, that that's what we're talking about here. Right. So um, to now this is this uh, has come to the council a, a couple of times as it's as we've uh, talked through and scoped the development of this um, in recognition of the fact that there's uh, been a range of products. Uh, developed over the last couple of years that involve ecosystem indicators, including our ecosystem status reports, our ecosystem and socioeconomic profiles, and now this new strategic ecosystem evaluation. Um, this I believe uh, we, we showed last June, uh, but as a reminder, the real difference in these different products is that the ESRs and the ESPs are really designed to inform harvest specs in a given year. Uh, they're very tactically oriented, uh, part, of, uh, part of that management cycle um, to be presented in, in concert with those discussions and uh, is really focused on uh, the, the most recent years. Whereas the strategic ecosystem evaluation is just that strategic, it may not be evaluated every year, uh, it synthesizes across a large range, and it doesn't uh, necessarily inform a direct uh, tactical uh, stock assessment or risk table, but uh, instead is, is meant to have a, a broader strategic look at uh, the Bering Sea uh, EBFM activities. Now, the, the purpose of uh, developing a, a separate product, again, with, with this range of, of products that are presented, is that um, just to give a little history um, and review, um, back maybe uh, 20 years ago, uh, during the, the process of developing the ground fish uh, SEIS uh, through the NEPA process, um, a, a wide range of indicators were, were proposed that really look at cumulative and multi-species effects on the ecosystem. And at the time, as the, as the result of that process, uh, these, were, uh, report, these were developed and reported, uh, a lot of them in the ESR for a number of years. Um, However, the, we, the, the audience of this uh, such, such report really stepped outside of the ESRs as the ESRs were more and more honed for tactical management decisions. So in a way, this is uh, um, looking back and completing that picture, uh, taking a step back from where the ESRs have, have evolved, they're very, very practical uh, use and um, given us an opportunity to look at, again, the more strategic uh, viewpoints. Um, and one, just this, this is just to give an example of how uh, an ESR or a C indicator might differ. Um, so, for example, an indicator might be the total ground fish biomass in the in the Bering Sea. Um, if if that was the title of the e, of the indicator, um, it could certainly be reported on in both places. Uh, but the differences might be that the ESR indicators uses uh, bottom trawl survey data. Um, and focuses on, a, on whether the current year has an uptick, which might indicate a shift of distribution, a shift of uh, uh, catchability of the survey, um, as well as possibly indicating long-term abundance. Uh, but it really is meant uh, in this presentation to inform the stock assessments or risk tables in the current year. Whereas uh, the same sort of concept as a C indicator might be a long-term running average um, or other thing that doesn't really focus on the most recent year, ask the questions of whether things have changed over the last 40 years uh, on, as a broad background. Um, and it can also use other sources of data such as stock assessments um, that are not necessarily available uh, when the ESRs are being uh, uh, written each year. So it, it gives a, a, a sort of a broader range uh, of timeframes to look at and spatial scales uh, than the immediate assessment. Uh, another example is an oceanography indicator um, if you ask the question about, say, what's the status of heat waves, um, an ESR might ask uh, whether we're in a heat wave now or in the recent past, whereas uh, the C would ask 
Are we seeing more heat waves over the last few years than over the, uh, over the past years? Or moving forward, are we uh, expecting to see a greater risk of heat waves? And, and how does that impact our uh, strategic considerations? So that's just to, and an attempt to sort of distinguish these products and how they've been developed. Now this also is review. Uh, this was presented um, in, in uh, last June, I believe. Um, as I've said, the, the, the focus of the FEP is strategic. So the, the starting point for the, the C is uh, strategic considerations. But in terms of organizing this, um, as, as, as discussed um, previously, um, we, we're using the six ecosystem goals that the uh, council has uh, established. And, uh, the, and within those six, six ecosystem goals, we're really attempting to look at the set of ecosystem objectives. There are 17 ecosystem objectives. I'm not gonna uh, go through them all, uh, but th these were uh, approved uh, through the adoption of the FEP. These are part, the, those 17 objectives were part of the core work and adopted uh, when the FEP was adopted overall. Uh, when we had a workshop last May, uh, the recommendation that we brought forth was to organize reports by the six goals and objectives under these goals. And um, sub teams at the workshop uh, got, got uh, working on these data sources and resources. So what I'm going to do now is uh, just briefly walk through the progress on, uh, uh, on this. This is a work in progress. So, so what you're seeing is essentially, uh, as I said, essentially a, a progress update. Um, one of the things that we recognized uh, in, in working on this data over the, the past uh, year since last May is that the different ecosystem goals and the objectives under those goals um, represent a different, uh, essentially, uh, both amount of work in assembling the data, uh, but also might take different approaches to looking at the data. So um, just at our recent workshop or, or recent meeting this March, uh, we sort of uh, reiterated or came to the conclusion that, that, that it might make sense to phase each section of the report so that we produce a draft or section on some goals uh, for review uh, or consideration and uh, then move through other goals at, at a different pace. So the idea, of course, is that this is a living document. Uh, so there's no, um, whereas we, we, we feel like that we want to progress smoothly through this, um, as a living document, um, there's, we don't necessarily need to line these all up. They can develop over time. But within that, uh, the first two goals, uh, again, these are the council's ecosystem goals. Uh, the, the first two are to maintain, rebuild, and restore fish stocks and to protect, restore, and maintain ecological processes, uh, trophic level diversity, the productive ca capacity of the ecosystem. Um, in developing these, we realized that these two goals are really ones that either through just the fisheries management system or uh, the development of ESRs over the last 20 or 25 years, that we really have developed a, a large range of data and data sources that can be directly used uh, uh, in this process. And to that end, um, it was perhaps, uh, it was both more possible to gather data with the resources we had. And it was also uh, the scientific work of interpreting these data has had a stronger uh, groundwork. Um, so we have decided to essentially use these two goals and developing the section of the report covering these two goals as our, as our first step, our proof of concept. So uh, much of the raw data has already been gathered and reported. Um, the desired indicators are already in the sort of time series formats conducive to the ESRs. Um, they might have different formats, uh, as I've just mentioned in the ESRs versus the C, um, but many of the indicators are already gathered and data assembled by the team. Uh, that's work that's over the last year. And uh, while we, we have certainly haven't completed that, uh, we, we certainly have uh, made a, enough of a progress that we can uh, uh, continue to uh, uh, make uh, work on these products as a, a synthesized whole. Um, starting just a few weeks ago, we've we've started the process of uh, the whole team discussed how to categorize these data sources, and in particular to look at time and space scales. 
for example, uh, most of our data, if we look historically, is really focused on the uh, eastern, uh, eastern Bering Sea uh, survey uh, footprint area of the, of the bottom trawl survey. So um, a lot of, when I say we have a lot of data sources, this might not include the northern Bering Sea or other, other subregions um, that are, are critical. So right now we're categorizing those as to what they cover. The idea is to produce a data shortlist um, in the next couple of months, uh, and then to uh, produce a draft report by September 2022. Um, right now, this May date is is sort of a check-in date for us. Uh, we have not we have not determined whether this will be a um, a workshop versus uh, just uh, progressing the work uh, versus um, uh, virtually. Um, but it's sort of a waypoint to have uh, a list of data together that we can start to assemble as a draft report. Now, ecosystem goals three and four, um, whereas we, uh, um, a lot of data over time has been gathered, uh, certainly in, habitat, in the work in habitats, uh, goal three also includes protected resources um, in, in its objectives. And, and goal four, uh, uh, providing for subsistence, commercial, and recreational, and non-consumptive uses. Uh, these are places where data does certainly exists, um, but may may re but has been a, a bit more outside uh, sort of the uh, data that's usually pre uh, presented through trawl surveys and the stock assessment process. So it maybe um, needs a little more uh, work and thought to bring it in. Uh, certainly for goal four, there's a lot of information, for example, in the uh, economic safe that's produced every year. Or, um, so in that document, and certainly there's a lot of spatial data and habitat work, for example, uh, from EFH. Um, but I think we're just earlier on in the process of reaching out to data providers, um, looking at spatial considerations, which are certainly important outside of the time series format. Uh, so while the sub teams on the FEP team that are working on this are working actively on this um, in, in terms of identifying sources of data and bringing it back together, it's simply expected that uh, goals and goals one and two will provide the leading example for this report uh, while this uh, work goes on over time. So uh, we're still looking to uh, have made major strides on the data uh, uh, sort of um, bringing together by September. Uh, but it's slightly lagged but from goals one and two. Now goals um, five and six, um, avoid irreversible or long-term adverse effects on fisheries resources and providing a legacy of healthy ecosystems. Uh, first of all, uh, this work is going on with uh, active collaboration with our own climate change task force. Uh, members there are uh, uh, contributing and uh, an important part of the work on this. Uh, but it's really recognized that while they might establish some individual, some separate indicators to track in here, um, a lot of what's in goal five or six involves what our interpretation is of trends in the previous three goal, four goals. So again, going back to an example of uh, total ground fish biomass, that would certainly belong in goal two or goal one, um, but questions about what uh, uh, where we're going, what the long-term effects of that indicator would be, might fit under ecosystem goal five or six. So in a sense, this sub-team is, is working to develop its, its own indicators as appropriate, but really in thinking of um, what it means to be uh, identifying healthy ecosystems under shifting baselines, where it might not be a single healthy ecosystem, uh, or sorry, a single definition of healthy that we are aiming to return to and how that evolves over time is I think really gonna be critically examined uh, by this work, both by the task force and by us. So this is uh, my final slide, uh, just to, to reiterate the goals one and two working plan, just to uh, keep your praise of the progress and, 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 and when you might expect to see the next steps. Um, by May 2022, we expect to have listed, within goals one and two, have listed the potential indicators, um, gotten current to recent data checks and data availability, <coughs> excuse me, 
and uh, summarized individual indicators and their reason for inclusion. Uh, steps after this May 2022 uh, check-in would be a, review, a broader review of the shortlist, including things that are missing, um, bringing in, uh, and, and I'll say right here, when we say bringing in council body or stakeholder review, uh, we really hope that that will be an active process, but we have not defined the exact uh, uh, steps in this at this point. Uh, that's something uh, for discussion um, coming, uh, coming into May. Um, after that, we'll be uh, engaging in the graphical and statistical synthesis of these indicators um, to make some, uh, fi by final, I mean ready to move forward for broader discussion uh, in the broader council community um, in September 2022 uh, with a draft of uh, where the goals one and two section is also going at that time so it can uh, be um, reviewed by the broader community. And um, with that, I'd say thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Aiden. Any questions? Ms. Kimball? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation. I um, One of the SSC recommendations to the team was, was um, hoping that you would provide indicators. I don't have that right in front of me, but are, that would remain informative to our overarching FEP goals in the future, giving the shifting baselines in the Bering Sea. I found that language as I was talking. And so I was wondering what the FEP team's response to that um, SSC recommendation might be or whether you think that's doable. And then I have a follow-up question after I hear that response. Um, through the chair, uh, thank you. Yes, we did um, discuss that, uh, uh, be, we did discuss things along that lines before those SSC comments and we fully um, agree with with those. We we think that it's important that this that the, that um, that we think the indicators we have selected will continue to be in, informative. Um, this is outside of the. This is slightly outside of the team's pre preview directly, but one of the processes in the in AFSC's A climb program. Um, the scientific program that's looking at the uh, extension of, or sorry, the, that's looking at the projections of climate change uh, out to the end of the century is to, is to create a simulation test bed uh, using those data uh, it, to, to look at exactly that, to, to uh, it, using our best available data on the climate projections that come out of ACLIME uh, to also project these indicators and ask the question, um, ask the question, which of these under that simulation study will be uh, or won't be um, informative. Um, I think there's might be some slight questions. Uh, again, we're just starting to engage on that, that scientific side. So there, there might be slight questions on timeline in terms of um, when we come time to recommend these indicators, um, whether we're still waiting for those simulation results or not, uh, that work is uh, progressing hopefully on a, on a decent timeline over the next year. So we, we do intend that to be a process. Um, not sure, again, on the exact timing of it all coming together. Thank you for that response. And, and this one's a little um, more vague. And my question, when I, when I heard that discussion at the SSC, they also seem to have some discussion about um, having some acknowledgement, I guess, of our FEP goals. So those goals set out by the council several years ago now. And, and it almost seemed to me that the discussion was around whether those are still the most appropriate goals. And I think that my understanding was it was around, you know, words like rebuilding or restoring either fish stocks or the ecological processes um, back to some state of the system that we had in the past with this full acknowledgement that we we are likely not to go back to that state, that state likely doesn't exist anymore. And so are, are we at some crossroads with, with really working on these indicators as a result of the council's FEP goals or do, does this group still think those goals are the most appropriate um, given what we know today? Through the chair, 
Um, well, I would certainly, so, so one thing of obviously those goals were decided by the council. So obviously from the FEP team's perspective, we defer to the, the council on that. Uh, the one comment I will make is that specific language on protect and restore, I believe was very specifically, again, this is back a few years ago to the adoption, specifically trying to mirror the Magnuson-Stevens Act language around those around those topics. So I think there, there was some reflection on that. Outside of the language, I, I do feel, I, I think that, and, and again, we've discussed this a bit as a team, that some of that language certainly, when you look at some of those sub-objectives about, about ecological processes, I think it's possible to, for example, say that restoring ecological processes does not necessarily mean going back to the exact ecological processes that were in existence 40 years ago. It's more about saying, going forward, we're gonna have, an, we might have a new, a new ecosystem essentially. And can we def de define what's restorative for that? Um, but I will say, I, I, I do agree with those challenges. I'm, I'm not sure where the best place is to what level the best place is to address those. And, and the, the, the idea, I think the FEP team does share the SSC's um, principle that, that we're not, that, that to really well express that we're not trying to get back to some ideal uh, healthy state. Thank you, I appreciate that response. And so is that something that would be kind of at the forefront of whatever final product? And Diana Evans is nodding her head, so you, <laughs> you don't need to answer that, but thank you very much. Thanks, Ms. Kimball. Any further questions for Dr. Aiden? All right, thank you. I think that moves us to our LKTKS presentation. See Dr. Hakala coming up. Okay, good morning, members of the council. This is Kate Hoppala with council staff. I'm a co-chair for the Local Knowledge, Traditional Knowledge and Subsistence Task Force, along with Dr. Sarah Wise at the Alaska Fishery Science Center. And uh, I believe Dr. Wise is online with us. So I'll just take a, a quick pause here to see if uh, she can, she's able to connect and can come through on the audio. Yes, good morning. I'm connected and can hear. Can you all hear me? Yep, we got you. Thank you. Great. So there's no specific action uh, for the council to take today with respect to our update from this task force. Uh, but we do appreciate, of course, any feedback on the progression of our work to date or on the direction of the uh, work to come. Today's update will provide an overview of the task force's work over the last year since the council last received an update in February 2021. And a large component of this update will be the protocol that the task force is developing for identifying, analyzing, and including local knowledge, traditional knowledge, and subsistence information into the council's decision making process. And uh, the task force just had a first opportunity in January 2022. So earlier this year to review a first draft of this protocol, uh, which is the primary element of our work. And then the presentation will conclude with some next steps and future directions. Displayed here is the task force's membership. And I would just note that we are a very diverse body. There are representatives of Alaska Native organizations, tribal members, subsistence harvesters, commercial fishers, social scientists, and agency representatives. The task force was formed in 2019 and convened for its first meeting in January 2020. And at the February 2020 council meeting, the council adopted these two goals for the task force, which are ultimately to create processes and protocols through which the council can identify, analyze, and consistently incorporate local knowledge 
traditional knowledge, the social science of local knowledge and traditional knowledge and subsistence information into the council's decision-making process. So in terms of where we're at and the progress we've made to date, this slide depicts the timeline of the task force's work. And we've had several meetings over the last two years and made progress on completing the work plan, the glossary of terms, and like I mentioned before, reviewing that first draft of the protocol. While the task force does anticipate that the protocol will change both uh, in its content and in its structure as our work proceeds, um, the document that is posted to the e-agenda reflects the consensus that this group was able to make to date. And it's been an important step to getting all of the ideas together and in one place on paper. And the next couple of slides throughout the presentation are going to transition us to thinking about the big picture content that's included within the protocol. Um, and so the way that we have been approaching this work is from the understanding that local knowledge and traditional knowledge and subsistence information can support the use of best scientific information available in the council's process. And that through the task force's work, the council will have an opportunity to gain a stronger understanding of and new processes and protocols for using multiple knowledge systems in fishery management actions and processes. Just some additional information on the key terms in the protocol and how the task force has understood them. Local knowledge includes the experiences and observations of people who live and work within a specific region. And this knowledge evolves over time and is based on personal shared or inherited experiences. As shared by some of the elders in the task force, traditional knowledge is that which is handed down across generations has undergone its own form of testing and is the culmination of finding the best practical skills to support Alaska Native's ways of living. And it's often not compiled in print. Subsistence is the harvest of foods and other resources for nutritional, cultural, spiritual, and food security reasons. And it's extremely important. Traditional knowledge often informs subsistence practices and is essential to community, family, and individual security and well-being. So as we go forward, uh, we pulled some key concepts together. This is a word cloud of these key concepts that are embedded within and described throughout the executive summary of the protocol in its draft form as it is now. It was created with the word art application based on the protocol's content and it depicts the most frequently used words and attributes attributes weight to each term according to how often those words are used. So not surprisingly, as you look at the word cl cloud, the word knowledge appears most prominently throughout the protocol, but it's also very important to note that trust is the second most recurring word. And we're gonna talk about that a bit more, um, but both of those terms a bit more throughout uh, the presentation in more depth. Next slide. So, um, National Standard 2 of the Magnuson-Stevens Act requires that the best available scientific information be used to support the council's decision making. And it's been well documented within scientific literature that best available scientific information can include the long-term experiences of people who hold knowledge about the terrestrial and marine environments where they live and work. Local knowledge and traditional knowledge holders may be some of the earliest observers of environmental changes because of their experience working, living, and harvesting in specific areas. And as you can see from this slide, there's been considerable work on the subject of including local knowledge and traditional knowledge within understanding ecosystem processes and decision making. So we've put a select few references up here on the slide just to give you a sampling of some of the methods and approaches to including um, local knowledge and traditional knowledge into decision-making processes. And we divided them within key fields, um, including climate adaptation, fisheries, sustainable management, and environmental observations. Many of these papers that we selected uh, have a focus on Alaska, but it's also important to note that the region um, that there's been a lot of work, strong work done um, that's being done across the US as well as internationally. Next slide. 
So as you might have seen from our task force membership, we have diverse experience on this body. And this was by design through the council's nomination process. And it provides a strong platform for diver diverse ideas, experiences, and expertise to be shared. Each meeting, task force members draw from their own array of professional, academic, and embodied knowledge to reflect on and inform these guidelines and protocols. And trust is at the heart of the task force work. Because we're all coming at this um, and at our tasking from very different cultural backgrounds and professional trainings while talking about issues that are meaningful to people. And building trust, trust has required us to create a shared understanding, particularly with the language you, we use, which is why the task force tackled the glossary of terms very early in our process. And that was to enable um, us to have a common ground and a common language and understanding of terms to understand one another. Next slide. So we're gonna transition to talking more about the protocol document itself. And this is really a guidance document that's intended to inform the council's decision-making process in a holistic way. And the protocol reflects consensus from our membership. And it's also in line with the research engagement and engagement principles that are outlined in the Alaska Federation of Natives guidelines for research, which are to be conveyed to scientists who plan to conduct studies with Alaska natives, as well as those that have been developed by the National Science Foundation's Office of Polar Programs and its principles for the conduct of research in the Arctic, which aligns with US Arctic policy and applies to research across multiple disciplines. There's several important points to keep in mind uh, when reading the protocol. So first is that uh, the task force would caution no one component be separated from the whole. The suite of guidance uh, within it is all centered on relationships as well. And cultural sensitivity has been at the center of our work. The protocol is intentionally broad in its scope because the council's direction was to inform its decision-making process and not one specific component of it. Additionally, the protocol is focused on the Bering Sea and the task force would caution against transferring its information to other regions or decision-making processes in a holistic way. And finally, the protocol does not direct particular outcomes or actions for the council. It's instead very much intended to be a document that can inform the decision-making process. The protocol's content is organized around several high-level guidelines that identify best practices for working with local knowledge, traditional knowledge, and subsistence information, which are then operationalized based on the diverse experience and expertise of our membership. And displayed here are the seven high-level guidelines in the protocol. And these took over a year for our task force to reach consensus on and narrow down uh, what we thought would be the best approach and they reflect the best practices and protocols that tribes and communities have for working with researchers, social science expertise, and are what the task force thinks is the best approach to providing the necessary guidance for identifying, analyzing, and including local knowledge, traditional knowledge, and subsistence information into the council's decision-making process. The protocol has been written in a fairly hierarchical way, meaning that the content goes from being broader in its scope to describing the guidelines and then providing some specific practical ideas or steps for how to carry out those guidelines. And the reason that the task force approached writing the document in this way is that we had heard from the council and its advisory bodies that they wanted a, a document that would be a useful resource. And so this is the approach that we've taken thus far. And then we wanted to spend a little bit more time walking through one specific guideline within the protocol, and that's guideline three, recognizing how to identify sources of local knowledge, traditional knowledge, the, excuse me, the social science of local knowledge and traditional knowledge and subsistence information to show how the task force has approached providing guidance in just one particular section of the document. And we're gonna do this in three ways throughout the presentation to show the layered approach. So, the first thing that we'll discuss is the search engine, which is a way for identifying material references and then discuss identifying local knowledge and traditional knowledge experts at the community level 
And then we'll talk a little bit more about the community context. The task force has really tried to leverage our expertise to make strides in providing guidance for identifying sources of local knowledge, traditional knowledge and subsistence information. And the council last received an update on this effort at the February 2021 meeting. And the task force has made significant progress over the last year to creating a search engine tool that provides a resource to more easily identify sources of published or publicly available information that are related to local knowledge, traditional knowledge, and the social science of local knowledge and traditional knowledge with specific relevance to fisheries management in the North Pacific. And the search engine also contains references for accessing forms of metadata, archives or archival materials, um, oral transcripts, subsistence maps, and other kinds of important information. And for these sources of information, the task force has provided a description where appropriate of the source and guidance for how to appropriately access or use them. And just quickly noting that the web address that's here at the top of the slide is where you could find the search engine uh, on the council's website. And the image that's displayed here is the front end user page. And I would just note that there's currently 343 references within the search engine that you can use a text search as well as a variety of key keywords and terms in order to return pieces of information that might be useful. And I'll talk a little bit more about the approach that we had used um, to putting this tool together. So the search engine was produced using a multi-step approach where sources were first identified based off of our members expertise. So be they resources within communities or with tribes and then foundational pieces of literature within various academic disciplines. And then from there, we were able to retrieve material sources um, using search terms that are relevant both to the council's jurisdiction and its process, as well as the task force's specific goals. And then in order to be included within the search engine, um, we've really tried to focus those sources that are substantively um, oriented towards the specific parameters of the council's jurisdiction, um, or be focused in one or more areas of local knowledge, traditional knowledge, and subsistence information. Um, and I think the, the keywords and the search terms that are there within the drop downs really reflect that process. And I would just note that it's the task force's intent that the search engine would be a living tool and it's designed to evolve over time. And this is just a reflection of the fact that local knowledge and traditional knowledge are living systems of knowledge and they evolve and change just like Western science. Um, and so there's an email address that's here at the bottom of the slide and it's also on the search engine webpage. And this is the email address that folks who are interested in making new submissions over time um, can do that in a way that's mindful of staff resources as well as just overall data security. And so now conceptually, we're gonna jump a level to thinking about identifying local knowledge and traditional knowledge holders beyond material references. Um, and so when we think about identifying local knowledge, one way of approaching this might be to seek out local knowledge holders with direct experience related to a particular phenomena of interest. And their knowledge is likely going to be developed from long-term observations. And one way that staff do this currently is by um, speaking with key contacts in a particular fishing association or industry, and then asking for help in identifying people, whether formally or informally to talk to and allowing those really well-connected experts to identify the appropriate people who hold specific knowledge. And then from a community perspective, uh, local knowledge holders may be identified as people who have experience with harvesting and food preservation, have learned from books and articles and have observed or participated in some gathering. And then this quote comes from an article on traditional knowledge of the bowhead whale around St. Lawrence Island, Alaska. And uh, indigenous ways of identifying knowledge may often be different from Western understandings of knowledge. A Western perspective of knowledge may see it as a collection of facts or pieces of information that can be learned with formal instruction, reading and experiences. And indigenous conceptualizations of knowledge um, may be better understood as personal experiences and then related beliefs where people can know things to be true based off of their personal experience. And this understanding of traditional knowledge aligns with some of the early thoughts that were shared by an Alaska native elder on the task force 
that traditional knowledge holders are often elders who have gone out and gathered and have had lifelong mentors and can share their knowledge and teach others. When engaging with communities, and this is whether conducting research, outreach, or other forms of engagement, it's important to understand that the key entities and actors who work in that context. So understanding how communities are governed and who has the authority within the community within various contexts is essential in terms of identifying uh, traditional, local and traditional knowledge. By first mapping out who is in the area and the linkages among them, we can start to understand some of the connectivity as well as the complexity of an area. Next slide. This image is one way to envision this complexity. It's, uh, it's an image that was produced in a project outside of the task force uh, work, but it's substantively related to the task force work and the idea of producing a lay of the land or um, a map of the various entities within a particular region. This is, um, this is only for the Norton Sound region, so it's only a small portion of the area that we would be uh, looking at for the task force. And at first glance, it may be a bit chaotic, but it does help us to better understand the myriad of cross-scalar connections that are with that work within and across communities in this area. For example, some communities, which despite their remote geography, have strong multi-scalar ties. And in some cases, these range across state, national and international arenas through global politics, research, tribal and other associations. So while today in this presentation, we're focusing on identifying local knowledge, traditional knowledge and subsistence expertise under guideline three, we also wanna point out and reiterate the interwoven nature of the protocol. For example, guideline four provides information on engaging in early and frequent communication with all relevant entities. This graphic depicting the lay of the land in Norton Sound is only one region, but it helps us to understand the complexity of guideline four and of that process. It illustrates specific relevant entities and the ways in which they link across scale. Likewise, guideline six directs the protocol users to be aware of and adhere to the protocols that communities, associations, or other organizations have established for sharing information, for conducting research, and for communicating local knowledge and traditional knowledge. Again, this image helps us to piece together which entities are active in a particular area and may have relevant protocols in place that can assist and guide a research or engagement process. Next slide. So the task force continues to see the whole of our work as an opportunity to build new relationships and strengthen existing ones. And as demonstrated by the longer conversation and discussion on guideline three, the task force is trying to take a layered approach um, that will be able to provide some practical guidance for the council's decision-making process in terms of being able to inform it based off of the task force's two goals. And finally, um, the task force's work is supporting the council and its process in being more responsive to a variety of policy and legal mandates, including of course, national standards two and eight um, in supporting the use of best scientific information available and understanding um, potentially better impacts to fishing communities, as well as responding to executive orders and presidential memorandums that are linked with environmental justice and using indigenous and traditional knowledge in federal decision-making processes. And then just in terms of where we're headed, uh, the task force is scheduled and anticipating to have its next meeting in the fall of 2022. We don't have a date for that meeting set yet, but I think we would anticipate that to be after the council's October meeting. And at that October or November 2022 meeting, uh, the task force would review a second draft of this protocol and then further its conversation and discussion on potential on-ramps for local knowledge, traditional knowledge and subsistence information into the council's process. 
And I think the task force is intending um, to review another draft that would be a finalized version of this protocol early in 2023 when we would be looking to wrap up our work. So when the council had formed this body, the timeline that we were given was two to three years. And we're trying to keep that in mind as we've progressed um, throughout the last two years, which means we'd be looking uh, to bring forward a finalized draft of the protocol and a document that's articulating the on-ramps for uh, local knowledge and traditional knowledge and subsistence information um, around a year from now, as well as with that final report. So that concludes the staff presentation, but we're of course happy to take questions. All right, thank you, Dr. Hopla and Dr. Wise. Are there questions? Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you both for the presentation. I, um, I mean, it's very impressive the, the draft thus far, and I realize it's still a work in progress. Um, one of the, we also had in the meantime, between our last meeting, we had our, a training, um, cultural training um, with First Alaskans Institute. And part of that training was hitting on some of these same points that I see in the protocol and a cautioning, I guess, against assuming that public comment, for instance, that's provided by either a tribal member or Alaska Native organization is necessarily traditional knowledge. So I, I see that pulled out in the protocol. And I'm wondering if there's, as a as I see a section on where does public comment fit. And I wonder if the group is, is really gonna explore ways in which um, the council can most appropriately either ask or inquire about what it is we're receiving since there are such a higher standard of protocols around using or repeating that information. And it's half a question, it's half just an interest in ensuring that we get a document that's as user-friendly as, as possible in the situations in which we find ourselves. Um, and I think it's trending in that direction very much so. But um, if you do have a response to that, Dr. Heppel, I'd be, be interested in hearing it. Through the chair, thank you, Ms. Kimball, for that question. I think the task force does have an intention of revisiting that conversation, particularly we, when we come back in the fall for that broader conversation on on-ramps. And early in our process of work, I think public comment was identified as one way that the council might more frequently receive local knowledge in real time um, in its decision-making process than maybe perhaps traditional knowledge. But in those conversations, at least one of our members um, had offered some pretty strong caveats, which is what you see in that call out. And so that was something that we had put uh, a ping in basically just to circle back to and make sure we could have a longer conversation that would be more appropriate. And I think as that evolves, the council could expect to see that in the on-ramp documentation um, further along in the process, if, if that's, if that makes sense. Thank you. I think that's very helpful. And, um, my other question, and it somewhat was related to an SSC, a comment or recommendation is on the, in the practical guide that's provided in the draft on page 21 practical steps. There's a bullet about modifying the analytical templates used by council staff. And I, I asked this question of Dr. Muter too, but it probably is more appropriate for you about what's meant by that. I think my impression is it's not as if we would create a new template or check the box section in an analytical in an RIR document, but more that this is that internal document used by staff to ensure that we're capturing all the information relevant to the question at hand and, and identifying sources so that we can capture the things that you have in these bullets. And I, I just like, analytical template could have a couple different meanings and I, I don't even really need a response. I guess I'm just hoping that the group can think about fleshing that out a little bit more about what we mean since it's a direct, um, has direct implications for staff's work. Through the chair, thank you, Ms. Kimball. Yes, I think the way the task force has envisioned it is more towards the action planning process. And so, um, a natural place for where the council could expect local knowledge, traditional knowledge and subsistence information to inform its decision-making processes, of course, those analytical documents. Um, but there's been some conversation and some recognition that one way the task force might be able to be of use, especially while we've got the expertise pulled together in a body um, at this time would be to think through what are some of those key questions that an analyst might wanna consider when going through that action planning process. 
And um, at this point, we haven't reached consensus in terms of whether or not that's something we feel would be appropriate to bring forward uh, at the end of our work um, and in the on-ramp document, or if that's something that if the council were to want to move forward with, would it be a part of that implementation phase? So just thinking sort of procedurally of where that would fit in our work and where that would be most helpful, I think is where we're at. Mr. Mesereau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Hogla. Um, would you think that it would come in an analytical document in a separate section, or do you think that this would be just sort of uh, integrated into all the sections? And would we be able to know that we were looking at things in the document that were derived from that, or would it just be woven in in a way that we might not know where that particular conclusion was reached, but we could assume that it was from that specific uh, local or traditional knowledge. Through the chair, thank you, Mr. Mesro, for the question. I think personally, I can see it both ways. I think it's possible to imagine local or traditional knowledge in an EA or an SIA in particular. And I think depending on what the source is, uh, the analyst may or may not use a use more uh, in-depth or broader language within the analytical document describing the method or the approach. So if they visited a particular archive and there was information that was relevant to the council's alternatives and options, and they felt like that was useful in describing some of the impacts. Um, and I, so I guess I could see it, I can see it sort of seamlessly flowing through, and I can also see it as a more intensified call out, just depending on what the analysis is and what the information is. Any further questions? Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Dr. Hoppola, thank you. And Dr. Weiss, thank you. Going back to um, uh, your, the final part of your response to Ms. Kimball's question, um, and then thinking a little bit about as well the, the various ways that, that um, it can get used in, in response to Mr. Mesereau's question. I'm, I thought I heard you suggest that um, one option would be wait until sort of the completion before we really begin integrating it, wait until the completion of, of the task force work. And maybe I misheard, but the question in my mind is given sort of the complexity, the different ways and all that, why wouldn't we begin piloting implementation in, in the next few analyses, just to begin to get a sense of where it fits and where it doesn't. Are, are there risks to sort of misusing it initially that would make it difficult to, I mean, are there risks to experimentation, I guess is what I'm asking. Through the chair, thank you, Mr. Twight for the question. I think my response to Ms. Kimball was more tailored if not all entirely, just towards the analytical template and what that would look like for um, staff and where in the task forces process we would be able to provide that guidance. And I think in terms of whether or not it fits in the work over the next year or later, that the challenge for us as a task force is to complete all of this in a time frame and to reach consensus on all of these different pieces, because that's been the way that we have conducted our work and set ourselves up internally. And I think the more that we put into that space to complete within the next year, um, I would anticipate that that could slow the progression of our work. Um, so it's just a balancing act in terms of when, where things fall and when we would be able to achieve them and whether or not there is a risk to experimenting um, I think the protocol gives a lot of guidance as it is that could be of help for staff. Uh, and so in that sense, I think there's solid principles and, and ideas that are there that they could lean into. But I suppose there would be some risk to proceeding depending on what the work is without the completion of the task force's work, just in thinking of wanting to have work moving forward be consistent. Any further questions? All right. 
Thank you, Dr. Hopla and Dr. Weiss. All right, it's, uh, it's noon. Let's go ahead and um, break for lunch. Come back at um, 1.15 and continue on. Council, please come back to order. Good afternoon. We've got Dr. Stram here to pre present the Climate Change Task Force. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the council, Diana Stram, council staff. This will be a brief report on our progress from the Climate Change Task Force with the understanding that you'll hear more from us um, in the, at the October council meeting. Um, I just want to, on the screen, you see the members of our task force, and I want to acknowledge my co-chair, Kirsten Holmesman. Um, she's not able to be here today for this, but she was available during the SSC for the presentation. Um, we have the same task force that we've had with the singular exception of Jason Gasper has replaced uh, Joe Krager from the regional office. So just to remind you that the goal of the climate change modules facilitating the council's work towards climate ready fisheries management that helps ensure both short and long term resilience for the Bering Sea. We have three objectives, our main objectives. The objective one is to collate, so coordinating the review of existing and emergent climate information on impacts, adaptation, and residual risk. And I'll focus the majority of my update on where we are with objective one. Um, moving past that then, objective two is to synthesize that information about long-term climate change impacts and scenarios in order to help create pathways for the inclusion of that information in the fishery management process. And then finally, objective three is to communicate these potential management tools and actions for consideration by the council that could help increase the resilience and adaptation to climate change impacts. So our meetings to date, we had our spin up meeting in January of 2020, a follow up meeting that the next month in 2020 to uh, begin to develop our framework and the process and develop our work plan. Um, moving forward then, we had several other meetings culminating in our meeting in May of 2021. Um, where we presented our work plan, the revised work plan to the council at the June council meeting, and that work plan was approved by the council. So we are now in the process of executing that work plan. The work plan is available um, to the council and to the public on the, the um, Climate Change Task Force website, um, on the council website, and we're working on executing that work plan now. As part of that, then our fifth meeting, which was split over two different months in January and March, and mostly work sessions, um, in order to begin the, to execute those three objectives of our work plan. This is just a timeline of um, moving from the uh, startup of the, the climate change task force through the end of the beginning of 2023. Our task force is in, has been confirmed by the council to be in existence through 2025. So that is the timeframe that we're working on. So while this timeframe only goes through 2023, I'm just gonna be talking about the different milestones on what we're, which we're working from right now. And I'll return to this timeframe at the end of the timeline at the end of our presentation. In terms of the, the update of our meetings, um, again, two meetings split, one meeting split over two different sessions, um, three day meeting in January with breakout sessions. Um, most of that meeting, the first half of it was was more of a thought exercise using mirror boards uh, to identify um, different connections um, and uh, using some example case studies, um, specifically Pollock snow crab and yellowfin sole. But I would note that the, the purpose of those breakout, those case studies and breakout groups was really to get into the habit and the, to identify the connections, the potential resilience and the areas of concern. So not necessarily focusing specifically on those case studies moving forward, but using them as examples for how we would draw out this kind of information and those connections. We then split into three different sections of the, the task force um, and assigned subgroups to the three main sections of what we are now focusing on, which is our climate, um, resilience summary, climate readiness uh, synthesis report. And that's broken into three different sections, a management overview, a knowledge base overview, and a safe report review for climate change information. And I'll circle back to this at the end to go through where we're at on those. Um, so we spent a lot of the time at that meeting as well as the subsequent meeting, outlining what would go into each of those sections of this report and working on drafting that report. That was again, the focus of our follow-up meeting um, for two days in March working with our subgroups to, um, to continue to discuss our, how our 
breakout groups were working, what problems we were running into, the relative timeline for completion of that kind of work. The idea initially was that we would be presenting you with a draft climate readiness synthesis at this meeting um, for a variety of reasons, mostly the breadth of the work that we're still doing to, uh, to collate all of that information. We thought that it was best to provide a final report over the summer for your review then in October. So again, in terms of um, the relative overview of our most recent meeting in March, we did have a report from the Dr. Holzman, who is part of the um, IPCC work group. So she provided an overview of that report that's just been drafted. Uh, the SSC re had a presentation and a lengthy discussion on that at this meeting and provided you their input on it. I would just note that for the council's purposes, you will be receiving that at the October meeting in conjunction with our climate readiness synthesis. We continued with that sort of um, work group um, on our different sections on the day two, as well as had a brainstorming section on um, further recommendations. One of the things that we did take up outside of this work on the climate readiness synthesis, the council had requested in February that the Climate Change Task Force review the eco matrix that was brought forward by a consortium of uh, stakeholders to the council first at the December staff tasking and then again in February for staff tasking. So our comments on that are in our minutes on pages two and three that are posted to your agenda. Um, mostly we, we in general from the task force we appreciated the the thought that had gone into the novel creation of that concept of the eco matrix. Um, we did have a number of comments and concerns that we listed in the the minutes and I'll just briefly touch on here today that um, primarily are meant to go back to the proposers of that eco matrix to try to help them in flushing out some of these connections and the idea of that as a tool moving forward. Primarily, most of our comments had to do with some, some concerns about the connections and implied connections between the elements in the matrix. Um, we were concerned uh, about a, a perceived lack of transparency between the data and the connections that were lined out in that, that eco matrix, the data selection methodology, range of potential outcomes that were listed in it, as well as the application of this as a tool at the time it was proposed. And we understand that it's still a concept being developed, but the, the end result of the matrix was the only tool that it was being brought forward into was tax setting. And we also were concerned that that overlapped with some of the existing efforts that are already ongoing, notably the ESP. So the ESRs provide you the current um, ecological information on our current status, but your economic and socio ecological and socioeconomic profile updates that go along with individual stock assessments are also included to provide you information on tax settings. So we were concerned with the overlap of those two tools as well. The other aspect that we talked about before I go into the climate readiness synthesis in the next slides were our future directions and considerations. Um, we had a bit of a brainstorming session. We're currently focusing on our objective one, which is the collation of existing information, but we will be moving into ob objectives two and three as we move forward in 2022. So we were brainstorming some ideas and some thought processes moving forward. So our next meeting will be in August, and um, the purpose of that is to provide the climate readiness synthesis over the summer so that it's available for review. And then we will have a meeting in August, where, which I'll go through, in which we'll be ranking those individual sections in terms of climate readiness, as well as ranking the overall climate readiness synthesis um, as an overall snapshot of where we are right now. And then providing those rankings with the draft synthesis, we'd like to get some review by, by both the Groundfish and the Crab Plan team in September, and then provide their review as well as our th synthesis and our ranking for the council and committee's consideration in October. So along those lines, and I'm just gonna focus a couple slides here at the end on the climate readiness synthesis. And again, this is to achieve objective one of our work plan. So this is meant to be an assessment of our current climate change readiness and the near-term and identification of near-term actions that would increase that readiness. And this is all feeding into what one of our end products of this work, this task force is, which is our climate change report. Again, the climate readiness synthesis is broken into three different sections. Uh, section one is an overview of our management process. Section two is the safe report and plan team minutes review for um, climate related information currently. And then section three is an overview of knowledge and information base, um, highlighting where climate change information feeds into that and is available. So just to give a little bit of a snapshot of our progress to date by each section, we have been focusing in the management process. Um, we've already, the things that are listed in gray are ongoing, the things that are in red are, are yet to be done. And so in general, we've 
we've, we've provided a draft synthesis of our policy and management framework, um, including the assessment of our current climate change readiness information. And we've been doing this primarily through a table of tools. And this is just, you're not meant to really read this. It's just meant to show you in general, a snapshot of the management tools and the kind of things that we're lining out, which would be types of actions and then lining out in terms of special area management, quota programs, seasonal allocations and regulation, gear and vessel retention restrictions, tack adjustments and so on. And that's uh, to provide a snapshot of what the actions are right now. Moving forward then, we'll be taking those types of actions once we have them completely lined out in this table. And then we need to move forward um, for this, the remainder of this section to identify the potential climate change adaptation attributes, which would be strengths of our current system and the potential climate change maladaptive attributes, which would be the weaknesses of our current system. And then in, in characterizing those, we would then move forward to provide a section on opportunities for improvement. Similarly then in the safe report section, that subgroup has been going through all of the safe reports focusing on 2019 through 2021 and going through all the ESRs, safe reports focusing on Pollock, Sablefish, Pacific Cod, Forage Fish and Yellowfin Sole, um, safe reports for crab focusing primarily on red king crab and snow crab, and then all of the ground fish plan team minutes. And what they're trying to do in a database is, is indicate where in any of those reports any climate change information currently exists. The whole point of this exercise is to indicate where we are right now so that as we incrementally move forward, we are augmenting that information. And they've gotten to where they have developed a, a draft ranking table, which is represented on the last page of your minutes in the appendix. Um, we didn't have a chance to review this as a team, but the, all of the subgroups will be providing their own ranking tables as well. And then the final section then on the knowledge base and information, again, that subgroup has yet to draft a ranking table, same with the, the first subgroup on the management overview, but they have begun to assimilate um, LKTK information. Um, right now it's, it's, it's very um, extensive and needs to be trimmed down to sort the, purpose, sort the purposes of this, this actual report. Um, we are, they're working on augmenting some of the industry information that's available, as well as the agency information that's available, for instance, monitoring surveys and research. Um, they have yet to reach out and try to, to uh, synthesize what NGO and university information is. And then as with the, the management subgroup and the safe report subgroup, they need to then start to think about what are some near term actions that could be done that would increase and augment that information. So again, just circling back at the end here to our timeline, um, moving forward um, in 2022, then we'll be working on this climate readiness synthesis. We should have it available and posted to uh, the council's website and the public um, sometime this summer and prior, and then in August, early August, we'll be having, or sometime in August, we'll be having our CCTF meeting. The purpose of that CCTF meeting is twofold. One is to review the the final climate readiness report, and then to go about the ranking by sections. Um, so on a scale of one to five, climate ready, not climate ready, and then rank the overall synthesis. And then I would note, and you heard this from the SSC as well, that report then, we intend that to be a synthesis of climate readiness in 2021. So going through all the data through 2021, where are we at in 2021? And then we would have it as a benchmark um, for uh, updating at a future, future date as things begin to um, improve or uh, be augmented as information is available. The second part of our meeting then will focus on how do we move forward now from 2022 through the end of the task force in 2025 to address objectives two and three, which again is the synthesis and the communication of, of results and, um, and suggested management actions to the council. Mr. Chairman, that goes through uh, the update of the report of our last meeting, and you'll be hearing a lot more in depth from us in October. Thank you, Dr. Stram. Are there any questions? Ms. Kimball? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stram, for your report and for the work of the task force. Um, I tried to sit in on some of the task force work, not the whole thing, but I, I noted something myself, and then the SSC was putting in their minutes, encouraging the task force to explore ways to increase public engagement in their process. And I guess maybe just from your standpoint, like how are you feeling that that's going? Are you getting the public engaged in the process or is this even not the most critical time to get the public engaged? How, how seriously do we need to take that recommendation at this point? Thank you through the chair, Ms. Kimball. 
I think that we can do a better job of advertising our meetings and engaging the public. I think part of the reason we've had less public engagement in our meetings, we have had some public engagement, but they've been work sessions and those are much harder to participate in as a member of the public. We've been doing brainstorming sessions. We've been doing breakout sessions. I think that the purpose of our meeting in August is a more traditional committee type meeting where we're actually reviewing the material. We're not breaking out into groups. We're not breaking out into work sessions. We're reviewing the published material that we already have and then we're ranking them. So I think that alone, just the, the, the way that that meeting will be structured will help with it with the public engagement issues. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. I don't see any further questions. Thank you, Dr. Stram. So last up, we will take our ecosystem committee report. Mind members of the public, if they wish to testify to please sign up prior to the end of this report. Good afternoon, Ms. Evans. Good afternoon, members of the council. Let me just unlock my report here. What's coming up? So we, the ecosystem committee met uh, in March, uh, the week before the council meeting and talked, uh, and we were able to, we received the presentations on the Bering Sea Fishery Ecosystem Plan. Um, the committee also reviewed several other agenda items. And so at this point, I'm going to provide the entirety of the ecosystem committee report, the FEP material, as well as the other items as well. Maybe. Okay, so here's uh, the different items that came were, that were on our agenda. Uh, they was a one and a half day meeting and uh, I'm gonna walk through each of these items. So I won't spend any time on it here. By choice, there we go. The groundfish management policy. So the, the committee asked for an update on items that the, the council uh, looked at in February, 2022, which included both your response to the ecosystem committee minutes from January, as well as interest in the triennial review of the, of the groundfish management policy um, that the council reviewed in February, uh, as that's something that the committee has reviewed in the past. And the committee had some comments about specifically about the renewal of the programmatic SAIS, which was the authorizing document for creating that management policy that you reviewed and that's in your groundfish FMPs. In February, uh, staff provided an update to you that before the time of the next triennial review of that management policy, um, staff would be would consider the advisability of preparing another supplemental information report as we did in 20, 2015, the SIR being the vehicle by which the council uh, is able to uh, evaluate the ongoing applicability of the programmatic, the NEPA document that supports our groundfish management programs. Um, the ecosystem committee provided a recommendation that given the time that has elapsed since the ongoing analysis, and particularly this was a theme throughout the meeting, discussing environmental change in our region um, and different uh, circumstances uh, in recent years, especially with the rate of change that's happening, that the council should um, exercise perhaps a little bit more urgency with respect to bringing back and reevaluating that programmatic SEIS and ensuring that any process that you initiate to reevaluate a SIR or, or reevaluate the programmatic includes public scoping and public input early in the process. Moving on to the next topic on the agenda was the FEP team issues and the task force reports that you received today. The ecosystem committee also received an update from the ACLIM project and uh, which included uh, slides on the IPCC 2021 findings, some of which were presented to the council last October. The committee appreciated hearing all these reports and from, from the team, from the task forces and from ACLIM and was particularly uh, struck with, again, with the um, information highlighting the rapid rate of change and our, the changes in projection um, of the rate of climate change from five years ago, the last IPCC report to uh, most recent information. 
The committee appreciated the FEP team reports and highlighted the progress on the work, pro work products, encourages those teams to continue with their work and completing those work products. The conversation, which is described in more detail in the committee minutes that are posted, but the, there were a number of recurring themes around these particular agenda items and, and in general throughout the meeting. And just to highlight a couple of those, again, there's a little bit more detail in the minutes, but one of them really focused on attention between the fact that the council has a number of strategic projects ongoing through the FEP, the Health ATKS draft protocol, the uh, climate change task force work in particular, and both of those, and, and the report from the uh, FEP team, the strategic ecosystem evaluation. And that, that work is important from that strategic longer term perspective, but there's a tension between waiting to be able to have the results of those longer strategic, longer term strategic projects and an urgency now to responding to immediate rapid onset of effects of climate change that's being felt by stakeholders in our process. And the committee didn't necessarily have a, 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 a consensus solution as to how to deal with that, but that really came back, came up um, a lot in the conversation of the committee members around various of these issues that um, that tension between the time it takes to do these strategic and longer term projects and the need uh, to respond immediately to um, effects that are being felt. The other theme that recurred in the committee's conversations related to um, how to include other voices in discussions, assessments and decisions about the impacts of climate change, um, talking about the uh, highlighting that uh, through the LKTKS protocol, specifically to the Bering Sea will provide guidance, um, but how, what other venues and opportunities are there to broaden the knowledge base for council decision making as conditions change and people who have not been as affected before um, by the council decision making are now being affected by the process. Going to move on to the next, hopefully move on to the next agenda item. So the next thing, the next uh, update that the council or the committee rather received was from David Witherall um, highlighting some of the work that he is doing through the CCC subcommittee on area-based management. This is information, uh, early draft of the information that he's preparing for the CCC meeting in May um, and looking at categorizing all of the closure areas in Alaska um, with working with the other councils who are taking on the same efforts in their regions to be able to inform the national process for the America the Beautiful Act, um, the preparation of that guidance document and the atlas that will accompany it. And the committee was very appreciative of the work that is being done by staff. I think so it will be a really useful product, both for uh, the national effort, as well as for our council, um, as that work continues and is um, finalized. The categorization that uh, is being undertaken is looking at, at various different aspects of the conservation areas or the closure areas that have been identified, that the council has identified in Alaska, um, both looking at why they were created and the, their classification, the type of governance that's associated with them and the type and the management focus associated um, as well as whether they meet the principles established under the America the Beautiful Act. The committee had some specific recommendations with respect to this agenda item, one being related to uh, the need for GIS and the uh, Mr. Witherell noted, and the committee recommends that the council highlight the need for GIS funding to complete the work of the subcommittee. Um, there, while we have mapping for many of our individual closure areas um, for our region and across the other councils as well, there is uh, a need for GIS work to be able to understand the total uh, closed area um, because many of the areas are overlapping. And so there's additional GIS work needed to be able to come up with those calculations. Um, so highlighting that as a recommendation for the council. And then the other series uh, pair of recommendations relate to uh, the finalizing of the report for the CCC. Uh, the committee had a discussion about the fact that in Alaska, many of the conservation areas 
that were identified were the result of, of ground up collaborations. Some of them were initiated from public discussion, public action, but a lot of the, the closure areas, thinking specifically perhaps of some of the EFH closures that we had have put in place in this area, in this region, um, were really established or the boundaries were defined through a working group that involved diverse stakeholders and agency staff working over multiple years to really find the best areas to represent both the conservation and to mitigate adverse impacts to other to, to fisheries. Um, and that the recommendation of the committee is for the council to encourage the CCC to emphasize to the departments of commerce and interior as they move forward with consideration of new areas under America the Beautiful, that that similar bottom up approach uh, be used to identify important areas in the future. Oops. The next uh, subject that the council that the committee took up is was a staff paper that was re uh, requested by the committee and the council approved that that should be taken up by the um, ecosystem committee. So a staff paper was prepared looking at Gulf ecosystem research. Um, this was partly in response to some conversations by the um, Bering Sea FEP team last year talking about next directions for the Bering Sea FEP. And there was a public conversation at that time about, well, maybe we should be thinking about what we should be doing next in the Gulf of Alaska. Do we need a Gulf of Alaska FEP? There's some conversation about that at the SSC as well. And so the ecosystem committee had asked, had suggested that at the next stage to think about that question would be to look at what are some of the research activities that are going on with respect to the Gulf ecosystem and how might the council's response to that, um, that timing fit in with some of those larger Gulf level programs, such as uh, the Gulf equivalent of A-Climb, the GOA Climb um, uh, integrated modeling project. The, Sarah Cleaver put that paper together and presented it to the committee and the committee recommends that the council task the ecosystem committee with the development of a scoping process to inform the potential development of either a Gulf fishery ecosystem plan or some other similar tool. The conversation at the committee was that there, as part of the exploration of how to respond to ecosystem issues in the Gulf and how to intersect with scientific research about ecosystem issues and environmental change in the Gulf of Alaska, um, the council should certainly consider an, a fishery ecosystem plan, but also look at other op opportunities if there are other more streamlined ways to move forward. And you can see in the report and on the slide, there are a number of decision points and lessons learned um, that the committee suggested would be part of designing a scoping process to um, position the council when you are ready to think about whether you wanted to initiate action in the Gulf of Alaska, how might you learn some lessons from either other timing um, or other lessons from the Bering Sea Fishery Ecosystem Plan, for example, and uh, the value of what would be most appropriate uh, as a pathway forward for the Gulf of Alaska um, when you come to that point. And then the final slide here just identifies a couple of other updates that came to the committee um, with respect to the EFH five-year review in response to SSC feedback in February. The team has pushed back their next product um, to uh, review in a preliminary way, but with the SSC and the ecosystem committee and that the committee supported um, changing that timeline to make sure that we uh, appropriately, that the SSC's comments are appropriately addressed. The committee also wanted to highlight, or there's a recommendation here that the council assist with publishing, publicizing opportunities that the committee heard about. There's some various funding opportunities under the Infrastructure Act, that's longer name than that, which uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And we had a briefing about several restoration and habitat restoration opportunities, Pacific salmon recovery opportunities and coastal resilient resilience projects, there's funding available for all of those categories and uh, wanted to make sure that those were, were well known to anyone who might be uh, have a project that could benefit from that type of funding. And then just a, a brief update on the planning for the second ecosystem workshop that the subgroup intends to refocus that proposal coming out of this meeting um, to come back to the council with a proposal for how to move forward. And that concludes the ecosystem committee report, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Um, Mr. Twight, as committee chair, is there anything you'd like to add? 
Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Evans did a, a really good job. The committee is aware uh, uh, of the, the resources tension. And, and I think all committee members feel some concern that our available resources, our available bandwidth um, uh, are, um, may well be a constraint in, in facing the challenges that we see ahead of us with, with climate change and just increasing uncertainty. Um, it's not a criticism of the council process at all. It's just, uh, I think that's a source of a lot of the tension um, that was reflected in the, in the minutes. And it was a very constructive tension. I, I don't mean to imply that the meetings were difficult. It's just the uh, people grappling with that the issues feel right now like uh, um, they may not be uh, matched with our capacities. And, and I think that's something we're we'll hearing more and more of um, maybe not just on the ecosystem committee front, but. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Any questions on the report, Ms. Kimball? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Evans. I'm wondering with the, well, with Mr. Twight's comments and the committee recommendation to begin the scoping process for a Gulf FEP, if at the time the committee made that recommendation, were, were they, were they aware of the FEP team's recommendation not to proceed at this point with a large new FEP? And certainly they weren't aware of the SSC recommendation that agreed with that at this meeting. But I'm just wondering, that seems a little misaligned with the FEP team. And so I'm wondering where, where you are on that. Through the chair, Ms. Kimball, the committee did have the benefit of having the recommendations from the FEP team when they made when they were reviewing this paper. I think the the conversation at the committee level was that they wanted to, at a committee level at least, provide you as much information. So at the time that it is that resources uh, are available and the council priority is available to devote attention to the Gulf of Alaska. And that could be, um, you know, we're at the stage, at least one of our FEP action modules is approaching completion. The climate change task force is on a longer time frame, but the local knowledge, traditional knowledge information is coming up um, for their final work product next year. That, that might, there might be some time savings um, and efficiency for the committee to begin some of the, the initial scoping process. I don't know if that's the correct word, but trying to think about um, some debriefing from lessons learned from how the Bering Sea FEP has operated. How is that, you know, that task force con concept a useful one that we should be employing in the future? Are there alternatives to a, a full-blown fishery ecosystem plan? For example, if the um, council was interested in uh, trying to devote some attention to the Gulf of Alaska by applying some of the lessons learned from the work products that are available for the Bering Sea, either through the Climate Change Task Force or the LKTKS Task Force protocol, how could you apply those to the Gulf of Alaska? Um, I think that the in understanding the timing constraints and, and one of the, the bullets that the committee highlighted was really looking at that question of staff resources, opportunities for partnerships or synergies. Might there be something more streamlined that would allow you to still um, put, devote some focus to environmental change happening in the Gulf of Alaska um, and but get the most bang for your buck with the resources that are available, uh, understanding how that might translate for that could um, provide some uh, I guess without necessarily redirecting uh, resources away from the Bering Sea, but trying to find how, what, a, what a good path forward could be and positioning you, the council, um, with that information at the time that you are ready to consider that. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. I'm just, I guess I'm still trying to understand how we would do that, even if this is a, a request of the ecosystem committee to to put itself to work with that scoping process, it still seems as if you need the same staff available that are working on the Bering Sea FEP or on the LKTK task force, if you're gonna at all inform what a process for the Gulf might be or do anything with lessons learned. And, and so there is still a constraint or a trade-off, I suppose, on completing the work that we've engaged in in the Bering Sea before we engage in in applying it to the Gulf. I just don't quite see how we're 
not affecting those other processes. If you have anything else to share on on that that was discussed at the ecosystem committee, that would be that would be great. Through the chair, Ms. Kimball, I think that the only thing that I would say is is the the that perhaps the amount of time or the effort that it takes to think about lessons learned is less than engaging in a full process of going out for extensive scoping meetings like we did with the Bering Sea FEP, um, public scoping meetings, or, um, or actually starting on, on the development of what an FEP for the Gulf of Alaska might look like. And so maybe that in the committee's view, that small amount of work that we would be perhaps um, requesting from staff would be worth it to uh, to have a more informed process going forward. I mean, I think your point is valid, but it just comes down to a, a, a matter of degree. I don't know if um, the chair has anything further to add. Thanks, Ms. Kimball. Further questions? Thank you, Ms. Evans. That will bring us to public comment. There are three signed up to testify. First up is Brendan Raymond Yakubian, then Megan Williams, then Teresa Peterson. Uh, good morning. This is uh, Brendan. Is uh, you have a sound check? Loud and clear. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks very much. Um, hello, council members. Um, my name is Brendan Raymond Jacobian, and I'm testifying on behalf of Coeric Inc. Uh, Coeric is the Alaska Native nonprofit tribal consortium for the 20 federally recognized tribes of the Bering Strait region. We'd like to provide some brief comments about agenda item D2 regarding the FEP, the Bering Sea FEP, and the two action module task forces. With regard to the FEP, we commend the plan team for continuing its open and inclusive process that is receptive to stakeholder input. Um, echoing a variety of work in social sciences, we have concerns about the development of indicators for sociocultural phenomena. Uh, it's important to understand the limitations of and caveats for indicators of this uh, for this purpose, the need to use rich qualitative data in place of, or at least in conjunction with indicators, and the need to collaborate collaboratively develop and interpret indicators with the relevant communities to which they pertain. Uh, and in general, and with regard to this last point, we were happy to hear discussions to this effect at the recent FEP meeting. Um, there was an inviting atmosphere for upcoming meetings on this topic, and we encourage the team to work collaboratively with relevant communities and entities as they move forward on this. <clears throat> with regard to the LKTKS task force, we commend the extraordinary progress that the team has made to date and encourage support of the continued work of that task force. Um, with regard to the climate change task force, um, we encourage the CCTF to foreground the importance of tribal perspectives on climate change as the knowledge of tribes is millennia deep, often based in in situ experience with the marine ecosystem and reflects an ever evolving base built on living with the, within the front lines of environmental change and that can speak to both small and large scale spatial scopes and time depth. Included in this would be looking to the extensive knowledge and management related understandings, practices and tools which indigenous communities, organizations and co-management bodies have developed which pertain to climate change but in many cases are not currently taken up in the council system though could be to help build out the robustness of the council management system in terms of climate change readiness and adaptation. And uh, that's all of our comments and thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you for your testimony and for your service on the Climate Change Task Force. Are there any questions? Thanks again. Thank you. Next up is Megan Williams. Good afternoon. My name is Megan Williams. Nice to see you all in person. I am a fishery scientist with Ocean Conservancy. And I'll start by saying that we find ourselves in a truly challenging position in the face of climate change. This is not news. Um, the resilience is at risk for large and small scale commercial fisheries for indigenous and coastal communities and the marine ecosystem more broadly. Um, the results from the IPCC reports suggest that the scale of recent changes across the climate system as a whole and the present state of many aspects of the climate system 
are unprecedented in many, over many centuries to many thousands of years. So we're really in uncharted waters. Climate change is outpacing our ability to adapt and to respond to environmental perturbations. The IPCC also reports that proactive management is essential to curbing the negative effects associated with climate change and that societal choices and actions implemented in the next decade are absolutely critical for enhancing climate resilient development and climate resilient fisheries. So uh, not to be too doom and gloom, but with that in mind, I do have a laundry list of items that I'd like to discuss today regarding the D2 topic. Regarding the Ecosystem Committee, we do support the Ecosystem Committee recommendation that the Council task the Ecosystem Committee with the development of a scoping process to inform the development of a Gulf of Alaska fishery ecosystem plan or a similar tool. So acknowledging the conversation and the question just posed by Ms. Kimball, um, we do think it would be advantageous to begin scoping this earlier rather than later in a proactive approach so that we are best poised to address that region. We also support the Ecosystem Committee's recommendation for the Council to initiate a process to reevaluate the groundfish PSEIS in light of the dramatic changes in the ecosystem. Um, there is a need to re revisit the associated knowledge analyses, which date back 20 years. So we think this is a good time. Um, there are such dramatic shifts in the system. There are a lot of aspects of that analysis that could be updated. So changing gears just a little bit regarding the Bering Sea Fishery Ecosystem Plan, we are really encouraged to see the development of the Ecosystem Health Report or the Strategic um, Ecosystem Evaluation. I think I'm just gonna call it the SEE going forward <laughs> for clarity. Um, so we, we support the six ecosystem goals that are defined and linking those indicators to the defined six ecosystem goals. As you heard today, the focus on the first two ecosystem goals, one and two, which are the more data rich ecosystem goals with available indicator data um, makes sense as a stepwise approach and a clear process. But we do note that goals three through six, which incorporate things like seabirds and marine mammals and subsistence um, and some of the long-term adverse effects are, are really key to developing EBFM under the fishery ecosystem plan. But these types of goals and indicators associated will inherently take a lot more legwork and time. Um, we are concerned about how to address this and we think it should be a priority um, going forward. And also note that this is a place where stakeholders and different knowledge types could really play a meaningful role. Also under the FEP, we hope um, that this SEE or health report moves beyond information sharing and advances the application of management targets or reference points. Um, I'll blatantly plagiarize a recent publication by Levin et al, where the authors state that EBFM requires that FEPs identify management targets and evaluate potential management strategies before crossing the threshold of an FEP reference point. The study goes on to say that as with all fisheries management, stakeholder involvement is critical for generating a suite of potential management responses. The SEE is intentionally constructed to be strategic and long-term. And I think we can all at this time agree, and we've heard discussion about that from uh, Ms. Evans, there's also the need for the simultaneous development of a more short-term tactical management solutions. And this is where we really see the value of the CCTF. Um, the proposed work to explore climate resilient management adaptations is critical for establishing a more resilient management system that is sustainable in the face of this greater variability and less predictable systems that we can expect to see. How am I doing on time? Okay. Um, I would like to note that we appreciate the degree to which the FEP plan team, the CCTF and the LKTKS task forces have all encouraged public feedback where they can. Um, participating in those meetings, it's felt very inclusive. They've included us in the working groups when they can despite technical difficulties. And as stakeholders, we really appreciate that engagement and ability to contribute and look forward to doing that more going forward. And finally, on behalf of the coalition behind the ecosystem matrix, um, I'd like to thank the council and the CCTF for the feedback on the matrix. Um, we presented some information at their March meeting to the CCTF. And we intend to incorporate that feedback and we will come back with something bigger, better, and better 
Um, we look forward to engaging more with agency, with stakeholders that are interested in keeping this moving forward. And we really do appreciate the feedback and uh, we look forward to incorporating that. And with that, um, I thank the council and the associated bodies for all their work on all the D items and everything else at this meeting. And thanks for the opportunity again. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Are there any questions? Mr. Twight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, <clears throat> As I was listening to you, I was kind of expecting you maybe to end up by weaving together a couple of things. And so let me just see if, if this is where you're going. But as, as you think about next steps with the matrix, one of the things you highlighted in your quote from Dr. Levin was this concept of recognizing environmental thresholds and recognizing when you've crossed them. Mm -hmm. um, is that something you're... Is, I, I didn't really see that in the first attempt at the matrix because it's a pretty lofty goal. Um, but as you referenced and as we've talked about, we have scarce resources. And I don't know how easy it'll be for us to tackle that. Is that something that the consortium is thinking about? And is that one of the directions you're maybe headed? Hi, there it is. <laughs> Through the chair, Mr. Twight. Um, we are absolutely thinking about this. Um, I think Dr. Aiden as well, this is not, would agree, this is no small feat, um, but this is something we are thinking about. I think it depends on whether or not these are more ecological, sort of ecosystem-wide, fishery specific, there are all sorts of things, or whether we're thinking about community impacts um, and what are the thresholds and tipping points, what are the targets that we're looking for at management, but I do, Yes, we are thinking about it. Uh, I don't wanna speak for the coalition in saying that that's something that we can absolutely achieve, but it is absolutely on our radar. And um, as it is, I believe with the Ecosystem Health Report Card or SEE, I think it's very important to keep moving this concept forward. And you can read about it in terms of potentially you're seeing greater variability and that becomes some kind of a threshold when you are working outside of those bounds or potentially you know, there's more of a community or impact. So I, that's a long-winded way of saying it. Absolutely yes, but it's, it's an incredibly complex task, but it's very important, I think, that we keep framing this as one of our important management objectives to get there with regards to a more sort of EBFM approach. And so the coalition's thinking about it, but I think also ACLIM and the FEP team as well, everybody's thinking about it. It's, it's hard to get there though. Any further questions? Thank you, Dr. Williams. Thank you. Last up will be Teresa Peterson. Hey there, good to be last up again. Um, Chairman Kinneen, members of the council, Teresa Peterson with the Alaska Marine Conservation Council. And thanks for the opportunity um, to comment on the, on the D2 <coughs> items. And I just, I want to begin by saying I like the way the ecosystem report fit in with the um, discussions on the D2 and it was it was a nice fit for that um, the review of that report. I wanted to begin by um, complementing the work underway by the Bering Sea FEP plan team and the LKTKS task force and the climate change task force. As you just heard in the updates, there's a tremendous amount of work underway, which is critical to managing fishing fisheries in a changing climate in a, in a very holistic way. It's all really quite impressive, I think. Um, we support continued development of the Ecosystem Health Report, which tracks identified goals and objectives of the FEP. The indicator-based approach to monitor, monitor ecosystem status over a longer period of time, including fishing effects, will help in understanding and monitoring ecosystem status. It will be helpful to see a pilot report at the end of the year to get a better understanding of the approach and the challenges. In terms of the CCTF, we understand the climate ready, readiness synthesis should be available in the fall, and the group will then move into the next phase of the work, identifying adaptive tools. As we all continue to work proactively to mitigate impacts on the fisheries and ecosystems we depend in, it's a good opportunity to, to work together 
um, in that next stage of the work. And I appreciate um, kind of the focus that the Climate Change Task Force is working towards getting um, increased public engagement. The rate of change is rather terrifying. And with the expertise that is in this room and listening online, it's clear that we need to work proactively to reduce our vulnerabilities to the changes that are on our, on our front doorstep. The CCTF is exploring ways to increase public engagement in the work and the process will clearly benefit from the collective knowledge of stakeholders to help identify near time actions that can be that can be taken to advance climate readiness. We support the work underway by the LKTKS task force, including the search engine for the um, LKTS reference materials and establishment of protocols to bring LKTKS into the council process, which will in turn foster a more inclusive process for engagement. Segwaying to the ecosystem report, AMCC supports the recommendation from the EC to start thinking about timing and a process to reevaluate the PSEIS, which will help include, which includes scoping and opportunities for public early in the process. Given the magnitude of the changes in the ecosystem in the waters off Alaska since the policy was adopted, it's a good time to, to take a look. And last but not least, AMCC supports the recommendation for the council to task the ecosystem committee with the development of a scoping process to inform potential development of a Gulf of Alaska FEP or a similar tool. We want to thank Sarah Cleaver for putting together a scoping paper on Gulf research as I open the links when reading through the paper, climate research cites large changes are expected in the Gulf of Alaska in the coming decades. It is clear changes are coming fast and are expected to continue. There is a lot of research happening in the Gulf, but it's challenging for stakeholders to track and there isn't really a good process for facilitating discussion. We do think it's a good time to energize the discussion and consider a design for the Gulf. The discussion will help us prepare for the future. It was noted in the IPCC report to the Ecosystem Committee, the more time that goes by, the less the adaptive management options. I could see the discussion of a Gulf FEP or something similar serving as a venue for engagement and discussions to foster resiliency. The Gulf is teeming with life and supports some of the most productive fisheries in the United States. It's also where the most, most of the human population in Alaska live, and it's time to energize the discussion through the council process. I think it would be helpful for the council to support discussion in the ecosystem now to help um, guide potential future action. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Peterson, and thanks for your service on the ecosystem committee. Are there any questions? All right, thank you. Okay, that concludes public comment. Um, would the council like to take any action? Ms. Kimball. I have a motion. I think I might've just gotten in time to Shannon. It's very short. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On agenda item D2, uh, my motion reads, the council supports the ongoing work of the Bering Sea Fishery Ecosystem Plan Team, Local Knowledge, Traditional Knowledge Subsistence Task Force and Climate Change Task Force, and the April 2022 SSC recommendations on each of these items, or on each of these teams. And I will, um, with a second, I'll speak to it. Second. Thank you, Mr. Mizrow. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I realize it's, I mean, quite understated motion. We don't have any action that we need to take at this meeting. These really were informational reports, but I'd least like to acknowledge in a motion the work that these groups are doing. It's, it really is impressive, as was said in testimony. Um, all of the work, in particular, the draft protocol that we've received, even in draft form from the LKTKS task force is really, really impressive. Um, so I just want to Put on the record that we appreciate this. We appreciate the deliberative approach that each of these task force are taking to their work. 
Um, and I think it's gonna suit us well in the future. So I'd like to keep the focus on these. I'm glad that the council has made time in their agenda to hear the full agenda item for each of these teams, including the ecosystem committee. Uh, and I, I hope we can just keep moving forward. They've given us great timelines to move forward that are not too far in the future where we're gonna have to put a lot of emphasis on then how we act on their recommendations. But for now, this is just moving that work forward and thank you for their work. Thank you, Ms. Kimball, and thank you for the motion. Are there any questions or amendments or comments on the motion? All right, well, um, thank you, Ms. Kimball, for, for highlighting all the, the great work that, uh, that um, the task forces and committees have, have done. I think it is truly impressive and really appreciated hearing the, the reports today, like I think the entire council did. Um, if there is no opposition and the motion passes unanimously, thanks again, Ms. Kimball. Anything further under agenda item D2? Mr. Twight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do have motions prepared on a couple of the other items on the Ecosystem Committee Task Force report, but I thought I would actually just hold those in until staff tasking. Is that your preference? Yeah, I, I, we, I think we certainly could, could do that unless you were uh, prepared and wanted to take them now. I mean, they, we did hear the, the report. Um, I, I am prepared and we could do them now. Um, first, uh, not in the form of a motion, um, but I thought I'd quickly address the, um, um, the committee's recommendation on uh, programmatic supplemental EIS. Um, I'm not offering a motion on that at this time. Uh, the committee did make recommendations for review of the PSEIS. Um, and those concern with the committee's objective of ensuring that the PSEIS remains relevant and appropriate for current circumstances. Um, you will recall the SSC in their minutes for this meeting reminded us of the challenges that recent climate change projections from the IPCC posed to the council process and suggested that the council should explicitly plan for a future with lower predictability. Their suggestion could be addressed in a PSEIS review or through further evaluation in a supplemental impact report process. It also serves as a reminder to us that a thoughtful review and revision of the PSEIS will be a considerable undertaking for the council and the agency. Hence, uh, my conclusion that before embarking on a process, the council must take the time to arrange for the resources necessary for a comprehensive and informed review. And those resources will take time to assemble. And that's why I'm not actually forwarding the committee's recommendation at this time is that I think it's gonna probably be a couple meeting process. Um, instead, I'm suggesting that it would be valuable to have staff begin though with, the, with development of a supplemental information report as they begin to find time both at the agency and the council um, for our review at some later meeting. Uh, and then pending that process, uh, it may also be helpful to get from them an assessment of the resources that would be necessary for a review of the PSEIS. Um, with that SIR process and additional information in hand, the council can consider it at some point in the future whether our PSEIS is still adequate for helping us address the challenges of the future as well as the present. So I think the staff already, based on input at previous meetings, has had the SIR on their sort of um, target list for the future, particularly at the agency level is my understanding. And, uh, but that they don't have the resources yet for doing that and they'll begin it when they feel like they do have the resources. Thank you, Mr. Twight. I'll look to input from other council members. Or Mr. Witherell. All set. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Thank you. Um, next, I do have a motion on um, it's labeled GOA ecosystem.
Yeah. yeah, we can. We Waiting for Shannon's there. expression to turn from one of puzzlement <laughs> to one of eureka. Um, Shannon, if you find the other one first, you could just put that up, and I could go with that one too. Okay, GOA ecosystem. Now I have to go back and refine it online. The council recommends the ecosystem committee begin collecting information to inform the initial steps for potential development of a GOA fishery ecosystem plan or similar tool. The council requests the committee to identify a series of decision points for the council, primarily the value in FEP might serve or similar tool might serve in the GOA. Lessons learned during development of the Bering Sea FEP, whether the FEP team and action module task force format should be continued into the Gulf, and if so, would modifications be useful to streamline the process? The timing to interact with ongoing projects such as GOA CLIMB and the question of staff, resources, and opportunities for partnerships or synergies, particularly if effort would need to be redirected from the Bering Sea. The resulting information will be available for council consideration should it decide to initiate formal scoping for a GOA, FEP, or similar process. With a second, I can speak to the motion. Seconded by Ms. Vanderhoven. Mr. Twight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, very briefly, uh, there's been a lot of discussion already that I would just reference. Um, and in particular, I'd reference the, uh, um, the discussion that Ms. Kimball had with Ms. Evans um, uh, during the Ecosystem Committee report session, particularly on this item and um, what kinds of resources it might take to accomplish this. And um, again, just emphasize what the committee was trying to do was use existing staff resources to just begin to lay a foundation that'll be ready for the council at some point in the future when the council decides that either a Gulf FEP or some other overarching document for the Gulf is necessary. Um, one of the lessons I learned uh, from the Bering Sea FEP was the value the FEP brought to the substantial um, investment that the uh, science community had made in ACLIM, uh, has made in ACLIM, which we've begun to see the kinds of rewards um, from that investment and we'll continue to see those. But the, um, the FEP really provided the ACLIM, the, that scientific effort, the FEP provided that scientific effort with a fishery management sort of perspective and a policy sort of perspective that um, really helped them stay on target uh, and focused to um, having the project responsive to the needs of the council and fishery managers uh, of the Bering Sea groundfish fisheries. I think had we not had a Bering Sea FEP in place, we'd still have a pretty magnificent model of how the Bering Sea operates, but we might not have the connections to the real world that we're dealing with at the council. Um, the ACLIM would not have been giving us the kinds of focused information and focused answers that we're really looking for. And I know that they've been hoping to provide from the beginning of the ACLIM process. So um, the Gulf climb, the GOA climb is, is nearing a, um, a stage of completion for the Gulf. And I think it's nearing the point where uh, we as a council need to sort of step forward and say, here's what our goals are from an ecosystem perspective for the Gulf to, to really um, be able to get the same kind of value out of the GOA climb that we, that we are starting to see in a climb. Secondly, the Gulf, as we were reminded in public testimony, is a highly productive ecosystem. That's an ecosystem that our nation's dependent on, as well as 
our region and in particular the fishing fishery dependent communities of the Gulf are very dependent on, many of our stakeholders are very dependent on. It is already, it was, it was the place where we, where we witnessed the first major ecosystem shock uh, of what I think will be numerous ones to come. Uh, so it was, and, and uh, we know it's also undergoing uh, a lot of change in a rapid pace at this point right now. And I would submit that we actually, as well as the council, owe it to our stakeholders in the Gulf region, the fishery dependent communities in the Gulf region and to seafood consumers in the nation really to also provide similar sort of policy guidance that will help us navigate um, the shoals of climate change for the Gulf too. So for those reasons, recognizing it's a difficult time to marshal the resources to do it, but equally recognizing um, the need is really now rather than in the future, I'm suggesting let's at least pull together the materials to um, have a foundation in place. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Are there any questions, Mr. Mesro? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Um, my question is just uh, regarding the last bullet and what that means. The council requests the committee to identify the question of staff resources and opportunities. What does the question of staff mean? <laughs> um, sorry, poor editing on my part. Uh, the committee should identify simply the staff the resources and the opportunities. And I mean, the, the question is just the question about what kinds of resources do we have available and what it would, what that might take from other efforts if we were to uh, redirect or direct those resources. It's poor wording. Okay, can I follow up with one more? Have you thought through how this might um, affect our council staff and then their ability to tackle the three or four um, pressing, most pressing issues that are sort of confronting the council. Is this something that the ecosystem committee can do without um, hamstringing the staff to address some of the most pressing fishery management issues? Have you kind of given that some thought? I guess that's my, my other question. We have, we don't think we can get very far on this, um, but Ms. Evans, and I'd certainly welcome her to chime in too, in, in responding to Ms. Kimball, she had some suggestions about areas where we thought we could begin to work on these without directly affecting some of the other existing, and she may want to elaborate somewhat further on her answer. Through the chair, uh, Mr. Mesero, Mr. Twight, uh, my, I guess, impression of looking at this motion was that this was largely in the nature of internal staff conversations, almost council staff conversations, the questions of looking at um, how the lessons learned from the, the way in which we are doing our FEP team and action module task forces, um, the starting to think about decision points and certainly looking back at what we did with the Bering Sea FEP and how that might apply to the Gulf. Um, I wasn't anticipating that this would be a huge analytical lift. I was thinking of this more of an exploration of ideas. I think that you could go a lot further with it, but that's not exactly how I was anticipating the or how I was interpreting the request from the committee at this point. Thank you, Ms. Evans, that's helpful. Any further questions on the motion? Any amendments? Any comments? Mr. Kurland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Twight, I just uh, want to say I appreciate the deliberate and reflective approach here. It's reminiscent of uh, when we embarked on the Bering Sea FEP after reflecting on the experience from the Aleutian Islands FEP and very significantly developed uh, on, on built on that approach and, and uh, developed it in a different direction that um, has, uh, I, I think is showing great promise. So uh, it seems like that's your intent here is to learn from what we're doing in the bearing and, and uh, be thoughtful about how to proceed with the Gulf. 
And thank you, Mr. Kurland. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Twight. And for the motion, I I'll, I support it. I, I also just caution, I guess, that we are, if the ecosystem committee would like to task itself with doing this work for us, I greatly appreciate that offer. And that's what I'm reading in this motion. I'm a little hesitant because I feel like there's nothing that we do in this process or a committee process that doesn't require the work of staff. So with the responses about that being minimal, I hope we can take that to heart and be true, be true to that so that we can proceed with the things that we've already undertaken, that we've set expectations for stakeholders that won't be ongoing forever, but will turn into actions through this council. And we started with the Bering Sea and I'd like to see that through. So I'm supporting it and I thank the committee for wanting to step up and do some of this work for us. I hope it becomes fruitful when we move to an FEP for the Gulf in the future, which will be necessary. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Mr. Twight? I, I do think, um, um, thanks, and, and duly noted, Ms. Kimball, I, I think some of these listed here are because individual committee members had some observations and had done some thinking and, and some, um, had done some thinking about the points that they would want to offer to this list already. And so I, my anticipation is that at our next meeting in the fall, um, we devote uh, a significant amount of time to, to taking maybe the initial bones of what staff has and fleshing it out as a committee. So I do view it as to some extent a committee work product, but I do share your skepticism about asking committees to actually do work themselves. <laughs> um, we always need staff. Thanks, Mr. Twight. Any final comments? Is there any opposition to the motion? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Shannon, now the OECM. This, this is responsive to the portion of the ecosystem committee minutes about area-based management. The council recommends that uh, North Pacific Fishery Management Council representatives make the following comments at the, um, the upcoming uh, council coordinating committee meeting with respect to the ongoing work of the CCC area-based management subcommittee. First, the council recommends that the CCC highlight the need for GIS funding to complete the work of the subcommittee. The calculation of total area closed is an important input to the America the Beautiful Act, ATB guidance document and ATLAS and GIS work to account for overlapping areas as needed. Second, the council recommends that the CCC subcommittee report highlight that the implementation of conservation areas is most effective when developed through ground up collaborations taking place over many years with diverse, diverse stakeholder and agency involvement and that the CCC encourage the Departments of Commerce and the Interior to consider a bottom up approach to identifying important areas for ATB. With a second, I can speak to it. Ms. Van Herwen, back to you, Mr. Twain. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I'll, in terms of speaking to it, I'll basically just refer council members to the ecosystem committee minutes uh, on this, as well as um, <coughs> the um, additional context that Ms. Evans provided uh, when she uh, gave an overview of the ecosystem committee uh, discussion of this subject. Uh, it, we do have an upcoming CCC meeting in May, uh, and um, this will be very much on the agenda. The, uh, CCC is hoping to get the um, subcommittee's report finalized and out the door in, in a time frame that's uh, going to be relevant to the um, ATB process. And uh, we think this will add value to the uh, council's contribution to the administration's America the Beautiful initiative. Are there any questions on the motion? Amendments? 
or comments on the motion. Is there any opposition? The motion passes unanimously. Anything further, Mr. Troy? Nothing further for me, thank you. Okay. Any other action? Okay. All right, that will uh, bring us to uh, D4. Dr. Stram, I'm gonna walk us through this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Diana Stram, Council Staff. We're on agenda item D4, um, review of the the document on best scientific information available. I'll provide you a brief overview and then turn it over to Dr. Holloway, who hopefully is tied in by phone at this point, just to provide you a, a brief overview. In 2018, NOAA issued a procedural directive that required each region to develop a regional best scientific information available BSIA framework that describes how it implements the NOAA Fishery General BSIA framework. The required elements of this include a timeline, roles of each partner in the process, and a description of modifications from the general framework um, if that's required. And that document once available, should, once completed, should be available to the public. A draft document is attached, which provides this draft framework for the groundfish resources in the Bering Sea, Aleutian Islands, Gulf of Alaska, crab in the Bering Sea, scallop on, across Alaska, um, as well as our FMPs for all of those aspects. Um, this has included a partnership between the Alaska Fishery Science Center, the Alaska Regional Office, the Council, Department of Fish and Game, IPHC, the, and um, includes halibut discard mortality rates and the North Fisheries Headquarters staff. So that document is available on your agenda item for review and comment. The SSC has um, provided their comments on that. The final document, once um, augmented following this meeting, will be made available um, prior to, uh, it will be submitted to uh, NOAA Fisheries in May of 2022, so the end of, by the end of next month. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Holloway to walk through the overview slides, and you see the contributors um, to this on the, the opening slide. Dr. Holloway. Yes, uh, uh, good afternoon. It's my pleasure. My name is Ann Holloway, and I'm here on behalf of the a uh, team of authors that were consulted in putting this together. And as Dr. Stram mentioned, this is a relatively straightforward exercise uh, where we are documenting how our council uh, treats the issues of uh, best scientific information available. Uh, so uh, the background for this is that the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act mandates that fisheries decisions in the U.S. are based on the best scientific information available, and this is documented in National Standard 2. The uh, policy directive that uh, Dr. St Graham mentioned is on your agenda. There's a link here. It is surprising. It says da dam migration, but it is correct. Uh, this is the right link for it um, if you're looking forward for it online. Uh, this directive is really focused on how the council and the uh, National Marine Fisheries Service works to bring forward best scientific information available with respect to stock status determinations and catch specifications, so the ACLs. And the clearly the, uh, the revision of the Magnuson Act elevated the role of the SSC to uh, provide the, the um, recommendations for the ABC and OFLs, and uh, they needed to be based on best scientific information available. And the framework is, is a outline that provides information that would allow the public to understand how these decisions are 
utilizing the information available. And so as was noted by Dr. Stram, uh, this needs to be completed by May of 2022. So we are here to make sure that we have um, uh, complied with this directive. The uh, elements of it uh, in the document that you have uh, deal with, they follow the outline of the directive. So they deal with the stock assessment itself in terms of the prioritization and schedule for when the assessments will be brought forward. The uh, next section of it deals with the peer review timelines for uh, stock status relative to overfishing status, as well as uh, relative to overfish criteria and the projections of OFL and ABC for the out years. And of course, the SSC, as you all well know, oftentimes um, comments on the technical merits of the assessment itself and requests revisions, and those are documented there. There's a procedure for looking at the assessment revisions, as you well know, those are, tend to be brought forward uh, I, ahead of time. So the SSC and plan, plan teams can take a look at how the proposed revisions will play out. And then of course, at a separate meeting, those are actually brought forward. Uh, it documents the steps that the SSC and NOAA goes through in terms of setting the ABC and OFL, as well as the catch specifications and the final approval by NOAA uh, of these uh, and the record of decision. The, the framework deals with primarily with BSAI uh, ground and GOA groundfish FMPs, the BSAI crab FMP, and the scallop, the area-wide scallop FMP and the salmon FMP. Of course, salmon is is deferred. Management is deferred to the state, so we coordinated. We coordinate with the Pacific uh, Salmon Commission as well as the uh, state of Alaska on those decisions, and that's documented in a paragraph at the end of the second page and or right after the timeline in the document. Uh, and then there are more detailed uh, timelines for each step of the process as we go through for groundfish, crab, and scallop. The, as was noted, uh, the, the timeline for this was that we put together this draft but during the months of January and March. Uh, we are here now uh, to seek comments from both the SSC and the council on this document and any revisions that are necessary will be incorporated into it and then we plan to submit it to the um, to National Marine Fishery Service in, in May of 2022. And with that, that is the bulk of my presentation on best scientific information available. Thank you, Dr. Hollywood. Are there any questions? Don't see any. Thank you. Um, let's... It's good to hear your voices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we wish you were here. Yeah, well, I really am going to retire in June, so uh, <laughs> I, if anybody was wondering, I, it is, I haven't changed my mind. <laughs> well, thanks again. Okay, you guys take care. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay, that will bring us to uh, public comment. We have one signed up to testify, uh, Brendan Rabin Yakobian. Hi, uh, Soundcheck. Uh, a little quiet. I think we might adjust that on our end. Oh, okay. Is this any better? Um, still a little quiet. How about now? Perfect. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> uh, greetings, council members. Uh, um, uh, again, my name is Brendan Raymond Jacobian, and I'm testifying on behalf of Queric Inc., uh, the Alaska Native Nonprofit Tribal Consortium for the 20 federally recognized tribes of the Bering Strait region. We'd like to pro provide comment regarding agenda item D4, 
the best scientific information available or BSIA framework to suggest an area where the framework can be worked on before being finalized in May. Uh, some of this was discussed at the SSC and we appreciate that. Uh, what we suggest is that this document explicitly note that the council is taking steps, particularly through the LKTKS task force to enhance its capacity to incorporate LKTK subsistence information and the social science thereof into its processes. We hope and we do think that we are we are preaching to the choir uh, on this on these issues at this juncture. So this is not meant to be critical, but rather constructive to help in the evolution of the draft. Um, as presented at the SSC, there wasn't mention of the incorporation of this type of information in the framework, though, again, we'd acknowledge that the issue was taken up during SSC discussions and engagement with the framework authors. <clears throat> we would argue that the Existing process is not fully a BSIA framework because LKTK and relevant social science have been under incorporated in council process historically, but whose inclusion is necessary for using BSIA, which is part of why you as a council have taken steps to remedy that. As such, we feel that the council must go beyond outlining the existing process in order to present a BSIA framework and add into that um, something like a nod towards the areas where important council work is now in process to truly fulfill that, uh, truly fulfilling that mandate. <clears throat> um, it's also worth noting that during the uh, SSC conversation about the LKTKS task force earlier this week that the BSIA, BSIA framework was noted as potentially constituting a natural pathway for consideration of the practicality of how to on-ramp LKTKS information into the council process. And we also think it's important to keep in mind in general, the general guideline that where science can be used, so too can TK. TK can definitely speak, for example, to issues related to stock assessments and catch specifications, among other things. In terms of suggested language that might be useful um, in the file we uploaded along with the sign up um, with our testimony, we included a paper regarding the incorporation of TK into Alaska Federal Fishery Management and highlighted an excerpt regarding National Standard 2 for your attention. Um, I won't read it here uh, in the interest of time, but am just flagging it for your consideration and suggest it might be useful for the analytical team working on revising the framework. Um, so in conclusion, we suggest this revision to the draft BSIA framework. Um, and that is just to, to restate that, to uh, include a nod towards the work the council is doing to find ways to incorporate LKTK subsistence information and social science into its various processes, which will help inform its work towards utilize, utilizing the BSIA. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you for your testimony. Let's see if there's any questions. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Brendan, for that um, testimony. And this is very specific. I appreciate you bringing out the work that we just went over in the previous agenda item and, and trying to highlight where that can come in in every part of our process. That's the goal. Um, this directive seems very specific to stock status determinations and the specs process. So is there a particular point at which you want to highlight how you think the protocol or the framework should be changed? Or do you just want some general information that describes what we're working toward overall in our process? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yes, Ms. Kimball through the chair. Thank you very much for the question. Appreciate that. Yeah. I, I think the general point that um, we're making is just that this is, you know, sort of a uh, an existing but being um, addressed gap in the process towards addressing BSIA. And as we feel that traditional knowledge can on ramp into these processes, among others, um, that and, and I, I can't speak to where exactly um, the authors could could revise that. I would leave that to their their better judgment. Um, you know, it could be even just a a footnote or something to that effect, but I would leave that to their better judgment as to where, you know, how that could be noted. Um, I think that it's important, given that context, to to make a some sort of um, indication to that effect. So I guess I wouldn't I wouldn't have specifics about where you know where exactly in the the document itself that would go, but more so because it's kind of an overarching point, if that's useful. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Ms. Kimball. Any other questions? All right. 
Thanks again for your testimony. Okay, um, that concludes public comment. Um, there's no action required. Would the council like to pick up on anything here? All right, Mr. Witherall, anything you're needing from us? No, it's not. I, I think uh, we would probably transmit the SSC's comments and uh, other suggestions to the agency just so that they, yeah, they had a record of that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Witherall, Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And that was my understanding too. I just wanted to say very briefly, I did get the opportunity to listen to the SSC discussion on this and I just appreciated their, their input and uh, discussion on that. So thank you for that clarification. All right, thank you, Ms. Baker. Okay, if there's nothing further that will uh, conclude D4, um, let's go ahead and take an afternoon break and come back and uh, pick up staff tasking like in 15 minutes.
Council, please come back to order. All right, we are on agenda item E, staff tasking. Mr. Witherell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, referring to the action memo, uh, I've included the normal uh, items that we typically include under this agenda item, including a three meeting outlook, uh, a list of committees and membership, uh, the staff responsibilities and the groundfish work plan updates. In addition, I've highlighted some uh, upcoming meetings that we know of, uh, including the plan teams, the trawl EM committee meeting in, at the end of May, the uh, fishery monitoring advisory committee, the FMAC, and the enforcement committee that will be held uh, in, in May uh, prior to the Sitka meeting in June. So, uh, oh, we also have a PCF Mac uh, that, that also met uh, and the report will be brought up in June. Looking ahead uh, to the June meeting, uh, we've posted a preliminary June agenda and schedule. And uh, for the, on the agenda, we've got uh, Aleutian Island Golden King Crab specifications, final action on the uh, Gulf, Central Gulf Alaska rockfish adjustments, Initial review on the trolley M analysis and Bering Sea Aleutian Island small boat access analysis. Uh, we also have a review of the observer program annual reports. And uh, we have a number of uh, uh, informational reports on salmon, uh, salmon status and salmon bycatch and genetics and research reports there. And if you have any questions on what all those reports will encompass. I'd probably have to call Diana, uh, Dr. Shram up to the microphone. Uh, but the June meeting is scheduled in Sitka. Uh, we intend to run it as a hybrid meeting, uh, barring any unforeseen uh, problems with our internet, but uh, run it just like we did with this meeting, uh, probably the same COVID pro protocol, barring any uh, changes in the COVID situation. We'll start the SSC on Monday at the 6th and they would, given their uh, agenda, would need to meet through Wednesday. We'll start the AP on Tuesday and the council on Thursday after the SSC is completed. Um, the one thing I do want to bring to your attention is the three meeting outlook and I, I see that it's been put up on the screen. Uh, the items that I mentioned already for the June meeting are listed. Looking ahead to the October meeting, uh, in addition to uh, the items listed here, uh, including the Greenland turbot uh, long line and pots initial review and our typical ground fish um, specs and final action on the trolley M analysis and other observer issues. Uh, you've requested some voluntary reports from industry relative to red king crab avoidance measures. And um, you on also looking on uh, forward on this agenda. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure, but it depends on when the Congress would take action on the uh, RQE funding that uh, Mr. Mesro stated that his intent was to uh, potentially rescind the previous action on CSP if that happens. So I might have to add that to uh, one of these agendas. I maybe more likely to happen sometime between June and October, but I don't know. It, it may show up at the last minute. But this this is the three meeting outlook as we see it uh, from staff at this meeting. You'll notice there's some new uh, issues that are in the so-called batter's box. Um, some of them uh, came up at this meeting and others we've just been alerted to that we needed to go ahead and highlight for you. So I'm gonna stop there, Mr. Chairman, see if there are any questions. I, I know that uh, NOAA GC has a comment on the voluntary request for reports from the industry. Yes. Councilor. Through the chair, thank you, Mr. Witherall. Uh, I just wanted to circle back to the council's request for uh, voluntary report reports in October. As you guys are all aware, the PRA does apply to voluntary collections of information. For um, those collections, or for the information that's requested, if it falls in within an existing and approved uh, collection of information, 
we could proceed with that. For those, for that information that doesn't fall within an existing and approved uh, collection of information, we would have to secure PRA approval even for the, the request for voluntary information. Um, the OMB approval process is that is that can be completed separate from a rulemaking often takes six to nine months, although there's some variations in that time frame, and I would have to defer to NIMS on what's feasible for securing PRA approval uh, before October. Uh, the other thing I'll note is that um, discussion and conversation at a public meeting without the a written submission of a collection of information does not trigger the PRA. I'm happy to take any follow-up questions. Mr. Witherow. Thank you. Uh, my question is, do, would the existing PRA that we have for the voluntary co-op reports for uh, say Amendment 80 and the Crab Co-ops AFA, would that be sufficient to cover reporting from those groups? I know we don't have a uh, co-op report say from the Pacific Cod Pot Fishery, but uh, maybe some of the reports we could take without additional PRA action? Through the chair, Mr. Witherall, I think we would have to look at what we've actually said we request, what we've received approval for. A lot of our PRA approval is tied to what's the burden, what are we collecting? So we'd have to make sure we have approval for that type of information. It would require us, I think, to do a little more digging before we could answer it. Further questions, Mr. Mesereau? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I guess my question's for Mr. Witherall regarding the reconsideration or rescinding of the action we took at the last meeting regarding the uh, allocations that aren't compensated. Is there, does it require noticing to do that prior to the meeting or is it something that if this happens in early June that we could take up at staff tasking in the June meeting or if it happens as late as prior to the October meeting, we can take it or do you need to provide notice to the public that we're gonna reconsider it? And um, if so, how long is that? Mr. Chairman and Mr. Hansen can certainly, Dr. Hansen can correct me, but um, uh, my intention would be that if we hear that it, the authority has been signed, for RQE has been signed into law, then I would put it on the agenda as a separate item for possible rescinding previous action. So explain the situation in the action memo as you spelled out in your intent. We would provide links to the documents and the analysis uh, and the council motion. And then it becomes on the table. The question is uh, how much notice is required? Typically we, have about a 21 day notice or so to get it in the federal register, our list of items. Um, it's possible we could list that as a tentative item for the June meeting, um, but I, I don't know uh, if that's, if a rescinding a motion can be done without notice. If, for example, if we get it very close to the meeting and I can't get it in the federal register in time. So I don't know, I'll, I'll have to look to someone else for that. Mr. Chairman. Doctor. From a parliamentary standpoint, you can, you don't have to announce it, but if you do it that way, it takes two thirds vote to get the action done. If you announce it beforehand, uh, then it's a simple majority. So it does have an effect that way. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. Good intel. Okay. Mr. Witherell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that is all the things that we have in the in the staff tasking package for background information. Um, I do have a list of items that I've been uh, writing down as the council has discussed this week, and I can go through those before we get to public comment, if you'd like. Yes. Okay, uh, Mr. Twight indicated uh, uh, that he was interested in 
potentially discussing next steps on outreach and engagement with Alaska Native communities on the AYK. He also mentioned he wanted to discuss the next steps for cultural awareness training. Ms. Baker mentioned a possible comment letter on survey mitigation planning for offshore wind energy relative to the uh, request for comments. Uh, let's see, Ms. Kimball mentioned uh, she had something on the next steps relative to priorities from the reflection on the council process paper. Um, what information maybe to come to explore for further uh, evaluation at a future meeting. Ms. Campbell raised uh, the uh, concern that she was requesting a determination from the agency on whether RQE regulations development uh, would be paid for from the cost recovery funds. And that include, concludes my list of items that you were gonna circle back to and step, maybe it wasn't you, Cora, sorry, in staff tasking, thank you. Ms. Campbell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize if I missed this, but I do think the agency was seeking some um, input from the council about the process for determining whether medical transfers during COVID years uh, would count against people's medical transfer allowance. And, and so I think I would be interested in providing that guidance that they requested as well. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Anybody else wish to flag something? for testimony, Mr. Down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, my, I, my, my comment in our question here might be uh, for consideration for Mr. Witherall, but um, just to the extent that uh, we, we've got Greenland turbot and longline pots issued uh, here for, for October. I, I just noted that on the previous three meeting outlook, the, the tentative was not there. Now it is. And I understand that we've added things to October. And so I'm not looking so much for that clarification, but this, this item is going to be a very, very, uh, um, I, I, I don't expect this will take a lot of time and stuff. It's a, it's a fairly, I don't want to say simple, but there's a straightforward, um, uh, the, the options are going to be pretty straightforward. We don't we need to look at a lot of different alternatives here. Um, and so for that reason, at what point would we look at doing an initial review and a, and a final action in, in one meeting, or is this, does that, does that further delay that? Or I'm just kind of considering what we might do for efficiency for the council for an item like this, the kind of the similar to what we've done with a, with a couple other things. And it just, so I'm just looking for maybe some, uh, some comments on, on that as it best and I'm fine just leaving it alone too, but I wanted to ask the question at least. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Mr. Down. Uh, we added the T because uh, to the agenda item, because the analyst that's working on this agenda item is likely going to be working on the uh, red king crab discussion paper as well. And it, depending on how you provided me feedback on prioritization of that paper. I didn't want to get ahead of ourselves and commit things that uh, we couldn't accomplish. And we typically try to move away from taking initial and final action on any um, action that requires a full analysis, environmental assessment, regulatory impact review, um, because there are issues that come up in the SSC review of that action and the AP review. So it would be two, um, two separate uh, agendas for the council at initial review and then final action. We didn't, again, didn't schedule final action because we, at this point, because we don't know if there's gonna be major revisions or minor revisions or what the other agenda items might be uh, for priority for the next meeting. If that helps, Mr. Schoen. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Witherall. That, that was a, a big help. And I think that's really was the, the nature of my question was more towards kind of what the expectations might be for not just this meeting, but for final action on this item as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Down. Mr. Twight. Thanks, 
Mr. Chair, um, I'd like to rescind, but since it wasn't publicly noticed, it might require a two-thirds majority. But my two flags um, for those two discussion items, uh, hoping to have had some external um, conversations that we just didn't have this week. Um, so my intent would be to work between now and the next council meeting to have those conversations, get together with a couple of the council members, and maybe come in with something more concrete for the June. However, if there are folks who are interested in providing public testimony on their thoughts about next steps for the council on both of those issues, um, I, I'm all ears in, in public testimony, so I'd still welcome that. I think that would be useful, but um, just not far enough along at this point to actually offer anything after public testimony. All right, thank you for that, Mr. Twight. Anything further? Oh, sorry, Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to flag something that uh, arose out uh, following the, the Bristol Bay Ray King Crab motion this morning. Uh, I'd like to have a conversation about potentially scheduling a joint protocol committee meeting uh, to discuss crab issues, as well as some Pacific cod issues uh, that might make sense given the board cycle, board of fisheries cycle. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Okay, I don't see anything further, so um, public comment. We have 17 members of the public signed up to testify. So first up is uh, Bob Alverson, then Paul Clampett, and then Ron Cavanaugh. I'm not seeing Mr. Alverson. So we can go to Paul Clampett. Or it looks like Mr. Alverson's online here, maybe just getting ready to unmute. I, I show him signed in, but, but muted. Is that something that is he unmute or do you? Am I unmute now? Oh, there you are. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and council members. Uh, I'm Bob Alverson from Fishing Vessel Owners Association out of Seattle. And I'll be commenting on two items uh, this afternoon. The first one under your three meeting outlook, you have uh, the release of small sable fish just below the line. And we'd like the council to consider Relooking at that, uh, the association has testified in the past and we hired a company named the Fishwell Consulting out of Australia that uh, looked at uh, the release of small sable fish before on a marketing aspect as well as total numbers. And um, we've, we are also looking, having a study done on, on number of fish to catch and uh, number of spawners. Uh, how the effect of small uh, release uh, addresses each one of those as well. The initial results are very positive on those and they're going looking for someone to uh, peer review or, or review that study, hoping that this could be re-agended for the uh, one of the next three agenda uh, or council meetings. The second uh, issue is has to do with um, a proposal you're going to hear later, Mr. Chairman, from the Central Bering Sea Fishermen's Association to take a, a new look at uh, vessel caps, uh, halibut vessel caps in area four. And we're supportive of what they are proposing. They've given us a copy and I'm going to let them comment later under staff tasking to that issue. But uh, FEOA is supportive of what they're trying to do. That concludes our, our comments, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Alverson. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Paul Clampett. Yes, uh, can you hear me, uh, Chair? Yeah, yes, we can. Good afternoon. Well, thank you very much, Chairman Keenan. My name is Paul Clampett. I'm the president of the Sable Fish and Halibut Pot Association and the member of the Fish and Vessel Owners Association. Our members uh, 
do not agree with some of the conclusions from the National Marine Fishery Service sablefish discard reviews. In particular, the conclusion that by discarding small sablefish, we would be damaging the spawning biomass because we'd be harvesting larger fish that are more productive. And also that our discard mortality rate could be as high as 40%. The Save Fish and Help a Pot Association in par partnership with the Fishing Vessel Owners Association hired Fishwell Consulting to closely examine the National Fishery Service data. We have already presented the first paper that concerned the economics of allowing the discard of sable fish, and the paper clearly showed that it is in our best interest to allow discards in the fishery. The second paper, which has just been completed, focuses on the effect of spawning biomass by allowing discards in the fishery. This paper is currently under review by other fishery experts, and the paper clearly shows that under almost all circumstances, the spawning biomass improves if we allow discards in this fishery. When the Sablefish IFQ program was first developed, one of the goals was to have a fishery that operates with full retention. This was a laudable goal, but what if full retention is actually detrimental to the fishery, both biologically and economically? If full retention is detrimental, then clearly we need to adjust the program. Many fisheries are managed by allowing discards and the Sablefish fishery in all other management areas, except those managed by the National North Pacific Fisheries Management Council, allow discarding. It is true that the prevalence of very small sablefish in the catch has dropped dramatically this year, but recent set line surveys has detected another large year class coming into the fishery, and we do not want to be saddled with having to harvest sablefish that, sablefish that have no value, and we'd be better being discarded so that they can mature and enter the spawning biomass. We are hoping that we have many new large recruitments in the future. Another concern is the possibility of our fishermen having to deal with fines from accidental discards. Small sablefish can easily slip through the scuppers and be reported by an overzealous observer or fall off the hook or slip through a pot that's on camera. We do not want to be at the mercy of an interpretation of the regulation. Our new study shows that this is completely unnecessary for fishermen or enforcement to deal with. In conclusion, we would like the opportunity to present this latest paper to the council and have you reconsider allowing us the ability to discard sablefish of low value. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Clampett. I don't see any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Ron Cavanaugh. Yeah, afternoon. Um, can you hear me there? Uh, yes, we can. Good afternoon. Yeah, uh, afternoon, Council. Um, I just have a couple quick comments. It's concerning the uh, the red king crab mortality rate for the pot fleet, and there's a huge uh, difference between retain or not. Re I'm sorry, but uh, the bycatch mortality on a targeted fishery versus in a Hot cod fishery, and I would request that we do a uh, review paper to try and figure out why that is. I've tried to find out where they came up with these numbers to no avail, um, and nobody really seems to know, and it sounds like these numbers are quite old. Um, so we're, we're going down this road here, which rightfully we should, um, but I would also like some real information that shows what the actual mortality rate really is instead of just some numbers that they've moved around um, that that to me make no sense. Um, I currently don't participate in the Bering Sea fishery, um, crab fishery, but we participate in crab fisheries in the Gulf of Alaska. And, um, you know, we put fish in or crab in the tank for two weeks and have very minimal mortality rate. Um, through um, the pump down, the unload, and everything else. And so these numbers to me that they come up with really make no sense with what's really going on when you're taking a uh, undersized or female crab and putting it directly back overboard and instead of uh, putting it through the holding process on the vessel and then also the unload process. Um, so anyway, um, I would just like to see a review of that. Um, so we have some, you know, some real data because um, we're going down a road here that um, this uh, data can be very detrimental for. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kavanaugh. 
I don't see any questions. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Next up is Hannah Heinbuck. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good afternoon. All right, good afternoon. Uh, for the record again, my name is Hannah Heinbuck, testifying for the under 60 cod harvesters. I just wanted to say uh, thanks very much council members for the thoughtful discussion earlier today about red king crab issues um, and, and the meaningful steps taken there. I particularly appreciate the brief discussion about the potential of addressing crab PSC with rate, time, and area strategies, and just look forward to contributing to those types of recommendations and discussions from the pot sector at the next step of this conversation and, and absolutely intend to be um, contributing to that. In terms of the voluntary actions that we already work on and would plan to talk about in October, Handling practices and reducing discard mortality is a really important part of that. And I think to make that discussion meaningful, it would be important to work, at least work toward updating crab handling mortality rates for maybe for all sectors, but particularly for the pot sector, since those numbers, as you know, we've heard about, are, are quite outdated. Um, you've heard testimony from directed crab and cod fishermen that use pots that feel like those numbers just aren't reflective of the crab survival post-release that as they know it and maybe really inhibiting our understanding of discard impact which is really important to the conversation going forward here so just as a part of this work i'd ask that the council consider ways you might initiate an update to those mortality rates and some better understanding of them uh, maybe that's a request to the plan team to start that process maybe it's an informational paper like we just uh, heard reference that looks at the reason for that discrepancy between the directed crab handling mortality and the crab handling mortality for pot cod and just how those numbers were arrived at and perhaps how they should be arrived at going forward in a future update. I, I think the more recent research available is actually um, from the directed crab fisheries as far as handling mortality. And, and I wonder if we're, while we're waiting for that longer term process, updating the, the handling mortality rates for pot cod, if, if there's just some utility in looking at how information from the directed crab fishery might be useful to even gaining a better understanding of, of actual mortality uh, right now in pot sectors using the same gear type, just uh, recognizing the conversation we're in now. I think that it could, information could be particularly useful as we talk about both voluntary and regulatory measures to reduce crab impact and just where to direct our energy. Um, but I mean, that, that's one option. I think it's certainly possible that, that a most effective step is a, a simple and direct recommendation to the plan team that this is a priority. Uh, however, it most suits the council to do that. I, I think it makes sense that we just make the right next move to initiate an update, understand the difference between those mortality rates, why, you know, why there's such a huge gap between them, and just ensure that these estimates stay up to date and we have the most complete information possible. Thanks very much. Thank you. Are there any questions? I don't see any. Thanks again. Next up is Gretar Goodmanson. Okay. Go to Bernie Burkholder. Heather McCarty. Mr. Chairman, um, I'm Heather McCarty from Central Bering Sea Fishermen's Association, and with me is uh, Jeff Kaufman from CBSFA as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about background regarding our request that's in your packet in the letter, and he's going to talk a little bit about the local conditions um, in the halibut fishery in 4 C and D. Um, just a little bit of um, update. We have put a letter in, it's in your packet, asking for a discussion paper to explore the modification of the vessel IFQ cap regulations for halibut. And we had it for IPHC regulatory areas 4C and 4D. We have since updated that through stakeholder conversations. 
to include that change in regulations for all of regulatory area four, which is for A, B, C, and D. And I wanted to let you know that we've had extensive conversations with halibut stakeholders over the last couple months. We uh, tried to contact everybody to tell them that we were thinking about doing this because of the need we saw in area four. Um, we've spoken to, um, I think, quota holders from every regulatory area, but we've been joined in this by, by 4A and 4B folks whom you will hear from after us. Um, as it says in our letter, the vessel halibut IFQ cap, otherwise known as the vessel cap, is currently specified annually for all halibut management areas as 0.5% of the Alaska coastwide halibut IFQ TAC. And this discussion paper that we're asking for would explore changing that regulation to set the halibut IFQ cap in area four annually as either a percentage, um, four or five, six percent, a range of the combined area four halibut IFQ tax. So in other words, instead of doing it based on the coastwide tax, it would be based on the area four tax, which would more closely um, align that with reality in area four areas, areas four A, B, C, and D. Or another way to do it would be to um, base it on 50% more than the Alaska coastwide vessel cap. This is all pretty complicated and I can answer more of your questions if you have them. Um, we also anticipate that it would be a good idea to have this action reviewed after three to five years to determine whether the conditions that necessitated the action continue to exist. Um, there's a lot of rationale in our letter, which still holds true. And Jeff is now going to speak a little bit to our rationale for asking for this from area 4 C and D. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> members of the council. Uh, it's great to see you all in person. <clears throat> Um, as you all may know, there was a, you know, recently there was a crab or a, a crash in the Bering Sea Opelio snow crab and the Bristol Bay Red King crab fishery was shut down and that has created some um, immediate problems in our community that tie directly to our Albert fishery um, that we prosecute every summer there using the Trident plant. Um, we don't know if there'll be a Bristol Bay Red King crab season this fall. We don't know if there'll be an Opelio season next year. And so we find ourselves in a very difficult and scary position thinking about the possibilities of not having a place to prosecute or a place to process our halibut um, in St. Paul. So we've been in close uh, communication with Trident for uh, the last couple of months. We've been looking at plans for the summer and trying to figure out if it is cost effective to open up the St. Paul plant just for halibut. The, the plant is currently completely shut down. Um, through all of that exercise and looking at the actual costs of opening the plant, uh, with no margin on that for Trident and all just opening the plant uh, for us to be able to prosecute. Uh, the price has nearly doubled since 2019 for a variety of reasons. There's, there's COVID reasons, there's fuel, there's food, there's transportation costs, everything is more expensive and the plant is completely shut down. So just to open up the doors is very costly. So it was recently deemed that it was, cost, it was not cost effective to open up the processing plant in St. Paul and it will not be open this summer. That has us reeling pretty quickly and we have two options sitting in front of us right now. One of those options is that we could use one of our 58 footers as a tendering station in St. Paul, whereby the little boats would fish, they would bring the fish in, Trident would help us with ice and bait. We would load that fish then after the fish ticket is run into the St. Paul, uh, when that boat got full, it would run to Accutan or Dutch Harbor to deliver uh, and then come back into St. Paul and do that again. So that's one of the options that we're looking at. The other immediate option that we're considering right now uh, is uh, basically a walk-on where the captains and the crews from each of the local small boats could make trips to catch their IFQ and to catch their CDQ on, uh, on the St. Peter. And the vessel, the uh, emergency vessel cap waiver that we're anticipating will be implemented soon is the key to allowing us to be able to do that. Um, we're in a tough position and uh, we feel that a permanently increased vessel cap in area four will give our quota holders the flexibility and the best chance of successfully harvesting our IFQ going forward. If there were not a vessel cap waiver in uh, 2021 and 2020, 4C and 4D IFQ would not have been fully allocated. There were many vessels, including ours, that went over the vessel cap over the last two years to fully prosecute that fishery. And last year we achieved a 99% success rate. 
uh, as a vessel manager uh, of a 58 foot halibut boat, I receive calls daily or not daily, but, but every year, numerous phone calls from IFQ holders from around the state and elsewhere, looking for ad, added capacity in area four. And they're looking for us to be able to help them harvest uh, their allocations. Mr. And, Compton, can, can you provide a concluding comment? Um, yeah, I'm gonna let Heather close this up, thanks. Mr. Chairman, I think the key is that we've asked for these emergency waivers. We're not going to be able to do that again. And so we're kind of between a rock and a hard place. We need to initiate an action as soon as possible for a permanent solution to the issue. Okay, thank you both for your testimony. Are there any questions? Ms. Kimball. Thank you, I just had a question about the the clear change of, of moving it to include all of area four, but you also were listing some, what were essentially alternatives, it sounded like. It, are those, am I missing that, Heather? Is that posted somewhere that I haven't seen or could you just repeat those very briefly? Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, um, Ms. Kimball. Yes, we have, recently, you know, working with all these other stakeholders has been kind of hard to put it all together, but, We've agreed on a couple of different options or alternatives to um, deal with the change that we're looking for. The first one would be taking a percentage, either four, five, or six, or it could be other percentages of the combined area four halibut IFQ tax. In other words, rather than doing it based on the coastwide tax. And then the second option could be 50% more, or it could be 100% more, a certain percentage more for area four than the Alaska coastwide vessel cap. In other words, if the coastwide vessel cap was computed to be 100,000 pounds, you would take 50% more than that that would be allowable um, in area four. Mr. Twight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. McCarty, uh, recognizing that the words as quickly as possible might as well be a foreign language here. Um, I'm wondering why you're suggesting that we need to start with a discussion paper. And I, I, I guess what I was hearing was um, that maybe you need some help um, crafting what those initial alternatives for analysis might look like because you don't have a clear feel of where in the range of, of reworked um, percentages you'd want to fall. Is that the um, is that kind of the hold back from just going straight uh, um, straight to um, a request for an analysis? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Twight, no, we've done all the numbers. Um, we've got a pretty good numbers guy, as you know, in in Ray Melavidov. Um, we know exactly what those percentages would result in as the vessel cap for area four. We can provide all of that. Um, I think those would probably be um, the alternatives that we would like to see, but we didn't wanna to be too presumptuous and sort of lay out an entire program for the council without getting a feel for whether the council was willing to go down this road and just exactly how far and for how long so I guess that's the best answer I have. I guess, Jeff, you might speak to that. Do you speak? Yeah, we, sure, we can start with an analysis. That'd be great. We can provide that. But we assumed that a discussion paper would be so, sort of more normal protocol, I guess. Thanks, yeah. that, that's helpful. I, I wasn't suggesting it. I was just trying to okay. get it figured out. I think you know what you need better than, than I certainly I do at this point. Mr. Chairman, if I could, as Jeff mentioned, there is this um, vessel cap waiver, which completely removes a vessel cap in the Bering Sea that we expect to have um, final rule on in probably a couple of weeks. Um, speaking to the NIMS folks recently, that final rule will be in effect for the rest of 2022. But in order to deal with our issue after that's gone, you know, we need to have something at least initiated to ask for an extension of that waiver until a permanent action gets put in place. And so we've, you know, 
that's why we decided to start it now because we feel that it's kind of imperative that we get that in started as soon as we can so we have a permanent solution we've been told and uh, you know by the national Marine fishery service that we can't keep doing these emergency actions not under the criteria they currently have mr Mizero. thank you mr chairman um thank you guys for coming up with this i have a couple of questions. I guess my first question is that we've heard from you during the entire ABM action for close to seven years that the small boat fleet in St. Paul needs to go fishing. It's part of their cultural identity. I've been there before and it is. You were not lying. You were telling the truth. How does this square with your small boat fleet that lives for this opportunity to fish every spring if they're not going to get to go fishing? Have you discussed it with all your local fishermen? I guess just if you could talk a little bit more about that, that that's my one, one of my hesitations about what you're proposing. Yeah, thank you uh, for that, Mr. Mazzaro, through the chair. Um, we have very close contact with our, uh, with our local small boat fleet, and we've had several meetings with them as, as of late, trying to figure out a fish plan for this coming summer and looking at the costs and the potential options uh, that we have. This is not an easy pill for us to swallow. Uh, those people are fishermen and they should be out fishing and earning their living from the bottom of the ocean. The, the situation is currently not conducive to allowing us to do that. So we just don't have uh, a lot of choices. So I can tell you a couple things that we're looking at currently to right the ship. And uh, one of the first things that we're doing is we just finished a, <clears throat> excuse me, a multi-million dollar uh, uh, vessel repair center in the community to service the small boats. And our bay <clears throat> is 80 feet by 100 feet. We could put six smaller 32 footers back to back in that shop and, and work on them. We'll be doing that throughout the winter to get those boats back up and running as they've been sitting idle for a little while. Um, and so we have that vessel repair center uh, that will, will help us. The other thing that we have is, a, is um, we're looking at options going forward. And one of them is we're gonna have a meeting next week with the Village Corporation in St. Paul to see if we can get a piece of property down by the Harbor area whereby we can build a purpose-built uh, kind of a lean, mean uh, halibut machine. It, it's, it doesn't, that tri the Trident plant is just simply too big and too ineffective for what it's doing. And if we put the building in a proper place, then we can use waste heat. And so we're looking at some of those uh, windmill power, some of those things to help for that. So we're, we're looking at uh, doing that. Uh, the other options that we're currently looking at are to put a barge to build a processing plant on top of a barge that we can then tie up against the dock in St. Paul to act as a buying station at the end of the season, we could pull it up on the beach. So that's one option. Another a third option kind of came about this morning where there is a catcher processor that is for sale that has some 500,000 pounds of freezing capacity. Um, and so that's an idea that I think we'll explore a, a little bit further. Um, is to see if, if that maybe is a better option. But simply opening up the Trident plant, we find at this point is cost prohibitive. Uh, I would just also say that um, uh, we, we are encouraging, our, our, our fleet is aging out as well. There's a lot of us that are getting older. And, and so we have a boat loan program. Uh, we have an IFQ loan program and nobody's really used it because of the instability in the fishery and having been nearly shut down four out of eight years and those types of things. With the newfound stability that we expect to see through uh, the ABM action, we are trying to motivate young people through training, through uh, we can provide grants, we can help build boats or buy boats and, uh, and, and we have quota loan programs as well. Um, and so it is our full intention to get this fishery back up and going. And it is, it reflects on us as a bit of a failure that this is actually happening. This is, this is not acceptable what's happening and our, our people are not happy about it. They want to go fishing, but what do we do in this situation? And we hung our hat for so long on the Trident plant. And uh, maybe that was a mistake, but again, we never anticipated uh, the collapse of the Opelio fishery and the collapse of the Bristol King crab fishery, which could have uh, could close that plant down for good potentially, and because it won't be open for king crab, which typically help it go straight into the king crab season, that helps to absorb some of the costs of the startup and stuff. We don't have that on the backside this year, so those costs all have to be borne uh, by the by CBSFA and and Trident will do it for free, uh, or I shouldn't say that they'll do it at cost, but whatever that actual cost is is what we have to pay, and that cost is is very very significant this year, given given the circumstances. Sure. Thank you, Jeff. That, that's really helpful. I just wanted to make sure that this action wasn't set up to reduce opportunity in the future for those people that make a living on the water and 
uh, it wasn't solely for consolidating their fish onto the other boats because it seemed in my experience that those people valued the opportunity to go fishing even though some of their boats definitely could use a bay to get cleaned up and fixed in before they go out in the middle of the ocean so thank you mr chairman may i add something to mr mesero's question yes i just wanted to reiterate since i was talking pretty fast at the beginning that we that's why we're asking that or suggesting that whatever action is taken would be reviewed at a certain point in the future so that it could be determined whether those conditions both of harvesting capacity and processing capacity are back up to snuff so that we could continue to do what we've been doing so thank you mr mr jensen thank you mr <clears throat> thank you mr chair i just curious how many pounds of halibut are you talking about out there that would normally get delivered to Trident and, and the Pribiloffs? So this year we actually received a, uh, uh, a decent increase on a, on a low quota. So I think we took a 23% increase uh, in our allocation uh, in 22 over 21. So that, that's, that's a change there. So what we're looking at uh, just between CBSFA, CDQ and our locally held IFQ, uh, we're, we're talking 550,000 pounds of halibut. That does not include St. George's halibut. That does not include uh, outside IFQ halibut or otherwise. That is just simply uh, the halibut that is held by the CDQ group and the local IFQ holders in St. Paul. So half, it's 550,000 pounds. Thank you. That's impressive. Thanks. Further questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, next up is Brendan Raymond Yakubian. Oh, hello again, council members. Uh, I think I'm unmuted now. Yes. Um, oh, thank you. Um, for the record, uh, again, my name is Brendan Raymond Yakubian, and I'm testifying on behalf of Coer Inc., the Alaska Native Nonprofit Tribal Consortium for the 20 federally recognized tribes of the Bering Strait region. Um, we'd like to provide brief comment um, with regard to discussions that arose earlier in B reports and were flagged for staff tasking, as well as the, the council process changes issue, um, which I believe uh, came up as well earlier in B reports. Um, with regard to the, the former, um, we wanted to commend council members and staff who have been engaged with tribal issues, including the first Alaskans training and the Tanana Chiefs Conference event. Um, we also wholeheartedly endorse the comments made earlier during the reports about seeing these as a point to build off of rather than an endpoint. Um, at this juncture, we don't have many specific recommendations with regard to that, but look forward to hearing any council brainstorming on that and could provide more structured feedback based on that at a future meeting. Um, so for now, we would just offer a few thoughts. Um, first, we'd encourage the support of the no steps back approach that staff mentioned a while ago. Um, as well as the excellent work being done with regard to inclusivity and broadening the knowledge base, something which has been worked on in a variety of um, your bodies, including um, the LKTKS task force and the climate change task force, um, the ecosystem committee and the community engagement committee as well. Um, and we'd also encourage the council to continue to work on implementing the ideas forwarded to the council and the, the CECs report and, um, and applaud your work on doing that so far. And um, lastly, for now, we would just encourage council members and staff to um, engage with tribal entities in as many ways as possible to uh, continue to build relationships and exchange knowledge. And um, very quickly, with regard to any ongoing discussions you may have about council process changes, changes <clears throat> we just note that uh, we would note the comments that we provided at the last meeting and suggest the council consider those as potential ideas uh, moving forward. And we applaud some of the work that has been done in the interim since the last meeting to this effect. And two items we would just briefly highlight again for your future consideration would be adding additional non-economic social science expertise to the SSC and reflecting on how a reorganization, um, any reorganization steps could be um, seen as an opportunity to improve diversity and equity and representation on council bodies. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you for your testimony. 
don't see any questions. Thanks again. Okay, next up is John Moeller. How about now, Mr. Chairman? We got you, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. Uh, for the record, my name is John Moeller and I'm speaking today on behalf of ADAC Community Development Corporation. ACDC supports CBSA FA's proposal and requests that 4B be included in any discussions or actions the council may take on revising the vessel cap regulation in area four. As we've testified before, uh, Mr. Chairman, the closest fish plant uh, to ADAC is 400 miles away. Area 4B vessel costs and logistics to remove fish from the water in the Aleutians is extremely challenging and, a ves and vessel avail availability is scarce. Even when we place local residents on a vessel, the cap is restraining coupled with a lack of interested vessels, which ultimately uh, strands fish. The council's recent action to waive the residency waiver will be helpful, but the vessel caps have impeded removing fish from the water. This is largely a reflection of logistics and the lack of a processor in Aleutians, as well as vessel availability. ACDCIFQ is bound to the current vessel caps and we ask the council consider an increase in the vessel caps for all of area four. That'll conclude my uh, testimony today, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm available for any question you may have. Great, thank you, Mr. Muller. Don't see any questions. Thank you for your test. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next up is Corey Lesher. Good afternoon, um, Chairman Kaneen and members of, members of the council. For the record, my name is Corey Lesher um, with Alaska Bering Sea Crabbers, a trade association representing independent crab harvesters who commercially fish for King, Snow, and Baird Eye crab with pot gear in the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands crab rationalization program. Um, first off, I would just like to acknowledge that it's great to be here in person again and, and see all of you guys um, and really appreciate the, the efforts over the last two years to continue the council um, throughout the pandemic. Um, at this meeting under agenda item D1 on the um, Bristol Bay Red King Crab discussion paper, you heard some testifiers uh, and council discussion about whether aspects of helping to rebuild the Red King Crab belonged under essential fish habitat um, versus under the D1 agenda item. Um, ABSC appreciates those comments and, um, and I'm here under staff tasking to remind the council of repeated asks from our industry um, in 2021 and 2022 to address aspects of EFH for crab, um, many of which have been repeated asks um, and highlighted by the scientists since 2012, um, just 10 years ago. Those, are, uh, those asks are important to address and even more pressing now given the status of several of our Bering Sea crab stocks. Starting a year ago, Alaska Bering Sea crabbers ask that you address these issues in the upcoming EFH five-year review. Um, and we're asking again here under staff tasking, given the dialogue that we just heard um, through agenda item D1 at this meeting. The lack of recent EFH related management actions for crab based on known and new information requires attention. The council was alerted in October of 2021 that snow crabs overfished and Bristol Bay Red King crab is at a level of serious conservation concern. Given that and given the EF, that EFH um, work since 2012 that flagged several concerns and protections for Eastern Bering Sea crab stocks uh, have not yet been addressed through management action, we recommend that the council prioritize these EFH considerations for crab. Uh, it's imperative to update information that has become available through research since the 2017 EFH review and to incorporate new sources of available information or potential partnerships for outside data collection, including updates on the recommendations from the 2012 discussion paper 
on Bristol Bay red king crab essential fish habitat and on the importance of fishing impacts on localized areas flagged in the previous fishing effects model work. We're aware of some parts of this uh, through the BSFRF and other research efforts um, that we are attentive to, but council efforts to focus this in a meaningful way, way for our crab stocks um, in the EFH update are critical. Um, we've spoken to this before, um, but uh, more specifically, what we're re recommending is to provide an update on progress of the recommendations from the crab plan team following the 2012 discussion paper on bread king crab essential fish habitat. Address previous um, EFH work and crab plan team recommendations on the importance of fishing impacts in localized areas where the fishing effects model noted that future efforts after 2017 needed to assess the importance of smaller local habitat scales on overall stock health, especially when you have localized areas showing greater than 50% habitat reduction from fishing effects on red king crab, such as in Southwest Bristol Bay. Um, the fishing effects model and uh, EFH description should also be incorporating crab maturity data and apply these crab maturity data to inform life stage species specific distribution models um, and include uh, providing maturity dependent spatio um, temporal descriptions and maps of crab specific critical habitat. Um, if you'd like any more information um, about our asks, you can look at our um, our letters at SSC in February of this year under agenda item D5 and, and our letter uh, to the council in April of last year under agenda item B3. Uh, in closing, Alaska Bering Sea Crabbers once again recommends that updates for the Bering Sea Aleutian Island crab stocks be a high priority for this upcoming EFH review given the conservation concern and overfish status of many of our stocks. The next EFH review should include information to inform uh, spatiotemporal management for each life stage of crab, identification of critical areas for these different life stages of crab specific EFH conservation, and a higher resolution of spatial and fishery specific impacts by gear type on essential fish habitat. And that concludes uh, our request. Thank you, Mr. Lesher. Any questions? Okay, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Leonard Herzog. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, members of the council, it's nice to see everybody in person after a while. Um, my name is Lenny Herzog, and I'm here representing um, a halibut group called Area 4 Concerned Halibut. Uh, we, we work at the IPHC, and I also am involved in ownership of vessels that, that work out in the Aleutians. Um, I'm here to support um, CBSFA and John Muller's um, push to get the vessel caps um, expanded out in the area four. And um, I'd like to talk a little bit specifically about 4B in addition to John Muller's comments. You know, we're, there, there hasn't been processing capacity in either ATCA or in ADAC for a number of years. And, and we, and along with the Pitka, who's, we harvest a lot of their crab for them, um, have been struggling really hard you know, we've tried tendering in the past before um, COVID and high high expenses. We tried um, transiting for the local ATCA people to get their crab to ADAC, but that's no longer a possibility. And we're struggling to try to keep harvesting, you know, those groups um, halibut at the same time that we harvest our own. And with even with the um, lack of caps, um, the last two years by emergency action, we've still left over 35% of the halibut in area 4B unharvested and 15% of the halibut in 4 alpha um, unharvested. Um, our boats transit um, fish in 4D and travel through 4A to get there to 4C and D. 
and they need the leeway in four alpha also because the boats are using combined trips in those areas. Similarly, we're fishing four alpha and four bravo at the same time and doing the same for some of the CDQ groups which own four alpha quota. Um, I support the idea of looking at this again in three or five years because I think as the agency pointed out, um, the issue of COVID being an emergency um, can only last for so long. And although COVID is affecting our ability to fish and affected us really hard last year, we couldn't hardly crew our boats and are having a lot of trouble um, working. Um, it's, it's apparent from the agency that, that this is not something we can call an emergency every year, but until we get processing capacity out in area four, we have a kind of a semi-permanent situation. And I'm hopeful that the efforts that people have to get capacity out there is good, but there's nothing that the local ATCA fishermen can do now to fish when they have to return their fish to Dutch Harbor. Um, we've, um, Heather opened up a group that met several times and it was an open invitation to industry to participate. And I believe I could fairly say that some of the folks in Southeast and, and um, area three are very preoccupied with the importance of uh, boots on board and opportunities for new vessels and everything. And so by limiting this to area four, um, it, I think that most of those people understand the tension that we have with lack of processing capacity and the inability of their small fishermen to be able to come out and work. And there was a group of 4A people, second generation people that were saying that, hey, we need a cap. We need to some relief from the cap so that we can try to fish additional um, 4A quota, you know, that they would like to purchase on their boats, but their boats are capped. So in summary, I'd just like to follow up with them. And I think it would be a great idea to start with a discussion paper now. We, we do have an emergency action that will get us through this season, but we're gonna need help in uh, the coming season. Um, and I know that, well, you'll hear from one of the other CDQ groups coming up that, that the CDQ groups, are, CDQ groups and quota holders are having a really hard time finding existing vessels that can catch their cap, that can get their quota caught. And if, if we're limited by, uh, by the lower caps in the Gulf, we won't be able to help other people also. And we'll have to say no when we get the phone calls saying, can you help harvest? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Herzog. Are there any questions? All right, thanks again. Landry Price. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and council members. Uh, for the record, my name is Landry Price. Uh, I'm here representing Yukon Delta Fisheries Development Association, otherwise known as YDFDA. Uh, we're one of the six community development quota nonprofit organizations. Uh, we represent six villages along the lower Yukon River and are involved in a wide uh, variety of fisheries, one of which is IFQ halibut in area four, alpha, bravo, and delta. As you've already heard in oral testimony from other concerned groups, uh, YDFDA supports to have the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council initiate an action to modify the vessel use caps in regulatory area for A, B, D, as well as C, although we're, we personally do not have a quota in Charlie. In YDFDA's particular situation, uh, we do not own a vessel currently that can go out and harvest our quota. Therefore, we are reliant on lease arrangements with independent vessels to have our halibut pounds harvested. As CBSFA and Area 4 concerned halibut fishermen clearly laid out in their earlier comments and oral testimonies, a modification to the vessel cap is needed in order to keep 
quota from being stranded. With that being said, without the prior two years IFQ vessel use cap waivers, YDFGA would have most likely had left some, if not all of its IFQ halibut in the water due to the vessel cap issue and the lack of harvesting capacity. To add to that point, I consider ourselves lucky to have strong partner relationships that have helped us get our quota caught, but I know there are others that have struggled and are not as fortunate. I would reference you to table 2.1 on page three of the IFQ report to the fleet. Um, you can clearly see in, in 2021, uh, the percentage of, of IFQ that was not harvested and I'm, I'll just list in 21 for alpha, 14% of the quota was, was left in the water and, and for Bravo out West, 37% was left in the water. Having this quota left in the water for YDFGA uh, would be a detriment to the funding that we provide to our in-region programs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this matter. Thank you, Mr. Price. Mr. Mizra has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for bringing this to our attention as well. Mr. Price, what did you do? Um, were you able to successfully harvest your quota shares prior to COVID, the year prior and the year prior to that? Were you able to catch it all or did you have to strand fish um, back then too? Uh, this, through the chair, thank you, Mr. Mesro, for the question. Um, we have left uh, small amounts uh, specifically in, in for alpha uh, uh, in the water, um, but it has been a struggle down to the end of the season, um, not knowing whether uh, we'd have it all harvested or not. Um, every year it seems like, you know, it, there's a good chance, but it, it, it seems like it ends up um, coming down to the line at the end of the season, whether we're going to get it out of the water. Any further questions? Thank you, Mr. Price. Thank you. Okay, so next up is Chad C. Hi, uh, welcome back. <laughs> Thanks for uh, <clears throat> the opportunity to speak here today. Um, my name is Chad C. I'm the executive director of the Freezer Long Lane Coalition. Uh, I'd like to briefly comment on two matters under the staff tasking agenda item. Uh, first, I wanted to speak to scheduling of the Greenland Turbid Long Lane Pots initial review. Um, council will recall that the Long Lane Pots discussion paper was taken up in February, after which the council voted unanimously to move it forward for initial review. Uh, we greatly appreciate the council's action on this matter and for placing the initial review on the calendar for the October meeting. Uh, the matter, this is a matter of real importance for our members who have historically participated in the Greenland Tribut uh, longline fishery. We did notice though that the light, latest draft uh, did, uh, of the three meeting outlook did note that consideration of the meeting uh, of the initial review as tentative for consideration in October. Uh, we respect, certainly respect the need to ensure staff and agenda time to be take to uh, be focused on those matters that are most pressing for council uh, relative to other matters uh, on your plate. Uh, this is a relatively minor issue, uh, and we understand that. Um, that said, given the discussion in February, we do expect that this would be a, a relatively straightforward matter that would take a limited amount of time uh, <clears throat> on the council's agenda and, and of, of council staff resources. Um, importantly for us, the timing of this council uh, action <clears throat> on this issue is critical to help us to facilitate uh, the allowance of longland pots in the Greenland tribut fishery as soon as possible. <clears throat> as it is, we don't expect that we will be able to utilize longland pots in the fishery in 2023, uh, given the implementation of, of any new regulation uh, that would take about a year after final action. Uh, this would mean that we'd also, of course, not have 2022 uh, uh, for our fishery as well. And so we'll have missed two, two years as it is uh, with, before we get to final action on this issue. So we hope, we're hoping that council uh, can find time on the October meeting 
to ensure that we have enough buffer uh, to get through final action and implementation for uh, on this action so we can uh, comfortably be able to be have a full season in 2024 for this fishery. Uh, so we just ask for that consideration as you move ahead with that issue. Uh, second, I did want to express the support for uh, Ms. Baker's suggestion earlier uh, this afternoon uh, to have a <clears throat> joint protocol meeting uh, for on crab and, and Pacific cod issues between the Board of Fish and, and, the, and the Council. Um, given the many discussions on, on the health and status of both of these stocks um, be, uh, between uh, around the Council and uh, with stakeholders, I, we believe that would be a good use of time for the Council, the state, and industry stakeholders to, to have that meeting. So I appreciate that, that consideration. Uh, thanks for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. C. Any questions? Thanks again. Thanks. Patty O'Donnell. Uh, good evening. Uh, Patty O'Donnell. F. E. Caraval out of Kodiak. So uh, I'd like to talk today about uh, this evening about B1 Agenda item Executive Committee report on ideas uh, for process change. So a couple of items, just uh, number two, create a schedule that makes one to two meetings per year virtual and uh, remain in person. So uh, I think it'd be a good idea to maintain public access to the meetings for both AP and the council with uh, the continuation of virtual to all meetings in the calendar year, as well as in person. We had uh, participation in Kodiak from uh, people I know at the AP meeting this go around that uh, if we did not have that virtual connection, uh, they would otherwise not be able to attend that meeting. And I think it was very important. And, and for some of them, this was their first time participating participating in an AP meeting because uh, some of them have kids, school and what have you. And, and, and even if the meeting is in Kodiak, have challenges attending. So item number nine, the nomination reappointment process for the advisory panel, uh, time and qualification and term length. I think it's important as I well know, uh, based on my experience to maintain a three year term length and uh, with an opportunity to fill that one year seat based on whatever you know agenda item comes up and requires maybe expertise in that particular issue. So I think that's uh, very, very important. I just wanna flag that. And then uh, on their new ideas at the bottom, as far as bullet number three to explore opportunities for joint sessions with the council, SSC and AP, uh, I think that would be beneficial and a good approach to take on, on some of the agenda items. I think it could possibly lead to a more professional approach from the AP in the decision-making process and, and, and you know, move, move in the direction of a science-based approach and data and information put forward uh, by staff. So that's all I have on that. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Mesereau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Patty, for your testimony. I just wanted to clarify what you were saying in the very beginning about the virtual meetings. So you were saying that you felt like the hybrid thing that we're doing now allows for more remote participation from residents of Kodiak and you were supportive of having that online presence be available at subsequent meetings. Is that the gist of that? Or were you suggesting that the virtual meetings were a better idea? Uh, through the chair, thank you, Mr. Besser. What, I, what I'm suggesting is uh, not to, uh, to, to keep it as it is at this meeting, a hybrid meeting, but to keep that approach for all meetings. And, and, and based on the information I got back at this meeting, it, 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 it was uh, to the positive based on the fact that people who normally can't participate, in, especially at the AP, they can participate at the council because there's audio available. But at the AP, they've never been able to participate in the past, but this meeting here, they had that opportunity which they've never had before. That's what I'm trying to get at. Thank you, that was helpful. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, thank you, Patty. You're one of the only folks so far verbally testifying on that. So I'm gonna ask you something if it's out of bounds, let me know. But, um, but one of the um, 
trade-offs that we've had in the paper is with with keeping the hybrid type meeting like you just suggested we do is the ability to also meet in remote Alaska communities they're not even that remote but they're just communities in Alaska that don't have great internet um, so I'm wondering for you you're from Kodiak how do we balance that that trade-off if we can only meet in a remote community, but we can't do the hybrid portion of the meeting versus do we continue to meet in places like Anchorage where we can support that, but we never get out to other communities. Do you have thoughts on that? We don't, we haven't had a lot of testimony on this point. Yeah, thank you through the chair, Ms. Kimball. I do have thoughts on that. I have two satellite systems on my boat, neither, neither one are working right now. And, and that's just life and technology and, and, and electronics as we know it in the same, with uh, internet and we have challenges in Kodiak with internet. Uh, I think you're gonna run into that issue, but I mean, you're, you're not gonna check the box 100% of the time, but for the best part, it, it can be accomplished between 80 and 100% of the time. So I, I, I think keeping that opportunity to have a uh, virtual, you may face challenges and, and at that time, well, you know, sorry, we don't have the, connectivity to accomplish this and you just take that approach. Patty, can I, in follow up, can I interpret that to mean that you still would prioritize us continuing to meet in places like Kodiak and Sitka and Homer that that's the highest priority even if we couldn't possibly have a remote meeting in those particular circumstances? Uh, thank you through the chair, Ms. Kimball. Yes, I think it's important, of course, to meet in communities and, and, and what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at, if, if, if it's available to do virtual, then you should keep that opportunity. You should not limit it to two meetings a year. I, I think if it's feasible to do and connectivity is there, then take that approach. If it's not, then so be it, but continue to meet in remote com communities, yes. Further questions? Mr. Marks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Mr. O'Donnell. And, and just confirm you're, you're talking about uh, public access by the public to provide testimony and, and then also uh, in your thoughts on, on the uh, AP and, and Science Committee. Thank you through the chair. I, I Yes, that's the approach I think uh, in, in moving ahead with this. I, I, I think we can get people involved that would not have had the opportunity either at, at the SSC or the AP to participate or give public testimony. And I mean, with the exception of the sound system, <clears throat> excuse me, at the AP, it's pretty good in here, but uh, the AP, we need to get speakers moving. The speakers are pointed that way, but we need to get speakers moving, pointed forward so that the AP panel can hear. That was the only challenges that I felt that we had and I heard from other AP members this go around, but uh, it does give people opportunity to testify that otherwise might not. And, and, and then of course, there's the intimidation factor, which uh, you know I went through in my early days here in, in sitting before the council, on the telephone, it is in fact a lot easier uh, to get up there and speak rather than sit before a body like this and and and, and not feel intimidated. Any further questions? Thank you, Rebecca Skinner. Good afternoon, Rebecca Skinner with Alaska. Not sure if I should keep talking. <laughs> All right, Rebecca Skinner with Alaska Whitefish Trawlers Association. Um, I'm just going to speak to two things. Um, the first is the ideas for a process change, and then the second was a, 
a brief comment on the um, joint protocol committee. I'm, I think, going to repeat um, a lot of what um, Patty O'Donnell just spoke to um, as far as uh, potentially changing the, the process or meeting um, set up for the council and the advisory committees meetings. As far as having um, four meetings versus five meetings a year, I think that four meetings um, can work. And I, I do think the February meeting does tend to be pretty close in time to the, uh, to the December meeting. I do think there's opportunities um, to maybe save some time or gain some efficiencies uh, with the, the B reports. I wasn't able to listen to B reports this time. I'm not sure if everything went back to verbal reports or if some of those were still given in writing. But I think exploring opportunities um, like that, so the information is provided, but it's not necessarily presented during the meeting. On the other hand, I think that there are some B report items that would be helpful for the AP to hear. Um, for one example is actually the item about ideas for process change that wasn't um, presented to the AP prior to the last opportunity for, for public comment sign up. So something like that, where the, the council was able to hear about that during B reports and the AP got it at the, the very, very end of the meeting. Um, I think that, I, I actually think the idea of virtual meetings should still be explored. Um, I know that a lot of people don't um, care for the virtual meeting option, but I think that it, it is a tool. It's a very, can be a very helpful tool. So I'd hate to take that completely off the table. And I do think that the broadcasting, the AP meetings and the SSC meetings, in addition to the council and also allowing for public comment um, via virtual, if it's through Zoom or, or via telephone is very important. And um, Patty talked about the fact that uh, for at least AWTA, we have members that were able to listen to AP meetings um, during this meeting that have never been able to do that because it, it is ex quite expensive and a lot of time to travel um, from Kodiak to council meetings. And so having that broadcast ability really does improve participation. As far as... Um, a AP appointments, I feel pretty strongly that the term should be kept at three years. My experience on other boards and committees is that there's usually a pretty steep learning curve to be effective. And I think if you limit that to one year, it's gonna be really challenging for um, people to, 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 to be effective because it just takes time to learn the process, learn the information and learn the players. And I think the idea of doing the call for nominations for AP appointments sooner to give more opportunity if council members do want to interact with potential um, candidates, I think that could be very helpful. And then my last point on this, I really like the idea of um, having discussion about multi-year council strategic priorities. Um, this is something in my mind that um, Ms. Baker has kind of done in the past where she's listed the state priorities. Um, so at least we have a, a sense of, of what the state is prioritizing and what's important to them. And I think that'd be really helpful at the council level so that the public has an idea what to expect. And we have an idea if we wanna bring an item forward, how likely it is to be taken up. And then finally, I. Um, Greatly support the idea with the Joint Protocol Committee uh, meeting to discuss crab and cod management issues. Um, that's all I had. I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Ms. Skinner. Not seeing any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Next up is Ephraim Freilich. Hi, am I coming in loud and clear? Yes, you are. Good afternoon. 
Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman and members of the Council. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. On behalf of the Independent Pot Cod Harvesters, uh, we're a trade organization for the over 60 CV Pot Cod Fleet. Uh, today, I want to update the Council um, on IPCH's recent work toward finding cooperative solutions within our sector, efforts to address bycatch, and ongoing communications with other participants in the sector. Um, since the last time we testified in front of the Council in February, our membership has continued to grow. We are in process of a permit survey to get exact numbers, uh, but informally at our last meeting, our count was about 21 permits out of the 50 in the fishery. Um, and that's up from nine permits in 2020 at our group's formation. Uh, our growth, at least I believe, stems from a willingness to communicate openly about a vision for the future of the fishery, focusing in specifically on our core values, our core founding values of equity and access. Uh, most members of our group, as we have testified before, also participate in Bering Sea crab fisheries. Um, and we are actively interested in the health of crab stocks. Um, we have skin in the game. Uh, our group refrained from fishing in the Red King Crab Savings Area this past season, and we actively participate in area avoidance. We participate in hotspot reporting and are transitioning away from older types of fishing gear to newer gear types that we volunteered to test with the BREP grant to reduce bycatch. Uh, the, the over 60 CV pot cod sector is proactively making efforts to fish clean and be helpful to other stakeholders. And we are committed to continue that work and we're committed to being good actors and good partners. Um, based on our experiences so far over the course of the 2022 A season, members of our group are currently circulating a letter to others in the sector to voluntarily, to voluntarily expand the Red King Crab Savings Area significantly for the 2022 B season and potentially beyond. Uh, we believe it is necessary that we lead by example in our sector, particularly as crab, uh, as crab and cod fishermen, by taking additional voluntary steps to rebuild uh, our stocks. Um, IPCH does not oppose rationalization. Um, however, we do not believe it is the solution to today's bycatch issues. Um, we, we believe we need those solutions today um, and rationalization is potentially a long process um, and we are focused on resolution in the short term. Uh, to that end, we have been actively participating in discussions with the other POTCOD group to reach common ground um, around, uh, you know, uh, cooperative work we can be doing as well as ra future rationalization. Um, we have been making steady progress forward in these conversations and negotiations and believe there is a path forward to coalesce around policy priorities for the sector at large. For this reason, we continue to ask the Council to allow the sector to come together before entering into a rationalization process as both primary groups have committed to doing uh, over the past year. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Freilich. Are there any questions? Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Freilich. Um, the request from the independent pot cod harvesters um, sounds a lot like the request of last meeting and really, to be brutal, the request from the meeting before that. Um, I'm wondering what your sense is of, of at what point should, or let me rephrase that, why should the council continue to um, be patient with this and wait? Uh, through the chair, uh, Mr. Twight, thank you for the question. You know, I think we've been making significant, significant progress that we've been updating uh, the council on. Um, like I mentioned before, the, the sector is in flux, right? We have our membership has over doubled um, in the independent pot cod harvesters. And we are coalescing around commonalities with the other group, as well as, you know, internally we have uh, proposals that are developing. So I think it's exciting things that the council is getting to witness right now. Um, and we are putting together, you know, partnerships and a path forward. So I would wait for it rather than cut it short because it hasn't been very long in our opinion. Any further questions, Mr. Mesero? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Falk. I, my question for you is, when we're hearing from your group and we're hearing from the other group, does that encompass 100% of the permit holders or are there still some outliers that are not a part of either group that um, we're not hearing from in this? Because we're probably getting a little closer to looking at rationalization than we were before. And I just 
it would be unfortunate if there are some outliers that aren't involved in the conversation uh, between your two groups. Uh, through the chair. Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Mesro. We're, we're currently trying to do a permit survey right now, uh, uh, like I mentioned in my testimony. So um, and I don't have a definitive answer for you, but I think we are the vast majority uh, getting close to all, but I, I, I can't with confidence say that we are, that between the two groups, that is every permit. I, I believe the, the universe is about 50 permits. Um, and yeah, I think we're almost there, but I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Don't see any further questions. Thank you, Mr. Freilich. Lance Farr. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and members of the council, my name is Lance Farr. I'll be quick. Um, I don't have much here. Um, <clears throat> we've been fishing pod cod since 1988. We were one of the first boats to start this fishery and, and have fished every year since. Um, <clears throat> my ask today is I ask the council to reevaluate the discard mortality rate in the king crab fishery, um, in, not in the king crab fishery, in the king crab pot. It, let me start over. The council re reevaluate the discard mortality rate in the pot cod fishery on king crab. Um, same boats, same crew, same deck uh, configurations. Um, we, we dump the crab and if we get crab in cod it, in the, um, <clears throat> the table, slides out over the side on our discard chutes. Um, and uh, in the pot cod uh, fishery, the discard or the the mortality rate is 50%. And in the pot and directed uh, pot, you know, directed pot king crab fishery, um, it's 20%. So we don't know why the discrepancy is there. So we would like the council to look at that and uh, reevaluate uh, the 50%. That's it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Farr. Any questions? Thanks for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, that brings us through our list. I'll circle back to those that we missed. Um, uh, Gretar Goodmanson. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. Uh, I was a uh, short testimony also. Um, I would like to concur with Lancer and I, Apologize, I didn't hear the first part of the meeting. I think someone else spoke to spoke to the DMRs in in our pot fishery, and and uh, I think it's been a long time since we've looked at it. But I think they need to be reevaluated, and uh, I would like to uh, uh, put my voice in for for that. If they could please look at that again and and see what that information entails and what the study was in the past. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Go yeah. Mr. Goodmanson. Any questions? Okay, I don't see any. Thanks again. Thank you. Um, Bernie Burkholder. Yes, she does. She does. Okay, if Mr. Burkholder isn't joining us, then that will conclude public comment. Um, let's break for 10 minutes and come back and, uh, and send it home here. So, uh, just before 4.55. Council, please come back to order. Okay, we are ready to take action on our E items. Um, so, Ms. Baker indicated an interest in addressing offshore wind water. Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll 
try to be fairly brief, but I just wanted to provide a little bit of context for the council and the public in case you have not had a chance uh, to review the NOAA Fisheries and BOEM Federal Survey Mitigation Implementation Strategy. And the document is, is fairly clear uh, that, that the plan that they're seeking, the joint agencies are seeking comments on are for the Northeast United States, but it does say that this plan uh, strategy, excuse me, will be used as a template, presumably for other regions of the United States. So I think it's important uh, for our council, even though, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure of the status of offshore wind energy development uh, off Alaska uh, at this point in time. What really struck me uh, in, in reading this document is that this implementation strategy for the Northeast uh, was really prompted the development of the plan was prompted by the fact that there were about 13 offshore wind energy projects uh, that were under development and under review by BOEM, I believe, that they realized somewhat after the fact um, directly affected uh, NOAA fisheries surveys, scientific surveys. And there was a lot of mitigation that took place. And, and so that just, uh, that seems very concerning to me um, but I think this, this implementation strategy was developed to address that. There's, it's pretty high level. Uh, there's a fair number of goals, objectives, actions, things like that. Uh, and those all seem fine. But what I guess I was hoping our comment letter could focus on, first of all, it, it's not clear to me. Again, this is the plan for the Northeast. It's not clear to me whether there will be other plans developed specific to other regions and what the trigger would be if that might be the case. So that would just sort of be a question I have. In terms of the plan uh, for communication and outreach to implement this strategy, which ultimately is supposed to result in coordinated mitigation plans for specific surveys related to offshore wind energy development projects. I'm just not clear on the process, the communication process. So for example, in our area, I just am not clear how the Alaska Fisheries Science Center would find out uh, that there was this potential wind energy development project. And again, I'm afraid <laughs> the last thing we want to have happen is before the, it is for the, Develop, energy development project to be somewhat down the road. And then us just realizing that there might be no fisheries scientific survey impact. So I don't think we can overstress the importance of early communication on these projects and the coordination that needs to take place. I would note uh, that I was pleased to see that of the groups that NOAA Fisheries and BOEM plan to work with in the implementation of this strategy that uh, science centers, councils, regional fishery management councils, and states were included. But again, th those three bodies uh, were listed along with a group of many other stakeholders, groups. And so it's not clear to me if, if there's any difference in communication strategies or things like that. And so uh, the final, issue in reading this document that kind of concerned me was really resources available at the respective agencies, uh, particularly our Alaska Fisheries Science Center. This seems like in some cases it, it could require fairly extensive staff resources in terms of analysis, reviewing proposals, developing mitigation strategies, and I'm just I mean, the document itself really acknowledges uh, that this could be a fairly complex and resource intensive process. And I was just concerned about that in terms of our ongoing challenges with uh, finding sufficient resources to carry out our important scientific surveys under the status quo. And that is something that the council has consistently and regularly commented on. And 
this just strikes me as a potential further complication uh, to our goal to ensure to the best of our ability that those surveys take continue to take place. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you for laying out those thoughts, Ms. Baker. Mr. Twain. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I support um, Ms. Baker's suggestion. Uh, I think it is timely. Uh, our experience now is that, uh, at least on the West Coast, um, proposals uh, are, are just are escalating or accelerating, I think is one way to put it. And certainly in, in the North Atlantic, there's um, wind energy development at the higher latitudes. So um, I think it's proactive. I, I would just note relative to your last point of concern, uh, one of the things that we could suggest in our letter is a practice that's fairly common in um, at least in, in the areas that I'm familiar with dealing with major energy pro projects of suggesting that the project proponents um, provide funding to help with to help the agencies with evaluation. It's part of the permitting fees, essentially. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kurland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think you all know that facilitating offshore wind energy development is a top priority for this administration. Um, they certainly have been communicating, communicating clearly uh, the intent to try to do so in an environmentally responsible manner. I think the agency's intent with the draft policy is to anticipate the kinds of issues that Ms. Baker is, is raising as potential concerns and um, have a framework in place for mitigating impacts on surveys and, and other important operations. And um, as for the concern about resource impacts for the Alaska Fisheries Science Center and addressing all of that, that's very real. And, and I'm, I'm certainly hearing that in spades from colleagues on the East Coast, the Gulf, and to a lesser extent on the West Coast. Um, we have not yet had uh, anyone in the, the wind energy sector raise with us uh, kind of pre-application uh, conversations uh, relative to essential fish habitat consultation or Endangered Species Act consultation. Um, but those, if, if the trends continue, um, are likely to be very labor intensive processes. So I think the intent of the policy here again is to mitigate uh, adverse, potential adverse effects on surveys, think those through ahead of time. Um, in some ways, we're gonna have the benefit of learning from the experience of our colleagues elsewhere and, and hopefully be able to apply those things. So it may be worth acknowledging some of those issues in any letter the council may submit. Ms. Vanderhoven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'm very supportive of the letter and I, I agree with Ms. Baker's comments and Mr. Twite's comments. Um, we've been dealing with this on the West Coast with some of our fisheries there. Um, the Pacific Council was able to get a presentation from BOEM that explained their process, which is very different from our process. And I think it might be worth um, requesting a similar presentation to this council as well. Great, thank you, Ms. Vanderhoven. Mr. Mesero. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm supportive of this letter too. And, uh, I think this is a good moment for the remaining uh, stakeholders who are still listening and not at home eating dinner with their families to just be on notice that this is a um, this wind energy issue on the East Coast is a huge issue for um, both the trawl industry and the fixed gear industry where they, they've put windmills right in fishing grounds. And I don't need to go into it now, but this is the beginning of the process. So it's a good time for stakeholders to get engaged and keep their eye on this because it um, probably will come to Alaska. There's a lot of wind here and I think it's good to get involved early to let your concerns be known. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mesero. All right. Um, I think that's all the direction Dave needs. 
Okay, so we can move on to, um, there is a, a request for clarification on uh, the use of cost recovery fees for uh, our QE development of the program. Mr. Kerland. I think I know what the issue is, so I can try to dispense with it in one sentence. <laughs> um, uh, so without getting into the nuances of what we can and can't cover in cost recovery, um, our intent is not to use IFQ cost recovery fees to offset our staff costs associated with the rulemaking to implement the RQE fee collection. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. Kerland. Um, any questions on that? I think that was pretty clear. Great, thanks. Um, uh, Ms. Campbell, uh, you requested a discussion on medical transfers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. In response to the agency's inquiry earlier in the meeting, I as one council member would be very supportive um, of the agency considering how to treat the COVID related transfers that occurred under emergency rules in 2020 and 2021 for the purposes of counting toward the cap on use of medical transfers and consulting with the council rather than launching a full council analytical process on this change. And I'd like it noted that that was also a single sentence. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Ms. Baker. Thank you. And thanks, Ms. Campbell, for bringing that up. I completely concur with your recommendation. Other council members? Okay. All right. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Uh, Ms. Baker had, had uh, brought up a, a joint protocol meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And yes. I, this uh, idea evolved after our Bristol Bay Red King Crab motion this morning, and it, it did become clear that given uh, the current challenges we have, not just with Bristol Bay Red King Crab, uh, but with snow crab, of course, uh, some of the, the biological and management challenges, that uh, it might be a good time uh, for us to start thinking about a joint protocol committee. Recall that joint protocol committee meetings are uh, information sharing meetings. There are, are no decisions made, uh, but it is just uh, good practice for uh, the board of fisheries representatives and the council members on that committee to share information about areas of mutual interest. I think CRAB is one. Uh, I was also reminded, I don't have the date right in front of me, but uh, Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands thin fish is uh, on the board cycle for a meeting next year. And so I believe there uh, are some Pacific cod um, issues. I think there are some proposals that might be of joint interest to that group uh, that would also be uh, germane for consideration. And so I was just going to request if, if council members concur, uh, with the idea of a joint protocol committee meeting. I think it was uh, original discussions seem to indicate perhaps this October might be a good time, but I was just going to uh, request that we ask staff to work with Board of Fisheries support staff to perhaps get that scheduled. Great. Thanks for that, Ms. Baker. Mr. Down. As a member of the joint uh, protocol committee, I, I concur with, with Ms. Baker's comments, thank you. Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I do agree with Ms. Baker. Um, if I remember correctly, the, the work session starts on the 21st of October, and I see that our meetings uh, the 3rd to the 11th, so somewhere in between there. And we do have a COD section in, this, uh, in the work session that coming up, so it'd be perfect timing. Great. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Okay. I think that's a plan. Okay, under uh, B1, we talked about the executive committee uh, meeting uh, regarding council reflections. Mr. Marks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I have a motion. Okay, we'll get that put up. You don't have it? Keep your Senate. Okay, um, it, it closely follows the, the summary report, so maybe I'll just start. Okay. 
The, the council requests staff further explore ideas for potential changes to the council process with respect to the council's meeting schedule and agenda timing and the council's advisory bodies. Initial pr priorities are as follows. Reevaluate the timing of crab and ground fish harvest specifications in light of fishery needs and stock prioritization. Reduce the number of annual council meetings from five to four and drop the February meeting and consider making one to two meetings a year virtual. Uh, changes to the nomination reappointment process for the advisory panel and SSC. Further consideration of how to approach agency B reports and evaluate options to continue the opportunity to provide remote testimony. And following completions of these tasks, the council will decide whether to proceed with exploration of any additional potential changes. The second, I speak to that. Okay, I'll look for a second, and then we want to make sure to get it uh, put up on the on the screen before we we get too far into this. Have you received that yet, Ms. Gleason? No. All right. Well, it's seconded by Ms. Kimball, but uh, Mr. Marks, before we proceed, let's get that uh, put up on the on the screen. So we're just waiting for that to go through the internet. Sorry, <laughs> Ms. Campbell. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I'm wondering while we're waiting, would the council be interested in hearing uh, some scheduling items from the IFQ committee or do you want me to hold that until this motion is taken care of? Yeah, I, I, maybe in terms of efficiency, we don't, I'm not sure how long it'll, it'll take. So um, I think process wise, it'd be fine for you to. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to let the council know that I plan to schedule an IFQ committee meeting for late May or very early June, just prior to our council meeting in Sitka. And uh, that if the council concurs, that could be a forum for further discussion about several of the items that we heard about today a lot in public comment, including the area for vessel cap request and next steps on the small sable fish paper. Okay, thank you, Ms. Campbell. Ms. Kimball. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. The, on the small sablefish request, we already have that item in our so-called batters box. Is the expectation that the committee would look at the previous paper or that we would be trying to generate a new, new analysis for that May meeting? Um, through the chair, Ms. Kimball, no, my, my intention is that we would sort of dust off the previous paper, take some feedback from industry and uh, present a recommendation to the council about the next steps that would be needed if this item were to move forward. So no tasking to staff uh, would be related to that. Great, thank you. Anything further on that before we return to the motion? Great, thank you, Ms. Campbell. Okay, so we now have Mr. Marks's uh, motion posted. It's also uh, posted on our E agenda, or, or, or yes, our E agenda under the E items. So with that, Mr. Marks, uh, please speak to your motion. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So, so the uh, first bullet uh, focuses on the tight timelines and workload challenges with the com with completing the specifications process. It will re a review of that will require a thorough consultation. Uh, because of the timing of assessments, plan team review, and SSC and council harvest specifications are complex and affect a wide scope of agency staff and industry members. A couple of the examples that were highlighted by the SSC include the short timeline between uh, completion of surveys and developing crab specifications, and the other short timeline between the October plan team reviews and SSC review of ground, fit, ground fish model runs in and, and the final specifications in December. Um, any changes need to, need to maintain the robust quality of scientific information in the specifications project process, as well as consider the potential impacts on in industry timeframes, as well as the impacts of increased or decreased uncertainty on ABCs. 
uh, the second bullet to reduce the council meetings from five to four and drop the February meeting. You know, that really focuses on the short working time timeline between the end of December and deadline for materials to be posted in February, which, which spans the holidays and makes it challenging for staff to prepare timely work products for the council and gives less time for the public to review the materials in advance. It, it was noted that, that this could result in a cost savings uh, for the council and the public, but staff should consider the impacts and, and uh, opportunities to reschedule the recurring items that, that should come up in February, um, confer with the Pacific Fish Management Council to avoid overlapping meetings to the extent possible and consider when and how the revised schedule would accommodate a council meeting in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, staff should also consider the trade-offs of a four meeting per year standard schedule respect to, to a meeting length and the ability to meet council, council objectives. Um, kind of especially need to focus on, on the SSC and staff should assess work, workload implications of dropping the February meeting in the context of types of agenda items traditionally covered in February and also the importance of the one day workshop to the SSC. Um, and, and again, staff should explore the continued ability to meet in the Northwest to allow easier access for those stakeholders. And I would also say I, I would encourage considering um, holding those meetings in, in communities, fishing communities in Oregon also potentially highlight opportunities to uh, see some of the uh, of fisheries facilities and, and in the Seattle area. I think we, we had one uh, field trip there in, in Seattle to Trident, uh, very worthwhile. And, and so of these uh, opportunities in remote communities in Alaska. The other part of that is to create uh, one to two meeting per year, virtual meetings and, and the remaining uh, meetings in person. There's cost savings uh, for virtual meetings, but they're not always preferable. Um, but it should really focus on agenda, agendas and items that, that lend themselves to better, better virtual discussions and, and uh, the uh, possibility for those in, in an effective manner. The, the other value of those, uh, as we've seen in the last Two years is the ability to deal with ad hoc or emergency issues, special council meetings. You know, we've addressed uh, crab harvest specifications and rulemaking timelines. So those are core elements to that issue. The other, the third bullet is re related to changes to the nomination appointment process for the advisory council in terms of timing qualifications and term length. Uh, moving the timing of the, of the call for a P motions allows more time for council members to identify and interact with potential uh, AP candidates, talk about the expectations of, of the position and job requirements, and, that, and uh, also identify where we may need specific expertise in a given area based on, on uh, need and upcoming uh, issues. It also uh, should evaluate the trade-offs between the one-year initial appointment of a member versus the uh, three-year appointment and, and how that, that may or may not um, give, a, give a chance for, for a new applicant to, to sit in the role and really make sure that, that they can, can commit uh, to a long-term level of, of, of participation. And to the SSC, uh, same issues, uh, in general, but but uh, you know, look at an earlier uh, solicitation timeline and and allows council members to consider candidates and the value of of uh, special expertise that may needed. Uh, also, it can be difficult finding ideal candidates who are always busy and it's challenging and most in. Uh, you know, also also how to reach out to those candidates. I think one one item that was has been highlighted is is the value of long term participation on the SSC 
uh, for continuity and understanding of the process, but also to work within the role and and of the SSC in in the, in their. Uh, role of providing guidance to the council. The other two items, uh, further consideration of how to approach uh, agency B reports. That's been a good cost savings action in uh, the last two years. So we should uh, consider that further and uh, how we should approach that. And the last item is to evaluate options to continue the opportunity to provide a remote testimony. We heard that in public testimony today, and I think we've also established a pretty high expectation uh, to provide those opportunities. It's, it's good for communities, it's good for our stakeholders, and, and it's not always easy or inexpensive to get to these council meetings. So continuing that opportunity is a high priority. And uh, so anyway, I, I see these this over, uh, Full package is really a, a good framework to move forward with um, as a next step in this process. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Marks. Mr. Witherall has a question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Marks. Um, my question is, do you anticipate having the staff come back with this uh, paper, this exploration paper, on all of these items at the same time, or would you like to have some of the items addressed earlier? For example, what I'm getting at is the first bullet, it might take staff more time to evaluate than the rest. And it might be December until we can come back really with a well thought out plan uh, to examine the timing of the ground for specs, run it through the plan teams, the SSC, uh, Science Center and others. Whereas we could come back with a, a, a summary of what the effects might be relative to the B reports or remote testimony at a sooner meeting, maybe as soon as June. So uh, my question is, do you want it all to come back at the same time or would you like us to take it more piecemeal and get address those pieces of the process that we can get at earlier? Um, through the chair, uh, Mr. Mr. Witherall, um, I think I'd, I'd look to staff to, to evaluate these and the potential for uh, implementation, how soon we could, implement these, certainly that, that particular item is, is a high priority and, and uh, we have a, a bottleneck. And so if, again, if, if there were, uh, was feedback in April on, on a, a timeline and how we might approach the various aspects or when we could expect to pass a package would be helpful. Other, Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question. I don't know if it's for Mr. Marks or for Mr. Witherell, but based on that exchange, what would the expectation be? Would we see another version of this council process paper in June with an identification of all of these items, but a possible check by the ones that are ongoing and others that the council could potentially take action on, receive more public input on in June and proceed? Chairman, Ms. Kimball, yes, based on that exchange, I think our intent would be bring these all back in June. There probably won't be more information about the first bullet, but we might be able to describe the process that we will uh, work through to get and address those issues raised in the first bullet. That helps. Mr. Mesero. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Marks. My question is, when you were talking about um, the second bullet and you, um, the rationale you used for considering making one to two meetings a year virtual was cost savings. And I'm wondering whose cost are you trying to save? Who's saving money doing that? Is it the council or is it the public? Because it seems like if we're gonna continue to do virtual remote testimony, it can't be the public. So is it the council's money we're trying to save by having virtual meetings? Uh, thanks, Mr. Through the Chair, uh, Mr. Mesro. I think it actually saves everyone money, but I, I think it's it's the most important is is the uh, nature of the agenda 
and our, our ability to effectively conduct the council's business. And, and I think that's, for me, that's the driving factor uh, more, more so than, than, than the cost. And so that's what I'd be looking at. I did, did speak to the, uh, which agenda items may be more conducive to a virtual meeting or, or ver versus the other times where we have a, a short-term need based on a regulatory issue. I hope that helps. Mr. Twight. Thank, thanks, Mr. Chair and Mr. Marks. As I was sort of thinking about Mr. Witherell's answer to Ms. Kimball's question, I was realizing that I think the way your motion is structured is that all five, so I mean, this is a question, is your motion structured so that we really have to check off all five as having been completely addressed one way or the other before we move on to any of the other items that were identified in the list, um, including those sort of additional items that the council indicated interest in, in pursuing in the future? Is, is, or can we, as maybe a couple of these, was that what you were intending with the motion is, is finish addressing these five and only then begin thinking about other um, ways of, of modifying our processes? Uh, through the chair, Mr. Twight. Um, my intent was not to wait for a full package, but to, to look to staff when they come back in June to, to highlight the opportunities to, and process for moving forward on, on these, uh, these items. I think some of them, if, if we could move forward again, I looked at the, the number one first bullet and if we could move forward on that, I, I, I heard Mr. Witherall, but, but uh, if we could move forward on some of these, but a lot of it, I guess I, I can't tell you what the process is and I'll look for staff to come back with that. Mr. Witherell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I could probably add a little more information. I, I think the staff's interpretation of this would be we evaluate these five, but all of the other ideas that were contained in the reflection paper and raised in public comment are still on the table and that maybe as time goes by, we may want to evaluate or pick up a few of those other ideas. So that, that's my interpretation of what this motion means at this time. Further questions on the motion, Ms. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Marks for the motion. My question is on the third bullet changes to the nomination reappointment process for the advisory panel and SSC. And my question is specifically about the advisory panel. And I think in your motion, you specifically spoke to envisioning uh, the uh, staff evaluation of that as looking at a, a one versus a three year term for advisory panel members. And I definitely support that. I appreciate that. What I'm wondering, I hope I explained this reasonably clearly that under the current SOPs, the council does have, although our standard is a three-year term for advisory panel members, the council does have the ability to make one-year special appointments as it were, and the council has done that. And so my, my question is, is it your intent uh, that as part of this evaluation going forward that the, the staff discussion would include perhaps the use of that one-year appointment. And if that was something that the council wanted to still keep flexibility to do, or if we wanted to be a little more specific about the term appointments, because there's implications for term limits and things like that, depending on what the appointment is. And so that's my question is if, if that type of discussion would, if you're amenable to that type of discussion or that was your intent in, in that particular bullet there. Uh, through the chair, uh, Ms. Baker, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, the intent would be to, to look at the, the pros and cons of that. And, and uh, also we're, uh, you know, if we stuck with a three year, what, what does it, um, how, how would we, we, uh, treat a variance to that like we've done this year with the one-year appointment. So I, I think that's open. I didn't have a lean one or the other, so.
further questions on the motion? Okay. Any amendments? Okay. Any comments on the motion? Mr. Twight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Sort of as a follow up to um, the question I asked and, and sort of in response to Mr. Witherall's um, answer, as, um, as well as Mr. Marx's, I, I just um, would like to encourage staff to, um, as, as they address some of these, um, to give the council an assessment of, of what kinds of issues they could sort of take on next. Um, I fully support the top five, um, but I'm very interested in sooner rather than later, digging into some of the um, additional items that allow us to take more control over our agenda. Um, I think it's as, as you know, the SSC forecasts the world becoming more uncertain, less certain. I think one of the tools that we can use to maintain some control there is control of our agenda, more control of our agenda. Um, and in particular, I'm thinking about um, you know, a process for identifying multi-year council strategic priorities, some of the variations around that. We've heard continuing interest from stakeholders about that one in particular as well, and continuing support. So just a sense from staff when they come back with you know, things of, of which ones of these um, potentially they could take on next. The council obviously would decide though, which if any, at that point, the council would decide which if any, they are ready to ask staff to tackle next. Thank you, Mr. Twight. Mr. Mesereau. <sighs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's late in the day. And I'm not gonna belabor this, but if anyone has been at the last few meetings we've been to virtually, and if anyone was awake during this meeting, it's fairly obvious that the deliberations, the public testimony, and the communication with public in a face-to-face -face meeting is entirely different than a virtual meeting. And if we're considering eliminating one meeting, the February meeting, and then we're considering making one or two meetings virtual a year, that will mean that a place like Kodiak won't see this council but one time in a council member's full nine year term because we'll have to consider Oregon, Washington and Alaska communities. So I think we should think very carefully about whether we wanna make this drastic of a change. I feel like the virtual process has damaged this council's uh, way we operate. We've had to do it because there's a pandemic but I think we need to work to build the public trust back so they can hear us thoughtfully deliberate and relate to people about issues that matter to them. And that was lost during the virtual process. It was very difficult to collaborate with other council members when we're on different computer screens. I'll leave it at that for now because we'll have a chance to bring this up again, but just with those thoughts in mind, you know, going to one or two virtual meetings and only four meetings total with a huge pressing workload and various fisheries and states of decline, uh, you know, we should give careful thought before we move forward. I'm not going to try to amend the motion or say any more about it because everybody wants to go have dinner, but I think we should proceed with great caution about considering both of those changes at the same time at this juncture when we just got back to meeting in person again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mesereau. Mr. Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My comments would align with Mr. Mesereau's. This is a public process. It belongs to the public. And any big changes, these are seem to me like major changes. And I don't, I'm not gonna say whether or not I'm gonna go along with it because it's not in front of us yet, but I, uh, it's, a, it's a good endeavor to check in to see if we can do some saves. When you start cutting the public out, like Mr. Mesereau mentioned, um, it, the, the council is losing its, uh, I, a lot of people don't have the respect for the council they used to, the people that I talk to anyway. so. I'd be really leery about making any huge major changes at this time, but maybe there's some changes we need, but um, uh, not these major changes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great. Thanks, Mr. Jensen. Ms. Kimball. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm glad we're furthering this process and going to see a paper so we can discuss each of these items and decide where to go forward. But I think each of these have been an attempt to work not just in a pandemic, but to increase our participation. Um, I think. 
I appreciate Mr. Marx's motion. The last bullet, I just wanted to make a comment in terms of evaluating options to continue the opportunity to provide remote testimony. That's really stemming from a community engagement committee recommendation that this council and the staff have done so well on trying to act upon. Um, I don't wanna give the impression because it's not my impression with this paper that we're trying to, to go back on that, but that we're still trying to pursue that, but there may be some trade-offs in some situations where that's not possible. And to have them included in this paper makes that very transparent what those trade-offs are. And so I appreciate that coming forward. I hope we continue to provide remote testimony and meet in remote coastal communities at the same time, but having that in front of us will be valuable to the transparency of this process. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Kimball. Any further comments? Okay, we can go to a vote. Uh, is there any opposition to the motion? Okay, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Marks. Okay, that brings us to the end of the, uh, the, the tickler list. Um, any further, Ms. Kimball? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a motion I sent to Shannon. Is it? Thanks, Shannon. Mr. Chair, the motion reads the council recommends an SSC subgroup develop the scope of a half or full day SSC workshop for February 2023 focused on the management of federal stocks given the rapid changes that have been observed in the Northern Bering Sea and Southern Chukchi Sea, for example, shifts in distributions of fish and fisheries, changing prey availability, availability, et cetera, and possible ecosystem responses. This workshop is intended to provide an opportunity to proactively provide scientific guidance to the council regarding these issues and could include topics such as the need for more dynamic reference points and stock assessments and harvest policy. And with a second, I'll speak briefly. Second. Seconded by Mr. Jensen, Ms. Kimball. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Jensen. Um, this was direct um, SSC recommendation. I thought if anyone was able to listen to the SSC discussion, I thought it was a really productive discussion and, and to me expressed the need for the SSC members in order to do their due diligence, provide us solid advice to be able to have the time and energy to have workshops such as this where they can just talk to one another, get input from other scientists and talk about then how to further improve our process. Very specifically, the idea of providing topics such as the need for more dynamic reference points came in their discussion about climate and the presentation they got on those new climate response mechanisms. And I think this is a, a solid way to respond to what the SSC feels like they need and a way to make sure that we get that input into our process sooner rather than later. That's my intent. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Any questions on the motion? Mr. Down. Very quickly, I, I'm assuming that the, uh, the chair and co-chair of the SSC would pick the members of this subgroup that you talk about. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Down. Yes, that the subgroup was, was part of the SSC recommendation that they would proceed with that if they got council direction to do so. Any further questions or amendments or comments? Okay, we can go to a vote. Any opposition? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Kimball. Further action? Just comment, Mr. Mesro. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to take a minute before we head out to thank the admin staff for putting together this hybrid meeting. I'm sure it couldn't have been easy. And they went ahead and were able to bring us lunches when we needed them and keep everybody connected and did a pretty awesome job doing that. I think it's worthy of uh, publicly praising them for the good job they did. I, I agree. Hoping there'll be a lot of high fives or fist bumps or elbow bumps at the staff meeting on Monday. Anything further? Okay, well, it's been a long couple of years. Great to be back in person with, with most of you. Um, looking forward to doing it again in June in Sitka. And with that, thanks again, Mr. Witherell and all the staff and the public for attending. Meeting adjourned.